The story begins as Kang Jin Hyuk makes his 79th attempt to save 3,15,850 casualties while endeavoring to conquer the Tower of Trials. Humanity concludes that the extinction of the human race is imminent, 0 hours, 58 minutes, and 33 seconds remain. Time passes slowly and a message is received from WTV stating that, to maintain fairness and acknowledge the excessive casualties, all the significant guilds have relinquished their efforts. A message from Howl's Moving Castle conveys that there are no more challengers and Orange, with a kickmas rhyme, expresses the belief that there is approximately one hour left until the end. The setting transitions to the 48th floor of the Tower of Trials, where Kang Jin Hyuk sits down, perusing messages from people. Suddenly, a message arrives, indicating the presence of a challenger on the 48th floor, the domain of the Red Dragon Dethia. He conceals his face completely, preparing to confront the Red Dragon, who observes him and remarks that humans seem relentless, returning even after enduring substantial losses. In response, Kang Jin Hayek mentioned that he made some preparations and arrived on time despite the challenges. The Red Dragon, becoming furious, questions whether he realizes that regardless of its equality, death can vary in degrees of pain. The Red Dragon asserts that conversing with such an insignificant being holds little significance, launching an attack that ensnares Kang Jin Hayek in chains, declaring it an anticlimactic end. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek attempts to untie himself and rushes to launch an attack, commenting that a physical assault immediately following a bind seems too predictable as a pattern. The Red Dragon grows increasingly furious, while he retorts that he can discern the impending actions by observing the dragon's hand movements. He questions whether the dragon expended its skill within those brief seconds, acknowledging the dragon's proficiency but asserting that he has opted for a more agonizing demise. He retaliates by spewing fire, annihilating everything in its path, but he manages to evade the attack and counterstrikes. The red dragon glares at him, declaring him impudent and vowing not to let him leave this place alive. As he receives a notification that Red Dragon Dethia is employing aerial breath, he contemplates that the entire dungeon is within reach of the dragon's breath. Yet, he believes there is no reason for him to dodge it. He is notified that the memory of the world is being read, and another notification informs him that an infinite library, brimming with records of skills, is taking shape as he endeavors to discover a talent capable of defeating the Red Dragon Dethia. Deciding on Hellfire and Black Tears, he activates them to launch an attack. Observing this, Red Dragon Dethia questions if he was overconfident, trusting in such a puny skill. He asserts that Kang Jin Hayuk will never be able to kill him with something like that. He responds, acknowledging the current skill level, but stating that by combining Hellfire and Black Tears, he is creating a skill on the next level, one capable of cleaving even a dragon. He receives notifications that the skills Hellfire and Black Tears are successfully merging, and another notice confirms the creation of the Breath of the Void Dragon Ethereum SSS. He employs this skill against the Red Dragon. Red Dragon Dethia expresses astonishment, questioning how a mere human could wield the most muscular breath of the ancient Dragon Ethereum. He introduces himself as someone who has been worn out too much and emphasizes that this is not his first time defeating a pro like the Red Dragon. Kang Jin Hayek considers it a trash game, referring to a game that isn't fun, unbalanced, has subpar administration, or possesses absurd difficulty. The virtual reality game Tower of Trials falls into this category. When the game was released, Korean gamers, whose hobby was to conquer the game before even the developers expected them to, embarked on the journey to destroy it. He believes this continued every day of the year without eating or sleeping. However, after three years had passed, people began to realize that the Tower of Trials was an unbelievable game. The Game Guardian is practically invincible, the Arctic's temperature is minus 60 degrees, killing everyone within an hour, and a labyrinth exceeds 10,000 km in size. He thinks this game wasn't intended for fun, it was almost torture for those who played it. In anger, Kang Jin Hayuk throws the game remote on the floor and declares it's genuinely a trash game. 
Subsequently, he reflects that the game began to decline. To be precise, it almost went under. Despite the challenges, the pros did not give up on challenging this impossibly tricky game. While he screams, he receives a notification that he has conquered floor 50, and congratulations are extended, recognizing him as the first person to clear the Tower of Trials. Surprised, he questions if this is for real while clutching his badly bleeding arm. He believes it was simply enjoyable, the sense of accomplishment that followed researching unknown ways to conquer the tower, repeating the process until it became second nature, and finally beating the level. As he runs to attack a dragon, he reflects that it was enough to devote 11 years of his life. He contemplates that he might clear the last floor and muses that he should have streamed this. He contemplates whether he should upload this onto YouTube, and then he receives a notification thanking him for playing their game until now. A reboot update is planned in 12 hours, so he is requested to continue enjoying the game after the update. He finds this unexpected and wonders if they discovered an oil field in the middle of a desert or something. He comments that it really makes no sense and believes this game shouldn't be profitable for them. However, he acknowledges that they probably have their own reasons for undertaking something like this. Despite the game receiving a reboot update, he has no intention of continuing to play it. He plans on quitting his job as a streamer and YouTuber, which he has maintained until today. He once again picks up the remote controller and mentions that, although he doesn't have a family to support, he is already 27 years old. He can't afford to continue living on an income of $500 a month. He suggests he should probably inform the gym owner that he won't work out for a while. Looking out the window, he recalls that people used to tell him that he should become a professional fighter, but right now, money is more important than fighting. He goes on a live chat at YouTube, engaging in conversation with people while eating dinner. He asks the guys if he has something he needs to tell them all, and when people inquire about what it is, he says he just wanted to change up the way he talked as a joke. He thinks he should probably just post an announcement about quitting tomorrow. After a while, he drinks so much beer that he falls asleep. In the morning, he wakes up, complaining about a headache, and suggests that he should probably upload his clear video of Tower of Trials. He turns on his system and sees a notification that the Tower of Trials has become a reality. While contemplating this development, he enters the Tower of Trials again. He receives a message asking if the guys can see what's happening, asking whether they are watching. During his broadcast, he reveals that he only found out because Melon Watermelon reported it to him. But apparently, this is from a game called Tower of Trials, released 11 years ago. A man in the game asks if they can believe this, requesting a moment while Kang Jin Hyuk wonders how this could happen, seeing it as a sign of the beginnings in the Tower of Trials. He receives a notification that the Tower of Trials reboot version first update has been completed and asks what it is. Meanwhile, he gets another message instructing everyone to clear the next floor of the tower within 90 days. Everyone receives the message that if they fail, humanity will perish. He gets up and looks at the screen, contemplating the gravity of the situation. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification stating that the acceptance of reality for people has greatly increased. While contemplating the need to cool his head off, if the Tower of Trials has become a reality, he realizes he can't waste time and hastily puts on his clothes. Recognizing the urgency of reaching where he can obtain the item, he thinks the world might end if he doesn't act quickly. He runs out, going down the stairs, but wonders why his heart is beating excitedly. The scene shifts to the central city, where a man in a brown coat looks at his phone and shouts about the fastest train to Busan. Another individual remarks that even Busan won't be sufficient, and that they need to leave Korea. A person with a cap agrees, emphasizing the necessity of going to another country to survive. A woman inquires about their conversation, and the person with the cap shows them the news. Another person asks where they can go in this situation. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek reaches the location and remarks that wherever it is, it's not Seoul. He asserts that if he stays there like an idiot, he'll surely die and run. He believes now is not the time to retreat, but the time to charge in. In the Korean server, this place was selected as an external zone. 
He reflects that there are around 30 or so in the whole country, and this was the one closest to him. Entering the central underground strip mall, he receives a notification that he is now entering an event zone. Looking around, he observes that all the people there have played the beginning of the Tower of Trials. He guesses that they're all glaring at each other, and that's natural. He believes the item that will soon appear is limited in quantity, and if they're lucky, they might get fine at most. After a while, Lee jong Su calls out to him from behind and asks if he's Kang Jin Hayuk. He laughs and excitedly confirms that it is him, mentioning that he also came here. He explains that he did nothing but play this game all day, holed up in his room. He checks the details of Lee jong Su, a Pafrika TV partnered streamer with 5 lakh subscribers on Newtuber. In other words, he's a really popular streamer and, simultaneously, the CEO of the company he was part of. He asks if it isn't time for one of his scheduled streams. He dismissively replies with comments about how streaming doesn't benefit someone like the muscular man he points toward. He then asks what floor he reached in the game and suggests gathering secrets together as former co-workers. He refers to them as co-workers and goes into a flashback. He reflects that his company tricked many streamers into a slave contract where the more they streamed, the more money they'd lose, and their voices were silenced under the powerful and significant voices of the lawyers the company had. Upon seeing that notification, he starts crying, throws his webcam away, and informs his closest friends, with whom he had been together since the beginning, that they had left the industry. Lee jong Su puts his hand on his shoulder, returning him to the present. Lee jong Su asks if he knows he's a significant gamer and excels at mukbang streams. He offers to rewrite his contract to be on better terms. Kang Jin Hayek becomes angry, stating that the world has changed, and tells him not to talk to him like their friends. He punches him, breaking his teeth. He thinks it feels great and should be about when the item comes out. Suddenly, bubbles emerge in the pond, and a tree emerges. Everyone looks at the tree in shock, and a girl identifies it as a mangrove. Kang Jin Hayek thinks his memory is correct, and he receives a notification that the mangrove of greed has appeared. He observes some fruits on the tree and asks if those aren't fruits. The system notifies him that each delicious fruit is ripening right now and raises strength, agility, health, and magic stats. He acknowledges that it's a good item, but only four fruits exist. He looks around at other people and thinks it will be a fierce competition. They all run towards the tree and attempt to reach the fruits, starting a fight with each other. Lee jong Su suggests that if they had worked together and split the fruits, they both could have benefited, but now they won't get any fruits. He replies, telling him that if he doesn't know anything, he should stay put and asserts that now is not the time. A man grabs the fruit and eats it, resulting in his agility increasing by plus three, while others attempt to snatch it. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that most people don't even know about the fruit, and those who have played the game a few times will focus on getting it. He mentions that people who have no life the game like him enjoy the more sadistic and perverted process that follows. The tree branches attack them all, causing a man in a blue jacket to fall. He mentions that he forgot it becomes dangerous if they eat all the fruits, explaining that it was so long ago that he forgot. He instructs them to run, noting that he died here at least 50 times. Kang Jin Hayuk looks around while everyone runs out and Lee jong Su also runs out. Kang Jin Hayuk asks if he's giving up, and he replies he doesn't want to die here like that. He inquires and states that it's a shame. The genuine prize of this event can only be obtained once he eats all the fruit. In response, Kang Jin Hayat questions the seriousness of the statement. He affirms that he wouldn't still be standing there if it were fake. Lee jong Su, contemplating, realizes why he wasn't going after the fruits earlier. Kang Jin Hayat, considering it a promising opportunity, expresses interest. He says, so let's assume he is telling him the truth, and asks what he suggests they do. He suggests that they dive in and emphasize that moving one by one makes them easy targets. He proposes charging from opposite sides simultaneously, pointing toward the tree. Kang Jin Hayek questions if the plan is to distract the target. 
He confirms and cautions that if either of them hesitates, they both face death. Kang Jin Hayek reassures him, stating that he has also played plenty of this game. Meanwhile, they both run towards the tree, and the branches of the tree try to attack Kang Jin Hayek, but he escapes and thinks about Li Jong Su. Li Jong Su says, who would trust his words and instructs Kang Jin Hayek to go ahead and be bait, stopping behind. Kang Jin Hayek thinks he's glad that Li Jong Su hasn't changed, while the tree branches attack him repeatedly. He reflects that the one who is the bait is him, the person standing further away. The tree branches go to Li Jong Su, ultimately capturing him, and he cries for help. Kang Jin Hayek asks why he should help him if he has a problem and suggests taking it to court with his lawyers. Li Jong Su cries, saying he doesn't want to die, while the branches absorb him entirely. Kang Jin Hayek says goodbye to him and thinks about the next move, calculating the angles for the attack on the tree branches, 22 degrees from the left and 35 degrees from the right. After a while, he realizes that dodging isn't tricky when tree branches attack him. He quickly escapes from the attack and these branches stab the tree's stem and something comes out. He thinks, all right, Finally, the core of the mangrove has revealed itself, and it's precisely the same as what he experienced in the game. He acknowledges that finding out the exact angles from which the attacks come and manipulating them to his advantage is challenging. He grabs a tree branch and suggests, let's not trouble each other. He inquires why he does not hand over the tree orb. He believes this is an even mob, so it doesn't even give experience, all it does is secure him a spot in the Hall of Fame at best. The branches once again move towards him, while he receives a notification that the Mangrove of Greed uses the skill of Vampiric Vines. He acknowledges that even though he is a no-lifer, he can't dodge all of them. He focuses on attacking the branches and believes deflecting the attacks is still doable. There's no need to be scared, and there's no reason to be afraid. As the branches try to attack him again, they cut his face. However, he stops them all and reflects that he has repeated it many times. Kang Jin Hayek attacks the branches and runs toward a tree as he observes butterflies, thinking they are sleep butterflies. He considers them monsters that spread sleeping power as a defense mechanism. It's easy to fall victim if he doesn't take countermeasures against inhaling the powder, but he finds it simple to counter as he covers his face. He believes that just holding his breath suffices. As he attacks the mangrove's core, the sleep butterflies try to protect it. He destroys the core, using his powers to absorb the tree's abilities. Cutting the tree into two pieces, he receives a notification that he is the first to defeat the mangrove tree of greed. Reflecting on how the detailed research into patterns and timing helped him, he unexpectedly feels thankful for everything he has done. Meanwhile, he receives another notification that his achievements will be recorded in the Hall of Fame for tomorrow. Please state his name. He thinks as expected, this is a trash system that demands his personal information to enter the Hall of Fame. He says he doesn't have a name, which will all be confidential. He firmly believes in refusing to release his personal information, as he knows he'll attract all kinds of attention if it gets discovered that he was a former top player. He notes that it looks like the system won't accept complete confidentiality. He then gets notified that an unknown face will be covered with a mosaic, and his voice will be changed. He comments that it's telling him to settle for a hidden identity, and while it's not like there's nothing he can't do about it in the future, he accepts the terms. He states that this is more important right now, puts his hand inside the tree, and discovers something. He obtains a stone and thinks he finally got it. A notification indicates that he has obtained the tree orb, the tree's essence. He considers that if each tree fruit increases strength, agility, or magic by three, and the tree orb provides as much as a 12-point bonus across stats, considering leveling up once gives three points, it's equivalent to leveling up four times. He regards it as a broken item and believes there's nothing as cost-effective as this. Even on all 50 floors, he swallows the stone. Checking his status screen, he thinks he should check its effect. He sees the details. His name is Kang Jin Hayek, a 27-year-old male, and his level is 1. 
His strength is 5, agility is 6, vitality is 7, and magic is 5, with 12 stat points possessed. He reflects that at level 1 with 12 stat points, he's the strongest at level 1. An hour later, he was notified that the video would be uploaded in 10 minutes. He remarks that the chat exploded, and aside from a few initial comments, most expressed disbelief or claim that he got lucky or cheated. Upon receiving a notification that the video had been uploaded, he noted that the doubtful reactions disappeared once the video was available. He receives numerous comments since he uploaded the video with a covered face. He thinks the responses, though slightly varied, were consistent. Meanwhile, he looks at his phone on his main account and asks if it is really that amazing. He asserts that beating the mangrove of greed at level 1 isn't easy, but it's not something to be this surprised about. Meanwhile, as he thinks carefully, he surmises that it is understandable since most people have not played until the mid-late stages of this game. He consistently forgets that he should not be applying his standards and still thinks about his past, living a life that was hard to make ends meet. It was common for him to be late on rent, and sometimes he had to starve for several days to gather enough money for Mukabang streams. Considering his rapid eating habits, he reflects that if he had been given this opportunity yesterday, he would have accepted it in a heartbeat. However, at this moment, he has no intention of sharing his knowledge, not even for 10 billion won. He believes that the most crucial thing right now is information monopoly. He contemplates that his next destination is when the game is played, as the leaking mana from the Tower of Trials spreads throughout Seoul. He considers that it did not have a significant effect, but if there were one big change, it would be that the artifacts outside the tower became holy artifacts. Of course they were fake, as he observes the sword and other artifacts on his phone. He believes that the artifacts of legends were within the tower and that they were replicas, in other words, copies. The other person states that this is where he can obtain the most replicas, while he considers the National Museum of Korea a treasure chest with countless artifacts stored within it. He contemplates that the problem is that he is not the only one aiming for these replicas and unlike the Mangrove of Greed, which appeared in seven locations throughout Seoul, has only one National Museum of Korea, and people will gather from each region for the artifacts. He believes that among them will be former top players. He opens the door and receives a notification that he has entered the event area. He thinks it's quieter than expected and no one is here yet. Upon seeing a burned dead body, he believes that someone has arrived before him, as expected. Kang Jin Hayek reflects that he expected other people to adapt since the world changed. However, the gap between expectations and reality is more significant than he imagined, and people have become bold in just a day. He believes that what they aim for is probably the artifact kept in the medieval classical era gallery, the artifact everyone who came here seeks to obtain. Upon seeing a map, he comments that it is an excellent map of the East Land. He acknowledges that he is not trying to look at the map of Korea, and the great map, now imbued with magic energy, contains information about the Tower of Trials, and that's why everyone wants it. He thinks again about how it tells him where the mazes and ruins are and explains which monsters and items are within them. He wonders who wouldn't want this item. Meanwhile, he contemplates that although it only provides information up to the 10th floor, it's more than enough to ignite people's hearts. He believes that everyone will want that, and they will overlook the significant artifacts obscured by the mud. As everyone starts to fight for the items, breaking things and abusing each other, they almost destroy everything. A person with a tattoo screams to freeze everyone and warns that anyone who moves from now on will die at his hands. One of the injured people asserts that nobody here will back down from empty threats like that, and if he moves even a single toe, he'll smash his head in while pointing a hamper towards him. The person with the tattoo becomes angry and says that words don't seem to do the trick, transforming into a stone man. A girl sees him and asks if he already has a unique ability. The injured man comments that it's a bit dangerous, while the person with the tattoo insists that the map is his, so everyone should move away. Min Yongwu arrives and questions him, saying the map is his, then laughs and adds that he can't agree with those words. 
In response, the person with the tattoo asks if Min Yongwo is crazy. The older man clarifies that his name is not Old Geezer, it's Min Yongwu, and living life with kindness and friendship is what the name means. He angrily shouts that he didn't ask for introductions and instructs him to read the mood and get lost. He adds that his crusty neck, he'll wrangle it off like a chicken's neck. Min Yongwu retorts that his mouth is dirty for someone so young and accuses him of having a knife for a tongue. He continues by asking which he thinks is faster, for him to break his neck or turn him into coal. Then, he performs some fire magic. The person with the tattoo exclaims magic in shock as Min Yongwu throws fire at him, ordering the fire to capture him. The fire completely envelops him, causing him to scream and burn. Min Yongwu walks away, commenting that his tongue brought him misfortune. Miss Li Yuri remarks that he's a man and fire-type magic really is hot. She expresses her gladness for deciding to join forces with him. He replies, asking if she obtained the goods, and assures her that he'll leave his back to her. She responds, telling him to leave it to her, and picks up a statue, stating that she needs this guy. She warns that if anyone gets in the way, he'll take care of it. She performs some magic on the statue, activating its powers, and it transforms into a human form. She declares that anyone who moves from now onwards will be seen as an enemy emphasizing that everyone should understand. She declares that she'll make him munch on his head. She smiles and suggests, let's cooperate. A fat man questions why there are so many tryhards and others also agree with him. They've all awakened already and decide to give up on the map and whatever else, suggesting taking it all and throwing their weapons away. She expresses thanks to all those who quit. King Jin Hayek arrives there and remarks that they have really made a mess of this place. He asks if they all have no respect for history, but notes that at least it didn't tear as he picks up a small piece of paper from the ground. She calls him Master Fearless, asking if he thinks she's joking right now, and orders her guard to get him. The guards run to attack him and throw their spears towards him. King Jin Hayek tosses away the spear of Miss Lee Yuri's guard, shocking her. Other people in the vicinity observe him and begin gossiping, wondering what is happening and expressing surprise at his ability to deflect the spear. One person questions if that is possible, noting that he didn't dodge it, while another person is shocked to see that his hand is acceptable. Kang Jin Hayek thinks they don't know his stats right now, which is why they are reacting that way. He asks Miss Li Yuri what she will do now that her guard's only weapon is gone. She opens her bag, finds something, and retorts that her puppy's only weapon is not gone. She reveals other statues and takes out four more, performing magic to transform them into humans. He receives a notification that the artifact, the avatar of Anubis replica, is coming to life, and he smiles. Miss Li Yuri becomes angry and asks how this is possible, questioning why he is still smiling. Meanwhile, he responds, that's pretty nice and reflects that she can operate five statues simultaneously with her small mana pool, but she is not her average person. He thinks she's similar to the magic using old man Min Yungwu from earlier and notes that a fair amount of players have graduated from being newbies. Annoyingly, she questions if he thinks it's excellent, and he confirms, saying, well, somewhere between decent and nice, to be exact, while waving his hand. She comments that he's trying to act cool, and she doesn't like him. He asks if she really thinks so and suggests he should show her. He believes that if the gap is too large, she won't be able to comprehend it. He throws that piece of paper into the air, thinking again that he needs to show her with her own two eyes the canyon that exists between their levels. After a while, he places the map on the floor, giving his powers to a tiger. A notification informs him that Mana has been injected into the Pinewood Tiger replica, and the ruler of the mountains is appearing. A giant tiger emerges and she sees it, becoming frightened and exclaiming no way. He receives another notification that the period has been chosen, and information about the tiger is unknown. Her guards become angry, and he states that a mere jackal bears his teeth in front of the ruler of the mountain, ordering the tiger to eat them all. The tiger roars and runs towards them while they roar and prepare to attack. The tiger attacks one of them, cutting his head and devouring another, 
ultimately killing the remaining one. She observes this and thinks no way. She has heard of many different ways to use artifacts, but she has never heard of a method like this magical force. As the tiger approaches him, she feels her skin will tear off. Meanwhile, she sits down and thinks she can't win. She believes she drew the strongest cards, but wonders how he manages to do this and who this guy is. He approaches her and instructs her to hand it over. She asks what he is asking for all of a sudden. Coming closer, he specifies that he wants the mask of Tutankhamun. She becomes irritated, stating that it's useless in Korea and questions what he will use it for. He orders his tiger to attack, and it roars at her. She concedes, saying fine, she'll hand it over. She takes the mask out of his bag and gives it to him. He is notified that he has obtained the artifact, the mask of Tutankhamun replica. He thinks that with this, he has obtained the second artifact. She asks if he is aiming for the great map of the East Lands, while he thinks about the map and admits that he forgot about it. He tells her not to worry about it. After a while, he pats his tiger and instructs it to guard this area so nobody can follow him. The tiger stays there and walks out, thinking the preparations are done. It's time to go and get the most vital skill in the Tower of Trials. King Jin Hayek reaches the third floor of the building, where Min Yung Wu is already present. He sees him and wonders how this is happening, contemplating who he is and how he came here. He wonders whether Min Yung Wu got past Li Yuri to reach this floor as they look at the barrier. King Jin Hayek remarks that he thinks it's a one star rank barrier. Min Yung Wu replies that it seems like he knows about this and attempts to touch the barrier. He mentions that he has never seen a barrier like this before, noting that neither physical nor magical attacks work on it. Min Yung Wu moves forward, touches the barrier, and thinks about the spot where the flow of mana diverges. He performs some magic to open the barrier, but the word Karpo appears on it. He wonders what Karpo is and says he thinks there is a way to destroy this, but there is a condition. Meanwhile, Min Yung Wu asks about the condition. Then he replies that he must constantly use his flame magic to weaken the barrier. Min Yung Wu inquires how long he would need to use it, and he responds that he goes inside and comes back out with all the necessary relics. Min Yung Wu asks if he's saying he'll stay outside and keep using magic while he's inside. He laughs and questions if he will stay outside and keep using magic. He replies that he can't hold a powerful spell to weaken the barrier for a prolonged time. He acknowledges that he may not trust him, but this is the only way. He adds that it'll be morning soon and they can't get out of there without getting anything. He offers to let him keep the map. After all, he needs something else. Li Yongwu believes nothing is gained from hard work and considers it the worst possible outcome. He wonders if he should promise to hand over the map. He responds, stating that he wouldn't want to make an enemy out of a high-ranking magic ability user. Li Yongwu thinks there is only one conclusion, no matter how hard he thinks about it. He believes he'll have to trust him and says, it's very well. Then he will trust him this way. Kang Jin Hayek replies that he'll be in his care, Grandpa, and Li Yongwu responds that he'll try his best. He uses his fire magic to break the barrier. King Jin Hayek says he goes here and enters inside, thinking about Karpo. Min Yung Wu shouts hurry up. He replies all right, while thinking he's planning on trying his best in his way. He observes artifacts and thinks it doesn't seem like anyone has been here, unlike the lower floors, except for this. He takes a sword from there and receives a notification about the iron sword with Kyan Long inscribed. He believes that the person who finished their business here and left is the one who put up the barrier. He assumes he plans to leave after taking what they want, regardless of whether other people are fighting. He thinks he is unwilling to risk anything, but he is sure that even this person doesn't know. He takes artifacts individually while thinking that the relic he took is nothing but a second-rate relic. He says he finds it when he sees something. He receives a notification that it's Sangpyong Tongbo Di, and he thinks it's his inherent ability and the last puzzle piece required to make the most powerful skill. Meanwhile, he thinks that the materials he needs are ceremonial Persian formwork E and the right eye of Tudankhamun's mask B by combining the two relics. 
he receives another notification that the two relics are reacting, and he believes it's a message that only appears when relics that fit each other are encountered. At the same time, he interprets it as a message and breaks the Sankyong Tongbo, thinking it instructs him to pay the appropriate price if he wants to continue. He receives another notification that the three relics are reacting with each other, and he has successfully combined the relics against all odds. Another notification informs him that he has acquired the relic the Eye of Truth SS. He checks its details and realizes he can browse others' status windows. Additionally, he can determine whether someone is telling the truth or lying three times a day. He considers the Eye of Truth the greatest among the five eyes existing in the world, but there is another reason why he came to the museum today. He receives a notification about a hidden quest, stating that he has successfully combined three replica relics of B rank or lower to craft an item of S rank or higher, and he has met the requirements. He believes in copying and storing the numerous abilities in this world and using those skills to create an even more vital ability. This he sees as his weapon to become the strongest in the Tower of Trials. Another notification appears, informing him that he has acquired the inherent ability of Fusion Overlink. He receives another notification that the memory of the world is being created, along with details indicating Fusion's inherent ability. By completing specific quests, he can copy and store others' inherent skills in the memory of the world, and fuse these skills to create capabilities of higher dimensions. However, the condition may be partially altered if the difficulty of copying a skill increases. Min Yungwu calls and urges him to hurry up and come out, expressing that he cannot hold on for much longer. In response he says, let's see, indicating his intention to copy the old man's ability. He checks Min Yungwu's ability and notices the copy condition. Min Yungwu has always been hiding his true feelings under a mask, which makes him reveal his true feelings. He thinks he needs to provoke him to elicit that response. Min Yungwu tells Kang Jin Hayuk to hurry up, to which he replies that he can stop using his skill. Kang Jin Hayuk looks at him annoyingly, and in response, he truthfully states that there is no reason for him to keep using the skill he believes. Confused, Min Yungwu asks what he is talking about and questions why he told him to use it. King Jin Hayek replies by mentioning Karpo and thinks it's easy to break the barrier as long as he speaks in Latin. He considers Karpo a Latin word and believes the old man did nothing to help break it. He reflects on the futility of constantly attacking when the attacks can't pierce through, deeming it a waste of magic. He is sure that the old man's magic is at rock bottom. Thinking that he has insurance, he decides that the next step is to provoke the old man. He looks at the map and concludes that he already knows all the details about the tower. Therefore, the map, which has information up to the 10th floor, is useless to him. Meanwhile, he thinks that doesn't mean he'll quietly hand it over while trying to light a lighter. Min Yungwu shouts, asking what he is doing. He replies that he told him before that he doesn't need the map and proceeds to burn it. He thinks that because someone else could learn the knowledge up to the 10th floor through this map, there is a risk of them gaining an advantage over him. Min Yungwu shouts at him while he calmly stands in front of the burning map, thinking that if that's the case, the only way to ensure his position is to eliminate that possibility. Min Yungwu asks why he burned the map, abuses him, and threatens to kill him and rip him apart. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that he has met the conditions and has successfully copied the fire element B skill while a memory book appears before him. He receives another notification that the copied skill is being saved in the world's memories and checks the details about the fire element. He can control fire and his affinity with this element will increase. He thinks the fire element is not a bad start for his first copy. Min Yungwu declares that he will make him regret doing that and promises to pay him, preparing to attack him with his fire magic. In response, he states that Min Yungwu doesn't understand something and asks why he thinks he burned that map. He receives a notification that the level 1 fire element is being activated and activates his fire element. Min Yungwu looks at him and thinks he's sure it's the same skill as his, but he believes he is nothing compared to him. 
He thinks someone like him isn't normal, almost to the point that he may not even need the map. After a while, Min Young Woo asks who he is, and then he replies that if Min Young Woo wants to climb the tower comfortably, he should listen to him carefully while he walks out of the museum. He thinks that four vets appeared at the National Museum of Korea, including him, and he understands why they wanted to decrease their risk factor, especially when the world has turned into the Tower of Trials. Still, they are trying to get ahead at the same time. He checks his status screen and sees that his level is 1, strength is 8, dexterity is 7, health is 11, magic is 0, unallocated stat points are 0, his class is none innate, his ability is combined, and his skills are level 1 fire element and level 1 eye of truth. He thinks he needs to obtain as many skills and innate abilities as possible. He recalls telling Min Young Woo that he would contact him later, and that he wants him and that girl, Li Yuri, downstairs to raise their levels. Meanwhile, he believes he may have acquired some chess pieces, but he still has a long way to go and needs to gather the necessary skills first. He thinks that obtaining every skill would probably be impossible since he only has one body. He believes the most important and tastiest ones will be the ones he hoards. His stomach growls, and then he says it looks like he's at his limit, and this is the perfect time for Gukbap. He enters a restaurant. He sees a crowd there, and they watch the news. He asks what's going on while the news broadcasts that there were at least 23 deaths and more than 50 injuries at the National Museum of Korea. As there are those with serious injuries, the death counts have been increasing. The news also broadcasts that it is assumed that the leader was targeting the relics stored in the museum, and not only Korea but the US, Europe, Japan and other countries have been suffering through similar incidents. Kang Jin Hyun believes that, just as he thought, other players worldwide have started to make their moves to prepare to climb the tower. The news reporter states that first, let's look at the CCTV inside while showing the fight between the tiger and the jackal guards. The reporter adds that this may be difficult to believe, but the footage is real. A person expresses disbelief, stating that a person can't do that, and asks who the person is, questioning if it's the same individual who appeared in the Tower of Trials community. Another person inquires if they're referring to the video of the guy who defeated the mangrove, to which someone replies affirmatively, saying, he's right, look at those moves, they're the same. Kang Jin Hyun listens to them and thinks too many people can recognize him. He must think of a way to hide his identity. The news reporter reiterates that the government is investigating the unidentified building, the Tower of Trials. A special department, called the Awakened Association, has been newly established, comprising veterans with various abilities. He ponders what the Awakened Association is, noting that the government's response is faster than expected. Pouring water into the glass, he contemplates how they have already formed a group of individuals awakened with innate abilities. It appears they plan to be flexible with this incident, which he finds unexpected. He had thought it would take at least several weeks. The news reporter announces that more details will be provided by people related to the department and introduces Han Sangjin as the chief of the newly established Awakened Association. He elaborates that he is appearing before him today to gather more awakened members. There may be differences depending on ranks, but they promise to offer an annual salary of at least 60 million won with a position equivalent to a grade 7 government official. He adds that of course this excludes the person who appeared in the videos. As the association chief, he assures that the government will support whatever he desires if he joins them. A person remarks that even if he doesn't know him, he's still jealous, and a girl says it's impressive, noting that it could change anyone's life. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that the person who just appeared in the video is an exception, so their goal was him in the end. He believes they've been treating him like a complete tool while secretly laughing. Regardless of what they try to offer him, he has no intentions of joining others. In this world, he thinks, the value of one extremely well-trained individual is higher than that of a hundred average individuals. He believes Han Sangjin knows that too, and that's why he decided to offer a blank check to persuade him. 
He thinks that if he has been selected as the president, it must be because he possesses the skills to back it up, and if not, it must be because he has the most experience within the Tower of Trials. Meanwhile, he expresses a genuine hope that it's because Han Sangjin has an excellent skill. That way, it would be more interesting for him to copy. Glancing at the time, he notes that it's 7 o'clock and thinks the Tower of Trials will open tonight at 7 p.m. when the hour points to the new hour. He receives a notification that the Tower of Trials has now been opened. They all enter the Tower of Trials and he instructs them to stop pushing each other. Finally, they arrive, and he remarks that it's the same as before. He still can't believe it, and they're all newbies. He receives a notification that, as a celebration of entering the tower, they have been provided with a hundred coins, which can be used within the building. Another notification informs players that they can upload videos recording their accomplishments and earn a hundred coins for every 10,000 views. He receives another notification indicating that there will be a premium charge based on the player's status. All players in the tower who watch videos will have their first 10,000 views count, so it's advised to be careful before deciding which videos to watch. The live broadcast function can be used when dealing with the boss to progress to the next level. Another notification states that if one is found to be manipulating view counts or using other forms of cheating, a warning message will be issued and there will be adequate punishment. Kang Jin Hyatt confirms and says that's what he's talking about as he looks at these notifications. He thinks about the bridge between people who want to climb the tower and those who wish to continue living outside the tower, the broadcast system. Meanwhile, he considers that viewers tend to watch players who have a higher chance of showcasing the top of the tower, thereby increasing their views and the functions within the Tower of Trials. This is his most exciting aspect as he observes many people going live and earning more coins. He believes the more famous he becomes, the more coins he can earn. He suggests going to the Goblin Cave, mentioning that if they can secure a good spot, farming there will be easy and everyone can have fun. The people start running quickly and he observes them, thinking they are all in such a hurry because they want to try clearing it as soon as possible and be ahead of everyone else, and earning coins should be easy for him since he knows everything about this place. He thinks, however, he doesn't intend to upload a video first. Instead, he relies on the video to earn coins by sharing the information he knows would be a more significant loss. He thinks he already knows what to do and contemplates something unique that nobody else would do first. He believes that, while they are clearing the lower 30 levels of the tower, there was a time when they couldn't proceed any further. He thinks that, to get to the next level, they need to look for hidden pieces within the lower levels, which means retracting their steps from their previous experiences while he goes there and tries to find something. In the end, he thinks they were able to find the solution in an abandoned ruin while walking forward and believes that was when they found out, becoming so worried. He thinks the fact that his character was flamed from the start, and for this to be the result they found after all this time, he thinks his character, which he spent years growing, has become disappointing. He receives a notification about character deletion and wonders if it would really be like deleting his character. After a while, he becomes irritated and says he has devoted everything to this, so why is this the answer? He states that not even the time he spent regretting was a waste and accepts the process of deleting his character. He says he will need to start over and then disappear. He thinks that next time he will reach the top. He reaches the gate again and wonders if that was already six years ago. He receives notifications that name is Labyrinthos, its type is a labyrinth, its difficulty is at level B, and this is a labyrinth created by D. Dallas. It is unique for its confusing mazes and numerous traps designed to dissuade people from entering. He thinks the cornerstone of getting beyond 30 floors is building his building, and the key to figuring that out is within this maze Labyrinthos. Kang Jin Hayak annoyingly states that he never thought he would have to go through this again, and even though he hates it, he has a sense of nostalgia as he tries to open the gate. Opening it, he says, alright, let's go inside. Upon seeing the familiar scene and smelling the same scent, he remarks it's all the same. As he looks around, he notices numerous butterflies. 
making one butterfly sit on his hand he says, it's nice seeing him luminescent moth. Spotting some people, he inquires, who are these people? A girl approaches him and says, nice to see him. She explains that they were looking for a place to farm, but decided to come in here before the labyrinth closed. The scene shifts 10 minutes before entry as he attempts to open the gate. Some people follow him, and Jang Chul Sik states that he knows they followed him because there might be something. However, isn't that a labyrinth? Park Hana replies that he went to the labyrinth right after entering the tower and asks what he plans. He responds that he even opened the door without a key. She suggests, let's go in too, and a man with yellow hair asks why they need to go in, even though they don't know how big or dangerous it might be. She responds, try thinking about it with his brain, and they all should know that the early parts of the Tower of Trials are the most important. Furthermore, she points out that he opened a labyrinth without a key for it, and if someone at level 1 went in, it must mean that it's not that difficult. She adds, well she guesses it is a labyrinth on the first floor. Jang Mina inquires whether she thinks that the guy will graciously share the items with them. Park Hana responds that he won't do that, and all they have to do is allow him to have his eternal rest inside the labyrinth. The story returns to the present as Park Hana greets Kang Jin Hayek and recounts that, while they were hunting, they observed the labyrinth door was open. They entered before it closed and inquire why not cooperate to clear the labyrinth together. She proposes sharing the risk of danger collectively. Kang Jin Hayek wonders if she is attempting to deceive him, questioning her credibility and leadership. He activates his Eye of Truth and receives a notification about it. Park Hana introduces herself, stating she is 22 years old and has previously reached the second floor of the Tower of Trials. Kang Jin Hayek checks her status screen, revealing she is at level 1 with a strength of 4, agility of 5, vitality of 5, and magic of 10. He considers that this girl possesses quite an exciting skill. He receives more notifications that Commune can naturally foster friendliness with anyone, even strangers, and this skill can eliminate feelings of discomfort. Meanwhile, another notification appears regarding the cooperation condition that requires working with Parkana for at least 240 hours. However, once 240 hours have passed, no one must be near him and Parkana. He thinks it will be helpful when dealing with her in the future. Jang Chul Sik introduces himself as Jang Chul Sik and mentions that he quit after playing on the floor for a little while. Li Hai Min introduces herself as Li Hai Min and states that she also plays up to the first floor. Jang Mina also introduces herself as Jang Mina, mentioning that she has played up to the third floor. Chin Min Guk requests to be called Chin Min Guk and states that he has never played the Tower of Trials or whatever it's called. Du Kuang Wu introduces himself as Du Kuang Wu, expressing that it's also a first for him. Then, Kang Jin Hayek smiles and identifies himself as Kang Jin Hayek. He thinks they are obviously going to stab him in the back later, so there's no need to remember each of their names. Park Hana approaches him, grabs his arm, and asks him what floor he has played the Tower of Trials. He is notified that Park Hana has activated the skill level 1 commune. He thinks she's using it like this, he might have become intimate with her if he didn't know about it. He looks at her and turns her face away, saying he has gone up as far as possible. She exclaims, wow, and asks if that is so, while he wonders what's with her. The commune skill should be in effect, which is strange. She then requests him to tell them what kind of monsters are present and their traits. He replies that he can do that much, and this labyrinth changes at fixed intervals. Surprisingly, she asks what he means. Everything starts moving, and they are all scared. She asks, what is this, and shouldn't this only be a labyrinth on the first floor? The building starts to collapse, and they run to save their lives. Jang Chul Sik tells Du Kuang Wu that he will get squashed if he stands still and looks up. They all quickly move aside, and after some time, Park Hana says it has stopped. Li Hai Min states she doesn't see Jang Mina, and Jang Chul Sik comments that it's unbelievable to think there is a labyrinth like this on the first floor, and if there wasn't supposed to be anything special on the first floor other than the ruins. 
Kang Jin Hayek asks if they haven't all experienced terrain changing labyrinths at least once. Park Hanna asks who would experience something like that and says this is too dangerous for level 1 players, they must get out of here as soon as possible. She inquires of Kang Hai Min whether she can locate the exit and she should be able to do so with her skill. Hai Min responds that the skill activation was cancelled when the labyrinth changed. Worriedly, she inquires once again if she cannot find the exit and questions if they are trapped there. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on why they entered the labyrinth so confidently, speculating that they seem to have relied solely on navigation skills, and these newcomers must have viewed the labyrinth as a neighborhood supermarket. He thinks it should reveal itself soon, aside from these individuals. Park Hana becomes irritated and calls out to him from behind, asking why he didn't inform them about something as crucial as the labyrinth changing earlier. The walls were flying at them, and they were injured after frantically dodging the pieces, they almost died because of him. Meanwhile, Jang Chul Sik also agrees with her, stating that he's hogging all the information, and Du Quang Wu says they got separated from Jang Mina because of him. Kang Jin Hayek annoyingly looks at them and asks if he asked them to follow him. Park Hana realizes their mistake and clarifies that they decided to follow him on their own. He didn't drag them in here by force. Chen Min Guk becomes angry, expressing that the individual keeps talking negatively, and they already feels terrible being trapped in this situation. He mentions he didn't like him from the moment they met and is ready to attack, but then he notices a minotaur and becomes scared. He acknowledges that things have already taken a turn for the worse, and an axe comes from somewhere, killing him. The others look at him in fear. Du Quang Wu asks what has happened as the Minotaur roars. Park Hana envisions the Minotaur as they all prepare to fight, and he retrieves his axe. She believes they are going to die as the Minotaur almost attacks them. Kang Jin Hayek instructs everyone to get out of the way and runs towards the Minotaur. She looks at him and asks what he is doing. They both run to attack each other, and the Minotaur attacks him, but he manages to escape. He receives a notification that he dodged the attack, thinks everything is alright, and gets another message that he has obtained the hidden stat rift. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification about a stat that narrows the gap in battles with the strong, but on the other hand widens when fighting against a weaker opponent. He contemplates how it narrows the gap of one level per three stat points when facing stronger enemies while holding the horn of the Minotaur. He believes this is the best method to enhance his strength at his current level one state, and it's the most effective approach he discovered after going through countless trials and errors. As the Minotaur roars again, he reflects that he has already endured this creature's attack thousands, tens of thousands of times before. Another notification informs him that his stat gap has increased by 0.5. He thinks his body has memorized the Minotaur's attack patterns and repeatedly receives messages about his stat gap rising by 0.5. Considering himself a veteran, he evades the Minotaur's attack and thinks that no matter how powerful the attack is, it's useless if it doesn't land a hit. Du Quang Wu see him in shock and comment that they plan to mess with a guy like that. Park Hana thinks she can't believe they were considering killing that monster and stealing his loot, realizing how crazy she was to think that way. Kang Jin Hayek taunts the Minotaur, expressing surprise at its slow movements and questioning how it plans to hit him with such predictable swings. The Minotaur, becoming angrier, roars and launches another attack. Kang Jin Hayek reflects that getting more vital quickly is simple. All he has to do is bet his life on the line. He successfully evades the attack again, thinking that the more he does, the higher his reward. He receives another notification, stating that he has barely evaded a fatal attack, and his stat gap has risen by one. He considers getting one stat point for a few drops of blood, a fair exchange, and confidently thinks he's got this. He remarks that taking a wrong step could be dangerous, but decides it's time to end this soon. He then notices something and comments on it. He inquires whether those supporting characters are attempting to run away. Li Hai Min tells Park Hana she wants to leave and hides behind her. Park Hana responds that she's confident they'll find the exit if they check the walls. 
Kang Jin Hayek approaches from behind and questions where they are all going, startling them. He advises them to do the same thing he does if they want to increase their stats. If they evade his attack, they gain hidden stats, making it easier than they think. He encourages them to try it, emphasizing that they should share the benefits. The Minotaur attacks Park Hana, but Kang Jin Hayek quickly grabs her arm and saves her. Startled, they all express fear. Kang Jin Hayek comments on their reaction, stating they should have ducked or created some distance. He addresses the Minotaur as Little Calf and asks if that isn't right. After a while, he spots the walls again, moves forward, and traps the Minotaur on the other side, blocking its way. He tells it to see him later, as the Minotaur roars in anger. Jang Chul Sik mentions that they almost died along with Chin Min Guk and He Min. Park Hana sits on her knees and asks if they have lost it, wondering if it won't come after them now. Kang Jin Hayek explains that the Minotaur is attracted to the residue left behind by the Noctilucent's moths he touched earlier while observing a sleeping butterfly. He predicts that it will probably keep coming after them. Park Hana questions why he is doing something so crazy. He responds, asking if it isn't obvious he's doing it to increase his stats. He suggests she can take a short break and catch her breath whenever the maze changes. He adds that she can play with the little calf when it comes knocking and asks if it isn't efficient. She questions how long they must continue this, and Jang Chul Sik responds that they must do it until they leave the maze, which is precisely one month. He thinks about enduring this hellhole for 30 more days, holds Park Hana's hand, and assists her in walking. She suggests that they go their separate ways to avoid being attacked by the monster. Kang Jin Hayek agrees, asking which way they plan to go, as unquestioningly wandering could be more dangerous. They stop, and he asks if they know where the exit is. Kang Jin Hayek states that as mentioned before, he knows this maze better than anyone else and knows where the exit is. She wonders if there's no way for them alone. Seeing a dagger in his hand, she reluctantly says they'll follow. He responds that nothing in this world is free, even buses have fares, and he shows her the dagger. He instructs them to spit out all their coins. The scene shifts to Myon H1 engaging in a battle with goblins, successfully defeating them. He uploads the fight video, garring numerous views and comments, making his content highly popular. Observing the success, he proudly exclaims to his friends that it worked, and they can see the positive outcome. One of his friends notes that even the forums are buzzing with discussions about him, suggesting that the bloody battle with the goblins was worth it. The person with glasses mentions that they can potentially earn 1,000 coins just from the views alone. Mion H1 appreciatively responds that this success is all thanks to their hard work, expressing gratitude to his friends. Another friend remarks that everyone believes he achieved it independently, attributing the well-edited video to the perception. The person with glasses adds that no one will know he was buffed, emphasizing the clever support provided by the group. A commenter named Bald Human criticizes Myon H1, stating that 15 hours isn't a short time and citing someone they know who cleared it in 5 hours. Myon H1 notices and dismisses the comment, remarking on the ease with which anyone can make negative remarks. Myon H1 advises not to get too depressed, the world is full of haters. The person with glasses calls him and presents a notification indicating that a new video has been updated in the Hall of Fame, adding that the rank of their video is rising. Myon H1 in shock asks what's going on and why it happened suddenly. Upon seeing the notification about the successful refinement of the world's first plus 10 item, he exclaims it's crazy a plus 10 refinement. As he receives numerous comments, he expresses disbelief, stating that it doesn't make sense and questioning how it can happen while the views rapidly increase. The scene shifts to 10 minutes earlier, where Kang Jin Hayek instructs now pay attention, don't just stand around like Jang Seung and do what they must do. Jang Chul Sik and Park Hana walk away as Kang Jin Hayek explains that they need to collect moss to make a bed and gather firewood to make a fire. He emphasizes that they have a lot of work to do. Jang Chul Sik agrees, saying they are going. He responds that he guesses he should start now stock exchange, 
he receives a notification from the coin stock exchange, welcoming him to the stock exchange. He states that first, he wants to secure his coins and decides to see and choose cards. He gets a notification about Enchanted Tarot Cards F, an old worn-out bronze key fragment F, a piece of a wooden wagon wheel F, and 10 lottery refinement scrolls F, he obtains these items. He thinks these items may be considered trash by others, things that no one would buy. He then receives a notification asking if he will purchase the items. He confirms and gets another message thanking him for his purchase, but emphasizing the importance of how he uses them. He declares that he will combine three items and receives a notification confirming the successful combination of the three items. Another notification follows, indicating the incomplete state of Fortuna, the goddess of luck's wheel of fortune. It mentions that his fortune will increase to a maximum of 10 minutes, but the range in which it can be used is limited due to its incomplete state. He expresses satisfaction, thinking about luck having a limited capacity. He reflects that one may never realize the use of luck if they don't know its limits, but he knows exactly where that boundary is. He believes this knowledge stems from remembering everything in his life. A notification arrives, stating that his fortune has increased to the maximum. He receives some refinement and contemplates that the success rate of refinement is 0.12%, and they may be spells with the worst odds. However, his success rate is 100% if his luck is maxed out. He decides to use it all on his dagger and receives numerous notifications confirming the successful refinement, resulting in him gaining an old dagger plus 10 max. He receives a notification about a bonus achievement, stating that he has become the first to create a plus 10 refined item on the Korean server. He has gained 5,000 coins and the achievement will be recorded in the Hall of Fame for the entire day tomorrow. Waving his dagger, he thinks he finally has something worth using. The scene shifts to the 10th day in Hell, where Jang Chul Sik and Park Hana sit in a corner. She reflects on their situation, including a bonfire created with gathered firewood and beds made of moss, with nothing to eat besides mushrooms and moss. There's also a minotaur that continually appears, and the shifting labyrinth separates their life from death. She thinks about Kang Jin Hyun, who sleeps on the floor, and expresses concern that if this keeps going, they'll really die. He agrees, stating that they will just be abandoned after being used by that demon. She receives some anonymous comments and becomes shocked as she reads them. She whispers, asking if anyone has any information on this person. She hides her face in her hands, thinking she can't believe she's trying to get support from these morons outside of the tower. She tells them to shut up and asks if they told Appa about the situation and what the Raven Guild said. Anonymous 5 replies that yes, he told him, and the Guild is also looking into it. Anonymous 6 adds that there wasn't a lot of information regarding that maze in the first place, and they'll need at least three weeks to get to her. She thinks she has to go through this for three more weeks. Jang Chul Sik asks her what the guild members say and what she will do. She replies that there's no information, and she thinks if they kill Kang Jin Hayuk and hold out in the stone chamber, they found earlier until Appa gets here, they should be able to get out of this hellhole. She observes him sleeping and says the problem is how to kill him. He grabs a rock and suggests that it's their chance when he's sleeping, saying let's do it now. Everyone dies when their heads are bashed in any way as he attempts to attack him. Park Hana approaches him, holds his hand, and stops him. She whispers wait, and he asks why she stopped him. She whispers that the guy's reaction speed is crazy and they won't be able to defeat him in a fight, whether they approach him secretly or up front. She predicts that he'll probably wake up the moment they attack and make a counterattack. He whispers then what the hell do they do, it's not like they can keep suffering like this. She asks who said they would suffer and finds something in her bag. She mentions that her brother is a member of the Raven Guild and there's something he gave her for a dangerous situation. She takes out something and says it's a lethal poison that can melt a hundred trolls with a single drop. It's the sting of a giant zucchini wasp. She suggests that if they are going to do this, they should make sure to send him for good in a way where they won't be in any danger. After a while, Kang Jin Hayek gets up and sees food. 
He again comments more on moss and mushrooms for food, thinking about the tree bark tray and rat bones chopsticks, likening it to filming a real survival video. She asks what else he expects, stating there's nothing else they can eat here. If he wants more, he should go and hunt some rats or moths to eat, thinking he's too picky. He asks if she can give him the water behind her and tells Jang Chul Sik to please give him more mushrooms. She grabs the water bottle to give him, and Jang Chul Sik asks if he wants more, pouring him more food. He expresses disbelief that he wants to eat more of this gross stuff, encouraging him to dig in. Kang Jin Hayek replies let's eat, while she thinks she can't believe they have to serve him. She again receives messages from Anonymous and thinks he ate it, while Jang Chul Sik throws his plate down, holds his neck and cries in pain because he ate poisonous food and is about to die. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek remarks that he's not foolish and questions if she thought he'd eat the food they gave him. She replies, affirming that she knew it was poisoned. He acknowledges that when he asked her for more, he did the old switcheroo while both backs were turned. He insists that they should know that secret broadcasting is considered cheating. She asks what he is talking about and if he has any evidence. She again receives messages from Anonymous, indicating that it looks like he found it and questioning if this is going to turn into a real-life PK. He responds, stating that they'll see, mentioning that the live broadcast function can only be used when attacking the boss monster that guards the path to the next floor. He further asserts that appropriate measures will be taken if manipulation of the number of views or other misconduct is detected. He receives a notification stating that if misconduct has not been found, then the player who reported this will be penalized and asks if he will continue with his report. He comments that she should have watched her facial expressions while broadcasting, emphasizing that it's totally obvious and he can't believe this is Park Hanna. He's so disappointed. He confirms this while a warning notification appears around her, and she worriedly asks what's going on. He gets a notification that the capture is complete and the anonymity will be removed. She becomes worried and observes that the number of views is decreasing. Comments on her situation are left, and she leaves her live broadcast. Her current number of viewers drops to zero. Meanwhile, he receives notifications that prior viewers will be unable to view videos for one month from now, and upon getting caught a second time, prior viewers will be permanently banned. She asks what just happened and where did everyone go. He receives a notification that the penalty for the current player will face a harsh fate. They see the Minotaur again, approaching and running towards them. She becomes scared, hides behind him, and asks if he will fight this time too, questioning where he's going. He says she's shameless because just now, they had decided to poison him, so why would he tell her something like that? She replies that he always did until now. He gets another notification that the condition to copy the skill is that he will need to spend at least 240 hours with Park Hanna. However, no one must be around when he eats with her once the 240 hours have passed and he has met the conditions. He notices that she's crying for help, and he receives another notification that he has successfully copied the skill communion. He states that he doesn't need her now. She shouts, asking what he means by now as he walks away. She pleads for him to wait, claiming he'll regret this, and mentions that her brother is a member of the Raven Guild. Meanwhile, the Minotaur attacks them and throws them away. He thinks about making sure he gets a good look from there to see which one of the stupid guilds is and her he should be more afraid of. Kang Jin Hayat comes from behind the Minotaur, attacking its head. The Minotaur growls in pain, and he thinks the attack is still shallow but has caused damage. He believes it was worth closing the gap as he returns to the ground. He acknowledges that he won't be able to kill it anyway. That's why he just needs to make it suffer the same circumstances. Meanwhile, he is notified that the level 1 fire element has been activated while the Minotaur roars. He quickly passes under its legs and cuts its leg with his dagger. The Minotaur bends that injured leg while looking at him and says not to go crazy because the meat will be tough to chew if it gets muscular. He thinks they're almost there, waiting for this guy to bring out his final card. He then receives a notification that the Minotaur, the guardian of the labyrinth, 
has activated the level 10 Berserk state. The Minotaur regains its powers and roars, while Kang Jin Hayek also readies to fight. Park Hanna looks at them, wondering how they are supposed to defeat something like that. He receives a warning notification that it's a level 10 Berserker, and the skill description mentions that the Minotaur's attack power, attack speed, and movement speed increase by 30% for 5 minutes from the moment of activation. Another notification follows, indicating an additional option about temporarily increasing intelligence that enables speaking a language. The Minotaur declares that it'll rip him to shreds and scatter his pieces all over the dungeon, preventing him from trespassing again. He responds that his magic power efficiency feels higher than before and challenges the Minotaur, waving his dagger. The Minotaur vows to crush him and throws its axe, but he blocks the attack with his dagger and throws it away. Meanwhile, she hides behind a pillar, astonished at how powerful the situation is. She remarks that he's not dodging anymore, but rather blocking by redirecting the force of the attack. He thinks it's a boss monster that has activated a skill over level 10, and not even the full force of the Crow Guild could be a match for it. The Minotaur runs again to attack him. She wonders how that crazy man can be laughing in this situation. He thinks it feels like time has stopped, and he hates the reality that feels like he's at a standstill, no matter how much he runs, feeling powerless within this reality where nothing changes. He falls and receives a notification that he has died. Whether it be reality or a game, their difficulties are both hell, but his rift stat points reach 57. He thinks the world responds to him and gets another notification that the rift stat has increased by 05 while he stops the Minotaur's attack. He quickly runs towards the Minotaur, delivering cuts on its body while moving around in a circle. The Minotaur replies that he's full of cheap tricks, being human, and that he can only make scratches on its body. It comes back to the floor and looks towards him. He receives a notification that the Guardian of the Labyrinth the Minotaur's level 10 Berserker skill has ended and mentions that five minutes have passed. The Minotaur calls him impertinent. He thinks the Berserker skill can exert power for five minutes beyond the individual's limits. Still, there is a penalty for the individual falling into a suspended state for 24 hours afterward. Another notification follows, stating that the Guardian of the Labyrinth, the Minotaur, will be suspended for 24 hours. He says he has 57 rift stat points, and 19 levels will reduce the gap in terms of levels. He thinks there are only 20 days left, so he can easily reach his objective of 100 points. Meanwhile, she inquires if it is over. He responds that he can't move after his berserker skill has ended. He adds that after the labyrinth changes and 24 hours pass, he will come to chase them again. While smiling, he mentions that there are still 20 days left for this. The scene shifts 20 days later when Kang Jin Hayek sees the Minotaur again and thinks about a right horizontal slash. He receives a notification that the rift stat has increased by 015. He then thinks about a low slash and receives a message again that the rift stat has increased by 015. He has obtained 100 rift stat points. He exclaims finally, he got it while the Minotaur runs towards him again. He wonders why it feels like he is getting weaker as time passes. He punches the Minotaur away with full force, saying it must be his imagination. He stands on the Minotaur's horn and declares that the only thing left is to figure out how to dispose of him. She asks what he means by disposing of, and he replies that they will begin recruiting interns for their veteran company. He asks her what an intern is, and she replies that she's lacking enthusiasm, guessing she's not interested. She responds that she is interested, pleads to let her join, and mentions she has always wanted to join this company. He responds well, what a passionate applicant. Here's a question for her. Tell him what she has to offer that can benefit the company. She states that her sociability and her exclusive skill, commune, will be helpful in the management of the company. He thinks it's not exclusive anymore and asks what else. She replies that she'll never betray him. He asks that's it, there's nothing else she has to offer, and what a disappointment. He announces that they will now announce the results of the first successful internship recruitment for the veteran company. She replies no, that's not right, please give her time to think.
He says it's never happened while she mentions that she has Braham's ring. She says she'll give him that ring and sits on her knees, starts crying, and says her brother said he'd be negotiating with China as payment for offering them Korean ginseng, so please spare her life. He thinks Braham's ring will fall into the hands of the Crow Guild, and it is one of the best items he can obtain on the first floor. He thinks it increases movement speed, grants magic resistance, and even can suppress the magical power of monsters, with three valuable options. He is notified that he has activated level 1 Eye of Truth, and Park Hana's words are valid. He thinks she doesn't seem to be messing around and congratulates her, acknowledging that she has passed and become an intern at the veteran company. She believes she's in the clear now, but he informs her that their company doesn't provide wages to interns. He emphasizes that she must run to him whenever he calls, regardless of the time or location. He expresses indifference, stating that it doesn't matter if it's 3am or if she's on Jeju Island, she must keep that in mind. He adds that it's now time to fill out a contract, and she questions the need for such paperwork. Upon receiving a notification that she has read the memory of the world, he confirms that she indeed has. He combines level 1 commune and level 1 element of fire, receiving a notification that the two skills will be merged. He mentions that it will get a bit hot and receives a message that he has obtained the brand of Tribulation A. She inquires if this is the contract. He asks if she thought she would put a seal on some piece of paper. He congratulates her on joining their black company as an intern shocking her. He receives a notification that the level 1 brand of Tribulation will be engraved on Parkhana's face and also obtains the details of the brand of Tribulation. Park Hana observes that she can see the light, while he receives a notification that she was the first to clear the first floor labyrinth. Upon seeing the door open, she remarks that they are finally out. He receives notices stating that his achievement will be recorded in the Hall of Fame tomorrow for the entire day, and players who have cleared this location will each be given 5,000 coins. She notices the notification and questions if this is the reward for all their hard work. He approaches her, addressing her as an intern. She looks at him and affirms, saying yes. He instructs her to hand it over, thinking that with this, he now has over 10,000 coins and he bets there's no one else with more coins than him at this time. He tells her to bring him Braham's ring in three days. She expresses that three days is too short, to which he responds by saying two days and slapping her. She agrees, saying she'll somehow get it. Meanwhile, the news reports that apparently Dangun, the guild representing Korea, is planning to face the third floor boss monster a week from now, while another news reporter asks if he's talking about the number one guild in Korea. He confirms and mentions that since the US, Europe and Japan are having a hard time, the expectations for Korea are high. The other reporter asks if China is still keeping quiet in their situation. He affirms that instead of relying on other countries, they should work on overcoming this with their strength. He adds that if they are talking about the Dangun Guild, he believes they should be able to defeat it single-handedly. He suggests they challenge the third floor boss monster within a month, wondering how much they want to regret their actions later. Meanwhile, he contemplates and understands why they need to rush, wanting to be the first among all the challengers out there. However, there's a time limit of 90 days per floor. He thinks in other words, there's no need to head up to the second floor, much less the third floor right now. He considers that if his foundation is poor and the difficulty level is increased, the moment he hits a wall, the pressure of the difficulty level will increase, especially since there's no reboot for mankind's extinction. For now, he decides to gather the information released to the public during the last month in a world where gossip and lies are overwhelming. He thinks he will need trustworthy people to obtain high-quality information and a source that has been reliable for a long time. He observes some comments and thinks they are probably those guys. He notices a man who says he's a human big head and his real name is Lee Tiemann, and a girl appears, saying she's hot-headed fist and her real name is Yu Yonawa. He thinks they are different from their game personas and recognizes them as veteran players he played with two years ago, meeting them in person today for the first time. 
he receives a notification that level 1 Eye of Truth is being activated and checks his status screen, revealing his name is Lee Tiemann. He is a 23-year-old male, and his level is 11. His strength is 13, dexterity is 15, health is 16, and magic level is 21. He has only 2,500 coins. Further inspection shows that his innate ability is Machine King, and his skills include Level 2 Hourglass Mode, Level 2 Command, and Level 2 Hacking. He thinks just as he thought he got Machine King this time too, and it's an innate ability specializing in large-scale battles, impeccable except that it consumes a lot of mana. After a while, he checks her status screen and sees her name is Yu Yonwa. She is a 25-year-old female, and her level is 12. Her strength is 25, dexterity is 22, health is 17, and magic is 6. She has 4,775 coins. He checks that her innate ability is Taekwondo Devotee, and her skills include Level 3 H Warring Mind Cultivation Technique, Level 3 Never Retreat in Battles, and Level 2 Increase Magic Power. He thinks she has an innate ability to handle melee tanking and damage. Seeing their similar levels, it looks like they've been hunting together. It makes sense to him, as they always worked well together. He receives a notification about the condition to copy the skill, stating that these two are his long-time companions. If they challenge the 20th floor together, Lee Tiemann and Yu Yonwa's abilities will be copied. Meanwhile, Lee Tiemann asks what he is doing, stating it's his turn. He introduces himself as Kang Jin Hayuk, adding that his nickname is Poop Bi Boong Boong while coughing. He thinks, damn it, why the hell did he pick that name 11 years ago, and mentions that he's 26 years old and works as a BJ for Paprika TV. Lee Tiemann inquires if he's a BJ and mentions that he sometimes watches Paprika. He replies that he's stopped now though. Lee Tiemann again tells him to stop talking so formally, stating that they haven't just met once or twice in the game. Yu Yonhua agrees, saying that they feel more comfortable that way. He agrees and thinks these two are pretty friendly. He recalls Lee jong Su and Pi Kana, thinking they were people who wanted to use him and those who wanted to stab him in the back. Maybe he was fed up with getting mixed up with those kinds of people. He thinks this may be their first meeting, but he feels comfortable around them as they all sit in a restaurant and have coffee. He reflects that he learned about what had been going on inside the labyrinth from Lee Timon and Yu Yonhua including the movements of the top guilds worldwide. He wonders about what a BJS is doing and about the demons group that has been kidnapping and stealing people's coins, while Lee Tiemann asks him surprisingly if he went somewhere for the entire month. He confirms and says it's something like that. Lee Tiemann asks again if he didn't take the test. He asks which test while eating ice cream. Then they all sit in a car and go somewhere while Lee Tiemann tells him many people have been going into the tot after it appeared. Still, since the number of deaths on the second floor is so high, the Awakened Association restricted people from climbing up to only those who have passed their test. Yu Yonwa says they gave him an ID code like this while showing him a barcode in her hand. He recalls that Han Sangjin is the CEO of the Awakened Association. It looks like he's using the reason for decreasing casualties to gather hidden power players. He thinks since it has come to this, he might as well get a taste of that system of the association and use it to his advantage. He believes that after entering the Awakened Association, players judged to be F rank or lower are disqualified from entering the second floor. Conversely, if he gets a higher rank, he'll receive numerous love calls from the top guilds of the nation. He thinks that's why three types of people gather at the testing location. People who only wish to be qualified to climb the Tower of Trials. A person wearing a red cap thinks, please let him get a good rank, and he doesn't care if he doesn't get a D rank. He will be happy as long as he gets an E. King Jin Hayek thinks about the people who came to make judgments on the ranks of those wanting to climb the tower. He wonders which guild will take the next a rank player, and hopes there's a scoop today. News reporters wait for them, thinking about those who came to announce their ranks to the world. He mentions it's Park Hana, she's from the Raven Guild. Another reporter asks if she's the one who survived the labyrinth, and if that's Park Hajin next to her, the rising star of the Raven Guild. 
they call a person from behind and tell him to look back, saying that's Kim Giddy from the Fighting Dads Guild and instruct the cameraman not to miss a shot. Meanwhile, Kim Giddy becomes angry and questions why it's so crowded, wondering if this is a testing location or a bullpen. Park Hajin comments that it looks like there are a lot of people who dream of making a lot of money. He responds that since they don't have much time, they should eliminate the people in line because they don't have time to waste on these waiting reporters. He mentions that he better do well today since he came here because of his siblings and he knows what'll happen if he makes a mistake. Park Hana assures him not to worry, they will make sure to do a good job. Park Hajin confirms this while the guards try to clear a path for them, instructing people to make way. The three walk forward and a guard tells a person to move to the left and make way, emphasizing that they'll get crushed if they don't move. A guard approaches Kang Jin Hayek asking who he is and if he didn't hear them say to move. Kang Jin Hayek questions why he would move when he has pulled out his number ticket and is waiting his turn. Park Hajin becomes irritated and comments that they can't deal with one guy. He walks towards them, puts a finger on Kang Jin Hayek's shoulder and says he doesn't know who he is but he's making a big mistake. It isn't too late so he should quietly move aside. One reporter asks if that guy standing against Park Hajin is planning on committing suicide, he's crazy. Kang Jin Hayek hears that and thinks, Park Hajin, is this the brother Park Hana was talking about? He gets a notification that level 1 Eye of Truth is being activated. He checks his status screen and sees that his name is Park Hajin. He's 26 years old, male, and his level is 8. His strength is 16, dexterity is 15, health is 16, and his magic level is 12. He has just 1580 coins, his innate ability is lethal sneak attack. His skills include level 3 Accelerate, level 2 Hide, and level 2 Light. Meanwhile, Park Hajin asks what he will do by glaring at him. At the same time, Kang Jin Hayek gets a notification about the condition to copy the skill. If he increases his friendship with the target to the max, he can copy their innate ability. However, if he increases their hostility towards him to the max, he can copy any of their skills he desires. He thinks about how to improve their hatred to the maximum, while Park Hajin abuses him and asks if he's still not going to move, and if he thinks he wouldn't do anything just because there were a lot of people watching. Park Hana comes there and asks what's wrong, brother. He replies that this is a crazy person while pointing a finger towards Kang Jin Hayuk, who holds and breaks his finger. Park Hajin cries in pain while Kang Jin Hayuk calmly drinks water. Park Hajin becomes angry and runs to attack him while a person shouts for everyone to get back. Park Hajin charges, but Kang Jin Hayek skillfully dodges his attack, throws his water bottle at him, kicks his leg, and sends him tumbling. The crowd is confused, with one person asking what happened, suggesting he might have tripped, and another wondering if his feet got twisted. Park Hana looks through the crowd, questioning why that man is there. Kim Giddy intervenes, saying to leave it at that, while Kang Jin Hayek looks at him, finding it challenging to fight against Father Kim Giddy. He gets a notification that he has activated level 1 Eye of Truth and attempts to check his status screen. Still, a warning notification appears, stating that the skill activation will be cancelled due to the level difference being over a fixed limit. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek thinks that the guy must be over level 20 and remarks that he didn't know this guy had his nanny with him. Kim Giddy responds, saying he's a bit of a handful, but it can't be helped since he's helpful in some ways. It's useful for Kang Jin Hayek's question because he's supplying Korean ginseng to China. Kim Giddy asks what he's saying and Kang Jin Hayek replies, questioning if the how matters and if it can't. He asks a more practical question, for example, about the method of dealing with the side effects of Korean ginseng. Kim Giddy tells him to stop, and he gets a notification that Kim Giddy has activated the level 3 blackout barrier, creating a barrier between them. Kang Jin Hayek and Kim Giddy are inside the barrier, while others are outside. Lee Timin and Yu Yonwa run to save him from the barrier. 
Kim Giddy says that what he's saying is he wants an exchange with 10 of their monopolized dungeons and asks how he can be sure whether he even knows the information that he claims to know. Kang Jin Hayek touches the barrier and contemplates Korean ginseng, an edible item known for its excellent stamina and magic power recovery. However, if eaten raw, there is a side effect of magic power poisoning. He remarks that the person inside must already be having difficulty due to this side effect. It can be quickly dealt with using three items, Corasian's Extract, Moonlight Stone, and most importantly, the Mandragora Root. Kang Jin Hayek mentions that, besides the other two, the person must be having difficulty finding the source. He offers to tell him where he can find them and asks if he trusts him a little more now. Kim Giddy thinks the information matches the guild's research team and the explorer's reports. He wonders who this man is. Kim Giddy agrees, saying very well, he'll play his game. However, he should be prepared if he plays some poor trick. Kim Giddy points a dagger towards him and warns that he won't just let it slide. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayat considers the demanding price of 10 of their most profitable monopolized dungeons for this information extremely expensive, and he decides to draw the line here. He responds that there must be a misunderstanding, and he is the one offering the opportunity. Yu Yonhua and Li Timin also get ready to fight, kicking a man away from outside the barrier. She warns everyone to get back if they don't want to die. Kang Jin Hayek is notified that the level 3 blackout barrier has been removed, and he comes out. He tells Yu Yonhua to calm down, and she asks if he's alright. Li Timin also asks if he wasn't dragged along by force. She says that if he says the word, she'll wipe the floor with all of them. Kang Jin Hayek assures them he's alright and a better listener than he thought. Park Hajin pleads with Kim Giddy to wait, suggesting that he will go all out if he is given one more chance. Kim Giddy turns toward him, seizes him by the neck, and asserts that he is not someone of Park Hajin's caliber can handle. He warns that Park Hajin will regret it if he acts alone again. Park Hajin affirms that he understands and thinks about what happened inside the barrier, feeling humiliated to this extent. He vows to kill Kang Jin Hayuk no matter what. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification about the copy condition. If he reaches maximum hostility with the subject, he can copy one of the subject's skills of his choice. The conditions have been met, and he has succeeded in replicating the skill of Shallow Breathing D. He gets another notification that Shallow Breathing Passive can control breathing capacity and heart rate, with the threshold changing depending on its level. He receives another notification that the copied skill will be saved in the memory of the world, and he smiles secretly, thinking well that Park Hana is at the first number, wondering if their intern consumed some ginseng before taking the test. As he hears the announcement for the next person to step forward, he enters. The department head, Park, stands there and explains that the test is simple. He needs to strike the magic stone in front of him. He can use any items or his exclusive ability, and the test measures the size of his potential when he strikes the magic stone while observing on his tablet. Kang Jin Hayek asks if he can only use his weapon and not his exclusive ability. He replies affirmatively, revealing his dragger. Park says okay, he can begin whenever he is ready, and points out that it's a mid-grade magic stone, suggesting Kang Jin Hayek should use a low-grade magical stone. He mentions that mid-grade and higher stones don't budge against ordinary people. Kang Jin Hayek prepares to attack and is notified that the stat rift will be activated to its maximum amount. He contemplates how much his suffering in the labyrinth has paid off as he unleashes his power. Park is shocked to witness his abilities, finding it unbelievable. He notes that most people are disqualified since they don't even reach the magic power minimum of the magical stone. Congratulating Kang Jin Hayek, he reveals that he's S rank. Kang Jin Hayek requests to postpone that report by one week. He inquires about the meaning of postpone, to which Kang Jin Hayek responds that it's for personal reasons and he won't care where it's released after one week. Trying to say something, Kang Jin Hayek cuts him off, mentioning that he has learned many things in life and one of them is that the fist close to him is much scarier than the law that's far away, placing his hand on his dragger. Park becomes scared and agrees. 
Kang Jin Hayek exits and encounters intern Park Hana, who hands him Braham's ring, mentioning she has what he asked for. Kang Jin Hayek examines the ring, noting its details, a Braham's ring with magic resistance plus 10, movement speed plus 5%, and exclusive ability suppression plus 20. The description indicates that it suppresses monsters' magical powers. He remarks that he told her it was possible, and they reunited earlier than he expected. She reminds him that she kept her promise, so please remove this. He waves his hand, stating he'll decide based on his actions. Moving toward Lee Timin and Yu Yonhua, they become shocked, with Lee Timin questioning if he's an F rank and she expressing her certainty that he'd be higher than them. He explains that it's a temporary rank and he will get measured again next week, so he'll wait and see. She asks about his position and what he plans to do for the second test, where he mentions he'll have to search for a dungeon and they shouldn't worry about him. He instructs them to keep climbing the tower, assuring them he'll contact them soon and then sits in a car. He reflects on the first test that classifies his rank by measuring his magic power. Those who pass will take the second test, which involves clearing one of the dungeons in the Tower of Trials. Although most people choose dungeons with goblins or orcs due to no difficulty restrictions, he's headed for the only ruins on the first floor, uncharted territory. He notes it's been a while since he was there, arriving at the Hall of the Depraved, where someone from behind instructs him to hurry up and move the luggage. Kang Jin Hayek contemplates that it's the first floor of the Tower of Trials with ruins in the mountains. Being only an F rank at the moment, he can't go inside the ruins alone since the guild that regulates those ruins won't sit still if he does. He thinks all he has to do is register as a porter and go in. Another team member asks him what brings him here, to which he replies that he needs a lot of money to make a living. The team member acknowledges this as accurate for everyone and shows Kang Jin Hayek a family picture, mentioning that he came to support his foxy wife and bunny-like kids. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that guys like these usually die first. The other team member adds that F ranks like them need to be careful because small mistakes can be the end of them, and ambulances can't come to save them since gadgets don't work inside. Kang Jin Hayek reassures him, saying please don't worry, at least the people here will be able to go back home. The team member responds with gratitude, mentioning that Kang Jin Hayek is energetic compared to guys. He receives a notification that a raid quest will begin, initiating the first attack on Ruins 1 with a difficulty rating of S. The objective is to defeat the boss monster and reclaim the throne in the deepest parts of the ruin. The reward for this quest is the right to pick one divine relic. However, if he can't kill the boss monster, the options for the divine relic will be limited. The team leader puts his backpack on the floor and commends everyone for their efforts, suggesting a break before the raid begins. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification about particular goods, a perk for the first to conquer the tower has arrived. He wonders about the nature of this perk and gets another notification that the perk is being opened. His luck and adaptability stats each rise by 10 and the cold heart perk has been activated. He receives another notification about Cold Heart, revealing that he can maintain his composure even in stressful situations, however, his humane emotions may weaken. Additionally, the passive skill Monopolize has been activated. Kang Jin Hayek receives details about Monopolize, explaining that if he hoards the last reward, he may receive the best among all the rewards presented. He thinks it's incredible to choose a great reward among the thousands in the Tower of Trials, but now that probability means nothing to him. They notice a magic circle where Song Chunhua appears and mentions that he can't get used to this, no matter how many times he does it, and asks about the numbers. His subordinate reports that all 50 have arrived safely, and another female subordinate confidently states that she was the one who used magic, ensuring there wouldn't be a mistake. One of Kang Jin Hayek's team porters asks if they are the primary attack units of the Behalf Guild, and another porter speculates that the guy is the captain. Kang Jin Hayek activates his level 1 Eye of Truth. Song Chunhua instructs them to get moving, organize ranks as they move, and follow behind the advance party. 
King Jin Hayek checks Song Chunhua's status screen, revealing that his name is Song Chunhua, a 29-year-old male with a level of 14. His attributes include strength of 30, dexterity of 18, health of 19, and magic level of 5. He possesses three 850 coins, with his innate ability being the lightning of the weight of items. His skills include a level 3 iron shield, level 2 phalanx, and level 2 tenacious will to survive. He receives a notification about the condition to copy, stating that he needs to gain Song Chunhua's loyalty during this raid period. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that he has to gain Song Chunhua's loyalty and realizes that, as the captain of an attack team from one of the top 10 guilds in the country, Song Chunhua's significance may not be as high as expected. Nonetheless, he decides it's acceptable as long as Song Chunhua doesn't hold him back, observing him closely. A covered man warns that it's incredibly dark from that point onward, urging everyone to follow closely behind, emphasizing that they won't be able to rescue anyone if they get lost. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that Level 1 Illuminate is being activated. The covered man performs some magic to illuminate the building, revealing numerous dead bodies of soldiers and goblins. One of the porters looks around and comments on the tremendous sight, while another acknowledges that these are the ruins and the monsters that the advance party dealt with. Another team member examines the dead goblins, noting that they were utterly crushed, and comments on the eerie atmosphere, advising everyone to be quiet as it's scary. A man in a black dress exclaims there they are, over here as he waves his hand, signaling to Song Chunhua that the porters have arrived. Kang Jin Hayuk observes them and finds something peculiar, considering that there wasn't a single casualty despite facing numerous monsters. Reflecting on Song Chunhua, he contemplates the seemingly impossible outcome given the guild's observed attack power. One of his team members approaches from behind, questioning what he's doing and urging him to distribute water and ice quickly. Momentarily forgetting he is still a porter, the team member reminds Kang Jin Hayek to focus on his responsibilities. The team member assures that they will handle one side, instructing him to approach the foreigners in another direction. Kang Jin Hayek ponders the term foreigners and gazes at the guild symbol on their attire, recognizing it as belonging to Europe's elite and realizing that the Zion Guild is present. He scrutinizes a particular soldier among them, noting a shorter figure and contemplates establishing a friendship with them. Carrying an ice water mug, Kang Jin Hayek approaches the soldier and offers good work and some iced water. The soldier expresses gratitude, prompting Kang Jin Hayek to receive a notification that Level 1 Communion is being activated, indicating a slight sense of favorable impression from the target. As the soldier removes their cap, Kang Jin Hayek is taken aback as he realizes that the person is a girl, the youngest daughter of the European aristocratic family of Laurentia. Recognizing her as an all-round player with divine power capable of attacking, defending, and providing supportive healing skills, he identifies her as the hero who saved Amsterdam during a crisis, the renowned player Teresa du Laurentia, also known as the Saintess of Amsterdam. Observing H. Er drink water, he comprehends that her efficiency in facing the undead contributed to the absence of casualties. Despite everyone's shared goal of ascending the tower, he ponders their unexpected choice to raid the ruins instead of challenging the third-floor boss. He attempts to activate his level 1 Eye of Truth, but fails to check her status screen, receiving a notification that the skill has been unable to do so due to the difference in level. Puzzled by the level difference, he wonders if she's over level 20. However, he gets another notification that his luck and adaptability stats have neutralized the level difference. He proceeds to activate level 2 Eye of Truth, but receives a warning notification about the skill failing due to the difference in level. Relieved that he can now peek at the target stat window, he checks Teresa du Laurentia's status screen. Confirming her details, he discovers her name, age 22, gender female, level 29, strength 42, dexterity 31, health 25, magic level 30, and coin count 10,850. 
Additionally, her innate ability is the blessing of the stars, and her skills include level 5 strength and divine power, level 5 stealth, level 4 blessed hands, level 4 sign of the cross, and level 4 illusion barrier. He receives another notification that Teresa is a player ranked within the top 100 in the world. If he saves the life of a woman like her from a dangerous situation, he may copy any one of the innate or regular skills he desires. Impressed by her status, he acknowledges the craze surrounding her. Reflecting on his class quest, he deduces that she chose to forego challenging the boss and participate in the raid here. Teresa expresses her gratitude, and he responds by downplaying it, asserting that he's the one more thankful. After all, she has allowed him to acquire the highly regarded innate ability among paladins, Blessing of the Stars. He contemplates the challenge of orchestrating a situation that puts the girl in danger and allows him to rescue her, recognizing that this is no easy feat. She calls Song Chunwa to join her, demanding urgency. He expresses disbelief and one of his team members reveals they've triggered the Guardian Sentry, declaring it's too late. Surveying the scene of dead soldiers, they witness the Guardian's portal door opening. King Jin Hayek receives a notification indicating that the Guardians of the Ruins have detected the intruders. The countdown begins with 0959 remaining. The Ruins' security system, a sleeping bomb, awakens upon receiving an external stimulus, summoning Guardians to protect the Ruins. King Jin Hayek ponders that leaving them undisturbed poses no immediate danger. Song Chunhua inquires angrily about the person responsible for triggering the alarm and asserts that complaining is pointless now that it's awakened. Kang Jin Hayek acknowledges it's too late, with only 10 minutes remaining. He deems facing the Guardians with their current combat strength as suicidal, considering that evacuating non-combatants within the time frame might work, potentially saving half or more of them. However, he refuses to contemplate such an outcome when they haven't even begun and resolves not to let his newfound captaincy fail. He declares their intention to press on inside. A team member questions his sanity, highlighting the absence of the backup party and the imminent arrival of guardians from all sides. He directs them to cease their chatter and follow him, assuring them he will take responsibility. Despite lacking a backup party, he expresses confidence due to Teresa's presence. He loudly emphasizes that the Guardians have awakened. A team member questions the cause of his concern, asserting that a substantial guild like Balhi wouldn't proceed without a plan. Another member suggests that solo players should merely follow the captain's orders. However, a Jinti member confidently states that the guild likely annihilated the Guardians. Suddenly, a Guardian's hand emerges behind, killing the overconfident member. As the Guardians approach from all sides, Song Chunhua instructs everyone to prepare for battle. The focus shifts to the frontal assault team, where Song Chunhua swiftly commands the Guardians. Everyone prepares for battle, tankers are at the front, and porters fall back. She directs the porters to move and cast buffs on the tankers while dealers gather their magic. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that Song Chunhua has activated level 3 Iron Shield, and he has activated level 2 Wedge Formation. Additionally, Li Yunmi has activated the level 2 Song of the Warrior. Song Chunhua warns here it comes, so maintain the formation. As the Guardians launch their attack, a team member urgently addresses the captain, expressing the need for additional tankers and a healer. Another team member, a woman, attempts to speak, but he interrupts her, instructing everyone to focus on the battle. He acknowledges that casualties are inevitable and dismisses concerns about solo players, lacking the energy to worry about them. Meanwhile, he contemplates the challenges solo players face in dealing with groups compared to guild members with systematic tactics. His team member acknowledges that he knows their predicament and feels abandoned, hoping someone will come to their rescue as they face the approaching guardians. Teresa intervenes, activating her level 4 sign of the cross to defeat the guardians. Recognizing the threat to non-combatants, she urges the need to hurry to the back room. The scene transitions to the back room supply station, where the porkers have fallen victim to the guardians. A surviving porker sits, visibly distressed, as a guardian approaches, declaring him truly dead and launching an attack. 
Kang Jin Hayuk arrives, dispatches the Guardian, and reassures the survivor, asking if he didn't say they made it out alive. His team member becomes scared and alerts Kang Jin Hayuk to a Guardian behind him attempting an attack. Kang Jin Hayuk swiftly activates his level 1 fire element, confidently countering the Guardian with a fire-based attack. As he defeats the Guardian, he expresses certainty that someone else will handle the last hit, considering the utilization of his level 1 state to avoid delivering the final blow. He reflects on the irrationality of awakening guardians in such a brutal ruin and wonders about the individual responsible. After a while, Teresa arrives and escorts the surviving porker away. She confronts Kang Jin Hayuk, accusing him of threatening a non-combatant with a knife and being the one who woke up the guardians. He questions her statement, expressing disbelief, but she responds by initiating an attack. Kang Jin Hayuk attempts to evade her assault, and Teresa insists that she doesn't want to harm him, emphasizing her desire to avoid causing him any harm. He contemplates the apparent misunderstanding in the situation. She insists she will hear his explanations at the association and attacks him. However, he skillfully evades her assault, noting that it seems she doesn't listen when she's excited. As she strikes again, he manages to escape, causing her to fall. Seizing the opportunity, he approaches her with his dagger and asserts that he is not the one responsible for awakening the guardians. He emphasizes that if he were, he could have killed her on the spot. Interrupted by another porker calling for their attention, questioning why they are fighting, Kang Jin Hayek clarifies that he was the one who saved the porker. Teresa apologizes sincerely, expressing remorse for the misunderstanding. Kang Jin Hayek accepts her apology, acknowledging that such misinterpretations can happen. Together, they proceed, and Teresa inquires why he has concealed his identity, addressing him as Jin Hee UK. He responds that his reason is similar to hers. He assumes she is secretly undertaking her class quest, aiming to obtain St. Peter's written oath by using the Zion Guild as a smokescreen. He reveals that he is also secretly searching for an item. She is surprised to hear this and wonders how he knows all that. He explains that he is already familiar with all the tactics of this ruin, and given her abilities, he believes they can rely on each other. He points out that the items they seek are in the same area and asks if she intends to join him. After a while, she approaches Song Chunhua, and he exclaims, expressing disbelief and questioning if she's crazy. He adds that they need to gather their strength to move forward, and he doesn't understand why she wants to move independently. She responds by saying that he has a map showing 20 km of the ruins up to the checkpoint, and by now, they all should be familiar with the strategies used here. Therefore, there won't be any difference whether she's there. She points out that their contract states that each team will be commanded and move independently from one another before the boss fights. He acknowledges that it was before she spoke a stating that she must meet up with them before they reach the edge of where the map is indicated. She affirms she will meet them all before then and asks if she can take one porter to help her. He waves his hand, signaling her to go, and says she can do whatever she wants, but she must promise to return. One of the porters thinks she's going on a hell run and advises the others not to make eye contact, fearing that she'll drag them along if they do. They try to hide their faces, hoping not to be chosen. Kang Jin Hayek raises his hand and expresses his willingness to go, prompting everyone to look at him. A bald porter advises him, speaking from the experience of a 50-year-old man, emphasizing the importance of prioritizing one's life over the allure of the saintess. Another porter agrees, urging Kang Jin Hayek to listen to their advice as it is not an easy decision. Kang Jin Hayek thinks he won't be able to move in this atmosphere. He reflects that if it's like this, he might as well take a chance and asks if they ever burned with desire when they were young like him. They respond, wondering what's happening to him and why he's acting so strangely, questioning why he's being scary. He declares that this moment is when he needs to burn for the sake of love, even at the cost of his life, despite his lacking ability. One of the porters remarks that he must be the last romantic of this generation, and another one reminisces about his youth, encouraging Kang Jin Hayek to go forth as they send him off with Teresa. 
Kang Jin Hayek and Teresa enter and encounter goblins guarding a sarcophagus. She points to the sarcophagus, stating that St. Peter's written oath is inside. He acknowledges this and asks if she knows they need to remove the barrier surrounding the sarcophagus. She confirms, and they both receive a warning notification that the cloister of the fallen owner is observing them. He thinks it's interesting that the boss monster is now showing attention to players, something it hadn't done before. She asks if he saw the message window, and he affirms he did. She suggests that the boss monster sent it. She wonders what gaze means and asks if it implies acknowledgement. He disagrees, asserting that it represents the boss monster who has acknowledged him. She wonders where his groundless confidence comes from. Meanwhile, she expresses curiosity and mentions that he claimed to know every strategy of this place. He confirms this, noting that it has been a while. She then asks what she needs to do. Positioning her amidst the goblins, he receives a notification that Teresa has activated level 5 Song of the Warrior, boosting all stats for 10 minutes. He considers her role similar to his, drawing the undead's attention, and anticipates that chaos will ensue once she releases her divine power. Goblins starts attacking her, and he gets another notification that she is activating level 5 strength and divine power. Teresa efficiently dispatches the goblins while Kang Jin Hayek passes through their ranks, thinking that, at the moment, Teresa has aggro, reducing his risk of inadvertently leveling up. He encounters demonic powers that attack him, but he manages to evade their assault and shifts his focus to the boss monster. A notification informs him that the hidden dead of the ruins, the Elite Lick, has appeared. Acknowledging its arrival, he avoids an attack from a guardian and reflects on the absence of a Dullahan, contemplating whether bringing Teresa altered the usual pattern. As he approaches the guardian's head, he contemplates the Elite Lick's black lightning and its potential use against a Dullahan, recognizing its lethal capability. The Elite Lick laughs and launches an attack, but he skillfully evades. Observing the barrier around the sarcophagus, he considers that a mere Class III barrier will shatter upon impact and proceeds to break it. A notification follows, indicating that the level 5 magic barrier has been destroyed. He engages the Guardian, swiftly defeating it, and contemplates the situation. Observing that Teresa is nearing completion, he refers to the remaining Elite Lick as a bonehead and proceeds to attack, cleaving it into two pieces. Chin Yusung places his feet on a skeleton head, breaking it, and declares that he has finally found Kang Jin Hayuk. Asserting that there's only one person capable of predicting monster movements and anticipating Kang Jin Hayuk's presence, he notes it's been a while and points his dagger towards Kang Jin Hayuk. Kang Jin Hayuk looks at him as Chin Yusung affirms that Kang Jin Hayuk does remember him. Irritated, Kang Jin Hayuk denies recognition, prompting Chin Yusung to state that he doesn't recognize him. Kang Jin Hayuk activates his Eye of Truth and receives a notification that the stat effect has disregarded the level difference, allowing him to access the target's S-Tat window. He examines the status screen, revealing Chin Yusung's details. Chin Yusung is a 28-year-old male with a level of 29, strength of 35, dexterity of 31, health of 18, and magic of 10. His innate ability is the Song of the Sword, and his skills include level 6 Soul Chaser Sword Kai, level 5 Single Combat, level 5 Set Up the Battlefield, and level 4 Soul Chaser Sword Arts. The condition to copy Chen Yusung's skill involves stabbing him with the sword in which he is most confident. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on the sword, recognizing it as the iron sword with Kai and Long engraved on it that went missing from the museum. He contemplates that if he took the sword, it means that when he played the Tower of Trials as a game, he had lost to Chen Yusung once. He recognizes Chen Yusung as a player who would challenge him to a duel, whether he was injured or not, wherever and whenever, a Muram warrior fanatic. The memories flash back, and he recalls the Psycho Stalker. Chen Yusung becomes angry, questioning how he dares not to recognize him just because the game has become a reality, asking if that's all he sees him as. Kang Jin Hayek admits he remembers, expressing hope that it wasn't him at the museum. He labels him as the person who kept following him, asking for a duel despite repeated losses. 
he insists it will be different and points his sword towards him. Kang Jin Hayek states that as things have started over from the beginning, he won't be pushed back by him and allows him to proceed if he wants to fight. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek questions Chen Yusung, asking if he's sure about challenging him and mentioning that his partner won't sit still and watch, glancing at Teresa. Chen Yusung reflects on Teresa, commenting on her being a saintess and deeming her an annoying companion. He declares that he won't let anyone get in his way. Kang Jin Hayek is notified that Chen Yusung has activated level 5, choosing the battlefield, and stabs his sword into the floor. Simultaneously, Kang Jin Hayek slowly removes the lid from the sarcophagus, extracting the demon soul stone, and mentions that he'll see Teresa later. Teresa calls to him, and they both disappear. In a different location, Chen Yusung remarks that there's no one to disturb them now and challenges Kang Jin Hayek to a duel once more, activating a level 5 single combat in preparation for the fight. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification stating that Chin Yusung's stats have increased by 10%. Simultaneously, he gets another message indicating that Kang Jin Hayek's opponent's stats have decreased by 10%. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on the outcome, recognizing that it is a consequence of being forced into a situation near Chin Yusung's primary skills, set up the battlefield and single combat. He contemplates that the situation has now become entirely in his favor. Then, a notification arrives, stating that he senses the situation has become overwhelmingly unfavorable, and the particular condition of the skill combined has been activated. Another message follows, explaining that as the situation has become overwhelmingly unfavorable, the conditions for the original copy will be modified accordingly, allowing him to copy the skill first and then meet the condition. During the battle, Kang Jin Hayek announces his intention to copy Chen Yusung's innate ability. Subsequently, a notification appears, confirming that he has successfully copied the skill song of the Swordess. Kang Jin Hayek then examines the details of this newfound ability, discovering that his understanding of bladed weapons has increased by 200%. As a result, his body naturally seeks the most efficient sword paths and his overall sensory perception becomes remarkably keen. Another notification follows, indicating that the copied skill has been saved in the world's memories. As Kang Jin Hayek faces Chen Yusung, the latter questions whether he is underestimating him again. Chen Yusung expresses urgency, saying it is not the time to relax. In response, he counterattacks with his dragger. Perplexed, Chen Yusung questions his strategy, pointing out that he specializes in mid-range combat and wonders why he is confronting him with a mere dragger. He responds that he believes his current proficiency in swordsmanship is sufficient to face Chen Yusung, expressing his enjoyment of the art. Infuriated, Chen Yusung accuses him of continued condescension. Simultaneously, Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification confirming the activation of Chen Yusung's level 6 Soul Chaser Sword Kai, prompting an attack. Kang Jin Hayek skillfully evades the assault and criticizes the excessive use of Sword Kai against a novice like him. Dismissive of being labeled a novice, Kang Jin Hayek charges at Chen Yusung, confident that his opponent's weapon will break upon blocking his sword. Anticipating the need for a countermeasure, he retrieves the Demon Soul Stone, contemplating its effectiveness against Sword Kai. Deciding to merge the Song of the Sword skill with the Demon Soul Stone, Kang Jin Hayek activates the Combine Over Rank ability. As he charges toward Chen Yusung, Kang Jin Hayek receives yet another notification, indicating the acquisition of the innate ability of Sword Cemetery SS. Curious, he examines the details of Sword Cemetery, discovering that it enhances his understanding of weapons by 500%, sharpens his body's instinct for optimal sword techniques, and plays a crucial role in obtaining the title of Sword Demon. Subsequently, Kang Jin Hayek is informed that Sword Cemetery has been activated, accompanied by Level 1 Knight of the Black Moon. Reflecting on the newfound power, Kang Jin Hayek acknowledges that the current manifestation is a mere fraction of its potential. However, he recognizes his current limitation in magic power, realizing the imperative need to enhance this aspect of his abilities promptly. After a brief moment, Chen Yusung gazes at Kang Jin Hayek, contemplating the situation. 
He finds it perplexing that the battlefield is perfectly tailored to his advantage, considering his specialization in mid-range combat. In theory, everything should align in his favor, both in the game and beyond. Frustrated and agitated, Chen Yusung questions why he can't surpass his opponent despite putting in exhaustive efforts to conquer this challenge. His irritation intensifies, leading to a scream as he continues his relentless assault, determined to understand and overcome this perceived evil. In response, Kang Jin Hayek, also in motion, charges towards Chen Yusung, ready for the confrontation. Chen Yusung queries about breaking through the Sword Kai, to which Kang Jin Hayek attributes his success to the weariness of battling someone solely focused on rapid strength enhancement. With a swift maneuver, Kang Jin Hayek blocks Chen Yusung's attack, disarming him and causing him to kneel. Seated on his knees, Chen Yusung concedes defeat, acknowledging Kang Jin Hayek's superiority in their ongoing encounters. Despite the numerous victories, Kang Jin Hayek casually remarks that he's lost count of their bouts. Chen Yusung states it's the 138th time and urges Kang Jin Hayek to kill him. In response, Kang Jin Hayek casually remarks that the next encounter will likely be the 139th time. He acknowledges the harsh nature of the Tower of Trials, emphasizing the need for numerous strong players, particularly individuals like Chen Yusung. Offering a helping hand, Kang Jin Hayek assists Chen Yusung in standing up. While doing so, he contemplates the 60-day waiting period to copy a skill from the same target, realizing there's no reason for him to evade opportunities to acquire skills, primarily when someone like Chin Yusung can readily provide them. As Kang Jin Hayek extends his hand, a notification appears, indicating the activation of Level 1 Communion. Chen Yusung walks away, conceding defeat this time, but issuing a warning that the outcome will be entirely different in their subsequent encounter. Kang Jin Hayek casually agrees, expressing his readiness, and is notified that set up the battlefield has been deactivated. He realizes he doesn't know Chen Yusung's real name, so he brings up the topic. Chen Yusung notes they aren't close enough to use real names, and Kang Jin Hayek suggests sticking to their original nicknames. Internally, he panics at the thought of what his original nickname might be, hoping it isn't something embarrassing. Chen Yusung playfully reveals the nickname Poop Biboon Biboon, causing Kang Jin Hayek to react with irritation. The scene shifts to Song Chunhua and his team, where the covered man asks Song Chunhua if the monsters up front have already been dealt with. He questions what he is talking about and the man explains that his detection magic is currently reacting to magic. However, he is sure that the monsters were all dealt with, so there shouldn't be any reaction. He checks his status screen and realizes that it's coming their way. They all see a giant monster and exclaim, that's an iron golem. Song Chunhua interrupts, saying, wait a second, look above, someone's on top of it. He observes and remarks that the figure appears to be a high-ranking vampire as the individual descends from the Iron Golem. He bows down in front of them, extending a welcome and introducing himself as Velus, a blood kin in service to Jinzo, the master of these ruins. Song Chunhua questions his goal, placing a sword at his neck and asserting that he wouldn't have approached them alone without reason. Meanwhile, Velus responds, indicating that, from the looks of it, he is acting as the leader and comes to present a proposal. He inquires about the proposal, and Velus explains that he will give them a choice. He asks if they will all quietly come with him, placing his finger on his sword and cutting it, causing himself to bleed. He receives a notification that the unknown level Bloodfist has been activated. One of his team members starts crying stating that their bodies are melting and pleading for help while he observes them. Velus suggests that half of them become his appetizer while the others are dragged along, disappearing due to his magical power. After a while, Teresa approaches Kang Jin Hayuk as he sits on the floor. She is notified that level 5 divine purification has been activated and a frozen tear appears. Kang Jin Hayek checks the details of the frozen tears, noting that magic power will significantly increase once absorbed. However, the user will receive fatal damage if it is not purified beforehand. His magic has risen by 12. Reflecting on the frozen tear picked up with the demon soul stone, 
he can't believe he could obtain it, considering it is usually quite challenging to acquire. With the help of Teresa's divine power, his stat has already reached 12. She inquires if Kang Jin Hayek is finished. He responds affirmatively, expressing satisfaction with this much. She receives a notification that the master of the Cloister of the Fallen has sent her an invitation. If she wishes to rescue the assault team, she should come to the innermost room, and the reward is the opportunity to meet the master of the Cloister of the Fallen. Another notification informs her that if she accepts this quest, all monsters and traps leading up to the last room will be halted. She states that she believes the people of the assault team were kidnapped and finds it difficult to accept that they have become hostages. She declares that she needs to go, asserting there's no reason for her to hesitate, even if it only saves one person. Bowing down before him, she asks if she can win against Jinzo in this state. She contemplates what will happen if she becomes nothing but his plaything, as he desires. She expresses her inability to imagine a fight against Jinzo without the support of the assault team and wonders if the result would have been different if she had been with the team. She wants to protect more people as a paladin and questions if he made the wrong decision. Chen Yusung also bows down in front of him and states that since he has nothing to do with that team, he'll leave first. He suggests that she should listen to his advice if she is having difficulty deciding. Looking at Kang Jin Hayek, he comments that the guy doesn't have a lick of honor and is a selfish human, which is one of the reasons why he keeps challenging him. He acknowledges that he does know one thing for sure. The only person who can defeat Jinzo right now in this world is the one who looks like he spoke too much, referring to Kang Jin Hayek. She smiles and expresses gratitude for the advice as he walks away. She approaches Kang Jin Hayek and wants to commission him for a party contract. He responds that his contract fee won't be cheap and asks if she is still sure. She asserts that she'll give him as many coins as possible to help her fight Jinzo. He thinks she's still determined to fight and agrees, saying, all right, let's try it. He is notified that he has accepted the quest and the monsters have fallen asleep. They reach the gate of Jinzo's ruins, and she reflects on the unbelievable amount of magic energy emitted. Kang Jin Hayek reassures her not to be scared and reminds her that the opponent is strong. She acknowledges that it's true, but wonders about their approach to the fight. He explains that fighting isn't always about the strong winning all the time. When she asks if he has a plan, he replies that there is one. Whatever happens inside, she must trust him. The door opens. Meanwhile, as they enter, Jinzo Alice von Adorexia notices them and remarks that she has finally arrived, expressing her impatience with the wait. Kang Jin Hayek inquires about the safety of the people, and she, pointing upward with her finger, instructs him to take a look for himself. He receives a notification that the dimension break of an unknown level has been deactivated and observes everyone tied up and blindfolded. Upon seeing Park Hajin, he suspects that it was that person who awakened the Guardians. Jinzo explains that she invited him because of the scent he emits. Perplexed, he asks about the smell, to which she responds affirmatively, stating that it is the sweetest scent she has ever encountered the smell of his blood. She expresses her liking for the unique and incomparable fragrance, explaining that it arouses her. He wonders why she is suddenly discussing his sweet blood, as this has never happened before. She observes that it seems she has upset him considerably. He responds, stating that, naturally, anyone would be disturbed when a vampire is targeting their blood, and he questions who wouldn't feel uneasy in such a situation. She reassures him, saying not to worry, as she is the type to savor things she enjoys, and she will permit him to live for at least 60 years, so there is no need for him to be so scared. He reflects on the situation, thinking that it doesn't mean he has to stick by her side for his entire life with a straw sucking on his neck. He expresses gratitude for the goodwill, but asserts that he has no intention of living like a fancy lunchbox. However, she attacks him claiming that no one asked for his opinion and that he has no say in the matter. Teresa inquires if Kang Jin Hayek is all right, and he confirms this as he bows down in front of Jinzo, acknowledging her fierceness. However, he clarifies that he is not refusing to give her anything and promises to provide something sweeter than his blood. 
Teresa questions what he is doing, while Jinzo asks what could be more precious than his blood. She dismisses his subterfuge as pointless, asserting that nothing is more important to them than delicious blood, and whatever he has to offer will not change her mind. He questions her certainty, even if his offer is freedom. Jinzo asks about freedom, leading the vampires to express outrage, declaring that he dares not mention that word there, and one of them threatens to rip him apart, but she intervenes, preventing the attack. She insists that he must take responsibility for what he just said. He responds that if he couldn't take responsibility, he wouldn't have come here in the first place. She insists that he should then take responsibility, and he discloses his name as Kang Jin Hayuk, identifying himself as the representative of the demonic humans in the tower. He puts on a mask, declaring that he will free her from this place. Reflecting on those who have rejected humanity due to reasons such as money, revenge, or personal beliefs, he notes that these individuals are known as demonic humans, and the demonic humans have obstructed players from climbing the tower, and at times, they have even collaborated with the monsters of labyrinths or ruins. Jinzo mentions that she has heard of those people, but he claims to be one of them. He responds by stating that he has already been in contact with the temple on the 27th floor, and the information about her presence and how to deceive the barrier surrounding the ruin is what they have shared with him. Teresa gazes at him, pondering how exactly the situation is unfolding. He has suddenly taken on the guise of a demonic human, and she wonders about the significance of the temple that has caused such a reaction. Jinzo acknowledges that if he knows about the temple, her words are likely not mere bluffs. He then asks if she will trust him. Jinzo however dismisses the idea, asserting that it doesn't matter whether he is demonic or not. She argues that anyone can claim they can resolve what no one has been able to for a long time, and besides, he is too much of a smooth talker. She declares that she doesn't trust him. As she receives a notification that the unknown level blood spears has been activated, she comments on his sweet-smelling blood, expressing regret. She then orders him to die and hurls all the spears toward him. Teresa swiftly positions herself in front of him, activating level 5 sacred reinforcement to form a shield that successfully blocks all the spears. She instructs him to stay behind her and assures him that she will withstand as much as she can with divine power, activating a level 5 sacred shield. Jinzo, amused, comments on how she is going all out against only this much. He mentions his dislike for divine power, finding it nauseating. Suddenly, the unknown level blood explosion is activated, and he declares that he will send them flying all at once, throwing a blood explosion towards them. Teresa observes the situation and wonders how long she can last against Jinzo. However, she decides to trust Kang Jin Hayuk, who is behind her, just as he stabs her from behind. He proposes to Jinzo that if he can prove it's not just a bluff, will she then trust him? She looks at him and finds it amusing, remarking on how he betrayed his comrade who protected him. She challenges him to prove it further. Teresa seizes his feet reminding him that they had agreed to save the attack force together and questions if this was his plan. He responds by stabbing her again, ultimately killing her. Jinzo, impressed by the human's actions, acknowledges it and states that she understands he is on his side. She grants him a chance to speak. Bowing down, he explains his plan to deceive the barrier, trapping Alice. He has prepared a seven-star spell, Braham's Ring, and if he seals Alice's soul in this item, the barrier can be temporarily fooled. She inquires about how to seal her soul, as this is the first time she has heard of it. Reflecting on the situation, he thinks that this is the reason why he maintained his level 1 status, giving up on all the experience he could have gained since the start of the Tower of Trials. He notes that the 7-star skill soul transfer can't be used unless he's at level 1. Meanwhile, he receives a notification that the level condition level 1 of the user Kang Jin Hayek has been fulfilled, and the casting of the 7-star soul transfer will be activated. Another notification follows, indicating that the casting cooldown time is 365 days, and he can only bring one soul with him at a time. The spell will be completed once he receives the subject's consent. 
He explains that the magic circle will disappear forever after one minute passes. He informs her that the magic will activate right away once she accepts, leaving the choice up to her. Velus expresses surprise at the unexpected use of the spell. She addresses Velus, expressing her lack of complete trust in him, and instructs him to kill Kang Jin Hayak and destroy the magic circle if anything strange happens. He agrees, and she reflects on the protective measures in place, but still feels disinclined to consent to a spell she has never seen before. However, she acknowledges that she has been confined there for far too long. She walks toward Kang Jin Hayuk, reflecting on the fact that it's been well over a thousand years since she has been exiled here. She realizes that if it's not now, she may never be able to escape from this underground palace. She enters the magical circle and states that she will ask him for the last time if she can trust him. He responds by saying that if she gives him the honor, he will not let her regret it. He receives a notification that he has activated level 1 commune, and the subject feels a slightly favorable impression towards her. She, Alice von Adorexia, grants permission for the soul transfer, and another notification follows, indicating that Braham's ring will absorb the soul of the progenitor Alice. She expresses that it's not as bad as she expected, and finds the experience unexpectedly cozy as she goes inside the ring. He picks up the call, expressing relief and stating that she likes her new home. She questions the term new home, and he receives a notification that the unique ability blessing of the star has been activated. He removes his mask and welcomes her back, receiving another notification about blessing of the star, specifying that he can revive once as long as the death is not instant, and its cooldown time is 240 hours. Teresa gets up. Kang Jin Hayek warmly welcomes Teresa back, while Alice, speaking through Braham's ring, accuses him of ingratitude and disrespect. She insists that Velus kill the alleged dirty liar, and he places the ring in his pocket. Alice reiterates her command for Velus to eliminate this perceived traitor. Teresa interjects, expressing that she has many questions but suggests saving them for another time. He agrees, emphasizing that they are not yet out of danger. Velus dismissively refers to them as foolish humans and launches an attack, asserting that they cannot expect to leave alive after betraying their master. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that level 13 Blood Wave has been activated and counters by activating level 5 elements of fire to fend off the attack. He instructs Teresa to reach the hostages and save them, and she agrees, running towards them. Another notification follows, indicating that Teresa has activated the level 4 sign of the cross. She proceeds to untie the hostages, and Song Chunua expresses gratitude, mentioning that she came for them. Teresa reassures her, stating that she is relieved she was not too late. Kang Jin Hayuk inquires about the vampires, seeking information about their whereabouts. Velus asserts that he will take them on by himself and questions how a mere human like Kang Jin Hayek can confront his magic. Kang Jin Hayek responds, explaining that his magic and his fire are complete opposites, and Velus also misunderstands something. The moment his master was sealed inside the ring, he was already lost. He receives a notification that his unique ability, Grave of Swords, has been activated, and Velus has activated level 9 Dark Fighting Spirits. Velus dismisses Kang Jin Hayek's explanation, insisting that if his magic doesn't work, he'll kill him with his sword. He declares his intention to destroy the ring and free their master, prompting all the vampires to run and attack him. Observing the situation, Song Chunhua questions Teresa about Kang Jin Hayuk, expressing confusion about his identity. She speculates that if he's wearing a mask, he probably does not want his identity to be revealed. Meanwhile, Teresa replies that she just happened to meet Kang Jin Hayuk on her way there, and she doesn't know the details either. She expresses the pain of dying for the first time and mentions that it was by his ally's hands. Kang Jin Hayuk successfully defeats all vampires and approaches her. He notes that despite the difficulties, they succeeded. Teresa confirms their success and expresses gratitude, thanking him for ensuring everyone's survival. Kang Jin Hayuk receives a notification that he has saved Teresa's life, the holder of the unique ability Blessing of the Star. 
He has fulfilled the conditions and succeeded in copying the unique ability of Blessing of the Star. Another notification follows, indicating that the copied skill will be saved in the memory of the world. He also receives another notification about Blessing of the Star, specifying that it can wield divine power and allow the user to return from the threshold of death with a cooldown time of 240 hours. She becomes emotional, and he inquires why she is crying. She responds that she doesn't know, she can't help it. He reminds her that she was able to revive. He comments that regardless, he is glad she is still alive and asks if she wants to die. He suggests taking the divine artifacts and leaving, and upon removing the curtain, he discovers the artifacts. Song Chunhua intervenes, stating that he is the captain of the attack force and that all the items found in this raid belong to the ownership of the Balhi Guild. Kang Jin Haya questions this, mentioning that he saved Song Chunhua's life, and now he's being asked to forfeit the rewards from the ruin as well. Song Chunhua clarifies that he is not suggesting that, and they will provide him with another form of reward, and they promise to give him enough money or coins to ensure his satisfaction. Kang Jin Hayuk contemplates the audacity of the failed attack force captain and states that if he truly wants it so much, then he should take it. He asks if he really means that, and Kang Jin Hayuk agrees, emphasizing that regardless of the outcome, he should not regret the decision. As Kang Jin Hayuk observes the fragment of Merlin's staff material, he thinks about the majority of the attack force being captured as hostages. He believes that they can redeem themselves as long as they obtain the divine artifacts of the ruin. Attempting to retrieve it, he burns his hand and examines the wound, questioning what it is. In response, Kang Jin Hayuk reflects that it's a curse and considers Merlin's staff as a suitable combination material with an irritating curse embedded in it. He concludes that the only way to obtain this divine artifact safely is by killing Alice. However, he contemplates that Alice is alive in his ring, while Song Chunhua, noticing his hair falling, inquires about what's happening. Teresa looks at him, but Kang Jin Hayek takes her away while she questions what is going on. The scene shifts to Seoul, at the entrance of the Tower of Trials, where Awakened Association affiliate deputy Yong Yi Hyun expresses skepticism. He asks the department head if they are sure they haven't received false information and if what the man said is really true. The Awakened Association affiliate department head, Kim Tichun, responds that he told her they should wait and see, advising her to stop complaining as he lights up his cigarette. He suggests they should at least try to do something with the information they have. She points out that the experts mentioned it would take at least three weeks. Reflecting on the situation, he admits to being a bit concerned as he wasn't a member of the Balhi Guild. However, he has a strong feeling about this, recalling someone from that guild stating that the ruin subjugation will end soon. Meanwhile, he receives a notification that the ruin of the Hall of the Depraved has been cleared. He exclaims that they have come out and acknowledges the Balhi Guild, congratulating them for clearing the first floor ruin. A news reporter asks if they may inquire about how they cleared the ruin and who the MVP of this raid is. Upon seeing Song Chunhua, the reporter observes that the attack force captain not only lost his hair but also his eyebrows and eyelashes. Another reporter comments on the desperation evident in the ruins, noting how solemn it must have been, and asks what exactly happened inside. Teresa interjects, stating that it was not Song Chunhua who cleared the ruin. The reporter identifies Teresa as the Saintess of Amsterdam and inquires if the Zion Guild cleared it. She clarifies that it was not the Zion Guild. Instead, this man alone cleared the ruin, and they were nothing more than spectators at his stage performance. Yong Yi Hyun suggests contacting the association immediately, to which Kim Ti Chun agrees, considering it a good idea. He acknowledges that they managed to survive and if it weren't for that masked player, they would be in a dire situation. He suggests they go home. Kang Jin Hayek sits in his house and reads comments from people wanting to know who the masked man is. He reflects that they added all kinds of words for decoration while he had breakfast. He anticipated a heated reaction, but this exceeded his expectations. He's grateful he wore a mask, and Teresa, who knows his identity, promised to keep his secret so there's no need to worry. 
With this, he believes the problem is solved, and he contemplates having a talk with a progenitor with a chip on her shoulder. Taking out Braham's ring, Alice protests about being stuffed in his dark and smelly pocket for a whole day, questioning if he doesn't know who she is. He laughs, and she asks what he is planning to do. He waves the ring in the air, and she shouts for him to stop as she's getting dizzy. He responds by asking if she feels better now. She asks if he would feel better if he were her and instructs him to listen carefully, noting that vampires never forget a grudge. He inquires if she's serious and she tells him to relax his expression. He remarks that for someone who still doesn't know her place, he'll give her a fitting punishment. She pleads with him to stop, saying she's going to puke, and he waves the ring again, activating the vampire grudge separator. The scene shifts three hours later, and he takes out the ring again. She begs him to stop, claiming she's really going to die. He tells her to stop crying and come out, proceeding to perform some magic. He receives a notification that he has injected magic power into Braham's ring and takes out Alice. She declares that it's finally time to take her revenge and promises to return the humiliation she suffered a thousandfold. However, upon appearing, she expresses surprise at her childlike shape. He explains that he materialized a portion of her in a sealed state. Meanwhile, she inquires about what a portion is. He responds affirmatively, stating that she could call herself a mini version of Alice and won't be able to manifest even 1% of her true power. He reflects that even with this restriction, she is still much stronger than an ordinary vampire. He tells her to stop crying, urging her to listen, and reminds her that what he told her at the ruin wasn't empty words. She cries out, expressing her reluctance for this kind of freedom. He acknowledges her feelings and clarifies that this freedom is what she truly desires and he'll help her gain it. She asks what he means, and he responds that if Alice von Adorexia helps him, he will eliminate everyone who betrayed her and assist her in regaining the Adorexia family's lost head position. He receives a message indicating that a new video has been uploaded to the Hall of Fame. Reflecting on the raid that everyone thought was destined to fail, he notes that the situation was completely turned on its head after the appearance of the masked player. As he reads numerous comments, he comes across remarks about guilds sitting on a pile of money, which appears to be accurate as he looks at a massive building while holding his mask. He dismisses the issue of whether a large guild is monopolizing everything or is corrupt, but he is determined not to let them get away with trying to kill him. Entering the building, he observes a multitude of people and decides that he will completely destroy both them and the building's top floor activating his fire element. Shin Jin Su, the Black Crow Guild leader, notices him and hurls abuse, while Park Hajin criticizes him for messing up the discreet killing in the ruin and daring to return. Shin Jin Su complains that all they did was wake the Guardians and create a complete mess. He laments that their guild's reputation is being dragged through the mud and is on the brink of disappearing, all because they can't teach one person a lesson for humiliating them. Frustrated, he kicks Park Hajin away. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek attacks all the guards, eliminating them, and proceeds forward. He then addresses Shin Jin Su, inquiring if he is the guild leader of this place. Shin Jin Su responds angrily, ordering someone to get Kang Jin Hayek. Observing the situation, Park Hajin sees this as the perfect opportunity to regain his standing in front of Kang Jin Hayek. Determined to revert to the super rookie Park Hajin of the past, he runs to attack Kang Jin Hayuk. Kang Jin Hayuk removes his mask and confronts Shin Jin Su, asking him what's up. Shin Jin Su is shocked to see him, backs off and falls down. He exclaims that it's him, the one who humiliated them at the association, and questions if Kang Jin Hayuk thinks he'll be safe after doing something like this. Kang Jin Hayek calmly sits down in front of him, stating that it's not something Shin Jin Su should be concerned about. Despite Shin Jin Su grabbing his sword, Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that Shin Jin Su has activated the level 5 quick sword. Undeterred, Kang Jin Hayek runs to attack him, thinking that he's not even paying attention to Shin Jin Su's quick sword, which is faster than the speed of sound. He believes that Shin Jin Su should die and proceeds with his attack. 
However, Kang Jin Hayek stops the attack using a go piece and breaks Shin Jin Su's sword. Confused, Shin Jin Su questions how he did this with a go piece. Kang Jin Hayek replies that he had something perfect for him to throw. Now he suggests they resume their discussion, Shin Jin Su. Shin Jin Su questions Kang Jin Hayek, asking if he is here to take revenge because he tried to instigate his death. He observes his dead guild members and declares that just for that, he is destroying the entire building. Kang Jin Hayek hits him again with a go piece, throwing him away, and comments that his words are pretty inappropriate. He asserts that it's just for that reason, and Shin Jin Su has done enough. He should stop already. Shin Jin Su asks again if Kang Jin Hayek is suggesting that he should keep it moderate. Kang Jin Hayek replies, advising him to think about it calmly. He points out that they have over 50 rankers who aren't present because they are clearing the tower. Kang Jin Hayek emphasizes that if Shin Jin Su kills him, they will chase him to the ends of the earth to kill him, asking if he understands what that means. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on the cycle of revenge, realizing that blood calls for blood and revenge breeds revenge. As long as one side doesn't forgive, the killing will never stop. Shin Jin Su questions Kang Jin Hayek, asking if he is here to take revenge because he tried to instigate his death. He observes his dead guild members and declares that just for that, he is destroying the entire building. Kang Jin Hayek hits him again with a go piece, throwing him away, and comments that his words are pretty inappropriate. He asserts that it's just for that reason, and Shin Jin Su has done enough. He should stop already. Shin Jin Su asks again if Kang Jin Hayek is suggesting that he should keep it moderate. Kang Jin Hayek replies, advising him to think about it calmly. He points out that they have over 50 rankers who aren't present because they are clearing the tower. Kang Jin Hayek emphasizes that if Shin Jin Su kills him, they will chase him to the ends of the earth to kill him, asking if he understands what that means. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on the cycle of revenge, realizing that blood calls for blood and revenge breeds revenge. As long as one side doesn't forgive, the killing will never stop. After a while, Kim Hee Wong introduces himself, stating that he is 26 years old and was in charge of managing the general businesses of the Black Crow Guild. He adds that he majored in computer science and accounting at Stanford, emphasizing that they can leave anything to him. Kang Jin Hayek expresses his admiration, acknowledging that the situation is not very good. Kim Hee Wong agrees, stating that it's also a waste to destroy one of the leading guilds. Consequently, he proposes leaving the management of the guild to him. Kang Jin Hayek agrees, noting that it's nothing too grand and he'll just be maintaining the outer appearance. However, Kang Jin Hayek points out that even if he serves as the guild master, no one will follow him. Kim Hee Wong concedes that it's true, recognizing that there's bound to be opposition if a non-combatant, especially a secretary, rises to the top position all of a sudden. He reflects on how Kim Hee Wong feels like a king while viewing others as his servants. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek reassures Kim Hee Wong, stating that he doesn't have to worry about the people who oppose it. He then asks if Kim Hee Wong will be taking care of them. Kim Hee Wong replies negatively questioning why he would do something so bothersome. He adds that he'll let Kang Jin Hayek borrow someone else, urging him not to worry as he shows him Braham's ring. On the other side, Kim Tichun receives some messages and expresses frustration, exclaiming that an emergency gathering is too much when they're busy with a raid. He mentions being in the middle of a raid and acknowledges they have no choice but to follow orders, but he finds it to be too much. Upon reaching the Black Crow Guild building, he observes that they are a rank players. Annoyed, he mutters, God damn it, this is so annoying and questions why there are so many people under the building. He instructs them to step aside and queries what they are doing in front of someone else's building. As he looks around, he notices Shin Jin Su in a car. He observes the situation, thinking that the guild master is dead and wondering who sent the emergency gathering order. Upon entering, he finds Kim Hee Wong as the leader and questions why he is sitting there. He attempts to attack him, but he escapes from the attack. Closing in quickly, he demands that he tell him everything that happened without leaving out a single detail. 
Kim Hee Wong responds by mentioning that new consignees have arrived. Intrigued, he inquires about the identity of the new consignees. Alice, feeling bothered, exhales and comments that she instructed him to make it so that she doesn't have to step in. This infuriates Kim Ti Chun even more, and he expresses disbelief, asking if he is seriously telling him that this child is the one who caused all this. Offended, Alice questions if he just called her a child and caused an explosion. Kang Jin Hayek stands outside the building, witnessing the chaos as people comment on something exploding and mention that's where that person fell. He taps his head and expresses frustration, stating that he asked Alice to take care of the guild, but she went and did that. Meanwhile, he receives a message requesting Kang Jin Hayek to report the result of his awakening test. Reflecting on the situation, he notes that it's been around two months since the Tower of Trials appeared and the world order is changing drastically. People are quickly adapting to the new world at a matching pace. Considering the media coverage, he thinks that the news is broadcasting a unique program about the masked player. This drew a lot of attention because a ruin that even a large attack force couldn't clear was now cleared by a single person. He reflects that only two people know that he, who entered as a porter, is the masked player. Mr. Kim, the porter leader who joyfully accepted his request to keep it a secret, and Teresa, who also promised to keep his secret. He contemplates the version of himself who wears a mask, and the version who does not. With this realization, he believes he will be able to act much more quickly. Upon reaching the Awakened Association building, he reflects that all the conditions have been fulfilled and there are no more restraints binding him. He concludes that now, it's truly time for him to monopolize everything. Kang Jin Hayek is presented with a certificate indicating that he is an F-rank individual. Upon inspection, he finds the certificate to be more ordinary than he had anticipated. Lee Timon and Yu Yonoa notice him and enthusiastically call out to him. He turns to them and inquires about their well-being. She responds that they have been doing well, and Lee Timon adds that they have also leveled up significantly. She points to other individuals, mentioning that they claimed to know him and were conversing. Kang Jin Hayuk intends to introduce them, gesturing towards Alice, identifying her as a player from Northern Europe. He thinks that chaos would ensue if her status as a progenitor were revealed. He introduces Kim Hee Wong as the new manager of the Black Crow Guild, responsible for tasks such as dungeon scouting. Kim Hee Wong states that if they are acquaintances of Representative Kang Jin Hyuk, he will assist them to the best of his ability. He reflects on the unexpected turn of events, realizing that there would come a time when he would be officially introduced. Meanwhile, he considers this a reward compared to when he worked under that bastard Shin Jin Su. Kang Jin Hayek states it's okay to ask him for favors whenever he needs them, while Lee Timon inquires if he is the Black Crow Guild Master. Kang Jin Hayek responds that although he holds the title of master, the true master is Kim Hee Woon, whom he indicates. Lee Timon expresses amazement, and Yu Yonoa suggests that they should get along even better from now on. Kang Jin Hayek calls out to Alice, expressing his irritation. She retorts that it's their fault for irritating him and insists that she hadn't planned to go that far. Kang Jin Hayek questions how she could blow up the building just for being called a child, asking if she can't endure provocations like that after having lived for thousands of years. He looks away and remarks that there hasn't been anyone who provoked him in that manner. After a while, he says all right, follow him, and let's go hunting. She asks if he can't hunt on his own, to which he replies that he will be chasing a horde, so he needs a supporter. She asks what a flock is and questions if any hunting grounds are left. He thinks the guilds regulate the cream of the crop dungeons as long as the third floor boss isn't defeated and the fourth floor isn't open. There aren't any unknown hunting grounds, or so everyone thinks, excluding him. He arrives at the Tower of Trials on the first floor at Moon Lake, looks around, and feels it's a place famous for having the most beautiful scenery in the Tower of Trials. Ironically, there's no longer anyone who visits this place. He reflects that it's been a long while since he has been here, and thinks that they have no time to enjoy themselves when facing the extinction of humankind. 
Alice comments that it's quite an elegant place and wonders how he will hunt here. He replies wait and see and walks forward. She asks if he's going into the lake and questions whether water won't fill his pants. He thinks that twelve statues are occupying Tranquil Moon Lake, and among them, this particular statue has another objective aside from inhabiting the lake. She asks if this statue has some secret button, and he replies that everyone would have already found it if it were that obvious. Hundreds of players must have seen this groove on the statue, and it was enough to be brought up in the community. However, he thinks no one has ever successfully discovered the key that fits this groove, and he concludes that it's no wonder since the key for this isn't just some piece of metal, it's moonlight. He thinks of using his palm to regulate the amount and angle at which the moonlight enters the groove, matching it with the sequence engraved on the sequence stone inside the groove. After much effort and carefully opening it, he says the door leading underground opens and declares let's go. He receives a notification that he has entered the lower ground first floor of the Tower of Trials. She looks around and remarks on such a space in the Tower of Trials. She thinks this feeling is genuinely reminiscent and reflects on the sense of freedom she had forgotten, touching the water. He asks her how it is and if she's glad she contracted with him. She replies well, it looks like he wasn't talking entirely out of his ass. He receives a notification that he has used the blessing of the star to manifest divine power and the second defrosting of the frozen tears will begin. He receives another notification that mana has increased by 18, and it will be available again after 24 hours, with the remaining absorption amount being 70. He thinks that it's become much easier to retain Alice after absorbing the frozen tear again. Now that he thinks about it, he wonders what the beings in the tower think of players. He speculates that they know it's a game turned into reality, but wonders if Alice, who has lived for thousands of years, thinks that she's part of the data within the same. He expresses a desire to ask her something. She asks what it is, and he poses a question, but it's not clear. He thinks it's like that. She asks what he is saying and mentions that he scared her. He reflects that information about the tower is being completely blocked, but the fact that he found out that he can't talk about it to the beings within the tower is enough. Meanwhile, she looks behind him and says something's coming. He also looks in that direction, activates his fire element, and thinks of the lower ground, the Tower of Trials' first floor, as a spawning ground. He believes this is because monsters endlessly crawl out of the abyss. As he observes a giant crab monster emerging, he quickly puts the fire element on the floor. Kang Jin Hayuk is notified that the giant beetle scarab is at level 25. Alice sees this and expresses her disgust. He instructs her to get back, and she flies away. Seeing many beetles approaching from all sides, he activates the unique ability Blessing of the Star and attacks the beetles. He receives another notification that the monster's physical defenses have decreased 30%. He tells Alice to show him what she's made of. She asks what he means, questioning how he dares to say this noble one to face those disgusting insects. He asks what's noble while rotating a ring chain in his hand. She becomes scared and says all right, she'll do it. He receives a notification that she has activated the unknown level blood bind and attacks the beetles, successfully killing them. He replies perfectly to her attack and receives another message that the rift stat will be applied. The rift stat possessed 100 reduces the level gap by 33 levels, and he gets a notification that he has leveled up. Meanwhile, he says he was sick of holding himself back all this time, and it looks like he was pretty stressed out from maintaining his level 1 status, so he'll be counting on them. He receives another notification that he has activated the unique ability Grave of Swords and instructs them not to stop coming at him. The scene shifts to the Olympus Guild conference room, where Titan Guild representative Patrick, seeing that most of them have gathered, suggests they begin. He acknowledges that the eighth raid to climb to the fourth floor has failed, stating that only nine of the fifteen attack forces consisting of a hundred people have returned. He notes that while the third floor boss is nothing but ordinary, they need a way to defeat the one lakh statues he commands. 
Junghua Guild representative Ten Y expresses anger, slamming his hand on the table, and says damn it, even with a divine artifact with the response force ability, they still failed and asks how they are going to get through that considerable mass. Olympus Guild representative Maria adds that the second and third floor raids were completed too quickly, and the players did not have enough time to grow. She suggests that if only they had enough players over level 15. Dengun Guild's third raid captain, Beak Jinho, remarks indeed, aren't they in this mess because of guilds like Junghua that regulate the dungeons to monopolize the magic crystals? Ten Y responds that he can't overlook that statement, and Beak Jinho replies that he didn't say anything wrong. Ten Y insists that all they did was climb the tower for humanity, and he will not stand for humiliation without any evidence. Beak Jinho retorts anyone can spout shitty excuses like those. Patrick intervenes, telling them to stop the bickering as it's not the time for it. They have gathered to solve the problem in front of them. Maria inquires if he has thought of something. Patrick responds that yesterday before daybreak, they received word from the demonic humans, and they said they would help them if they heeded one of their conditions. They ask if he suggests they join forces with them, stating that those individuals are globally wanted criminals. Patrick firmly refuses to work with those vulgar individuals. Teresa thinks everyone is disgusted by the idea of working with daimonic humans and realizes that in the current state of the world, the influence of large guilds surpasses that of the government. Increased force makes a just and great cause more important than ever. Therefore, she believes they must be wary of what they say and do. Patrick questions what he means by calling them trash, asserting that it's good to be prideful. Meanwhile, Sir Kedrick appears from the room's fire heater and asks if they already know they can't do anything with their strengths alone. Beak Jinho, angered, calls him demonic trash, rushes to attack him, and declares that since he showed himself, he'll kill him. He throws the table away and Ten Y cuts it into pieces, stating that they finally agree. Sir Kedrick remarks that they are all quite hot-blooded. However, he suggests they might change their minds after hearing his proposal and asks them to join forces with them. Meanwhile, he adds that they have the power to defeat the third floor's boss. Beak Jinho counters, stating that the Daimonic Human Association doesn't even have a hundred people, and questions how they could penetrate that army. Julius Cedric responds that they need quantity, placing his magic stick on the floor in anger, and receives a notification that the unique ability Gravekeeper of the Black Tomb has been activated. Many skeletons appear, and he notes that thanks to the long history of wars, many useful corpses are buried around there. He mentions that among the demonic humans, many are well versed in necromancy. Patrick acknowledges that he is a necromancer, but questions if he could command a force this large with that staff. The old man asks if he recognizes this thing, describing it as the particular item that can only be produced by obtaining 99 materials, the Staff of Greed. Meanwhile, Ten Y suggests that if it's a combination of the famous Staff of Greed and a necromancer, the chances of success in the third boss raid are not non-existent. Maria questions what he is saying, stating that those are evil daimonic humans. Beak Jinho acknowledges that they know and suggests that they should rip this creep to pieces right now. However, if they ask for a condition the public will never know about, he believes it's worth a shot. Teresa comments that even Beak Jinho agrees they have no other choice. She wonders how things turned out like this and reflects that to consider joining hands with the demonic humans is madness. She thinks that if only Kang Jin Hayak were here, they wouldn't be in this situation, and she contemplates what she should do now. She receives a notification that a video call request has arrived from the outside and asks if she will accept the call request. The caller is Kang Jin Hayak. Teresa accepts the call as Kang Jin Hayak asks if she has been well, inquires if she has leveled up, and questions what's happening in the situation. She looks at Julius Cedric, while he also listens to Kang Jin Hayak's voice. She asks who he is and why he doesn't reveal himself instead of hiding behind a screen. Kang Jin Hayak decides to change the video call to a collective call. She replies as he wishes, and now they all see him. Maria asks if that person could be the unknown individual who cleared the first floor ruin. 
She considers the super rookie who single-handedly cleared the first floor ruin strangely, and thinks guilds worldwide want to recruit the super rookie. She realizes that the super rookie they were trying so hard to find has appeared in front of their eyes, and those attempting their best to get in contact with the unknown individual now swallow their spit in happiness due to his sudden appearance. Julius Cedric finds it amusing that he has heard of Kang Jin Hayek as the one who cleared the first floor ruin. He questions if Kang Jin Hayek knows this boss raid is entirely different from that place. Kang Jin Hayek asks if he is claiming that he can do it. Julius Cedric confidently replies that of course he can, given the number of summons he has, and the guild representatives are also in agreement. Kang Jin Hayek skeptically asks if he can do it with that fake staff. The old man inquires about the term fake team, and Kang Jin Hayek shows them the saint's heart and prison uniform wet with holy oil. He points out that it's obvious Julius Cedric made it with only those two materials. Patrick asks if there is any evidence. Kang Jin Hayek asserts that the actual staff of greed has a red gem embedded under the skull, and there's no way Julius Cedric could make the real one with only three floors. He also mentions the low quality of the summoned skeleton soldiers, stating that those flimsy soldiers won't even last half a day in the boss room. He remarks that it's obvious Julius Cedric is planning to abandon them all and take some coins and items in the middle of the confusion. Julius Cedric calls him arrogant. He warns that he'll regret not accepting his offer. He wonders if Kang Jin Hayek can still stay so composed when they meet in person next time and states that he'll be watching him. Julius Cedric disappears and his soldiers also vanish. Meanwhile, Patrick asks what they should do now. Kang Jin Hayek replies that they should leave it to him. He'll ensure they don't have to join hands with the demonic humans and will gain profit from clearing the tower. Patrick questions if he's saying he can do it alone. Kang Jin Hayek affirms that yes he can. Patrick thinks that even if he fails, it allows him to be recruited. Compared to joining hands with the demonic humans, he believes this has no downsides and there's no way he can miss a chance like this. Tae Wen asks Kang Jin Hayek how much he is thinking of for the down payments and rewards. Maria quickly adds that Olympus will give him all the support he needs. Patrick questions what he is talking about, asserting that Titan is most suited for providing monetary support. Beak Jin Ho comments that money may not be what Kang Jin Hayek wants, and if he needs anything, Beak Jin Ho is available. Kang Jin Hayek responds that he doesn't need them to give him anything. He requests them to block the entire area so no other hunters can enter. If they let him go in by himself, he will not take any rewards. After a while Maria asks, no one's only making them more suspicious and questions about his reason. Kang Jin Hayek replies with a reason, stating that he's just doing what needs to be done for the person he considers his precious comrade. He reflects on his own words, mentioning that Teresa is his true comrade, causing her to blush. Beak Jinho laughs and comments on how marvelous this true camaraderie is. Kang Jin Hayek acknowledges that he has nothing to say as a guild representative, and he's making himself reflect on his actions. He thinks it's a good atmosphere, and the screen is being recorded. Maria believes any average person would have received the down payment, but people like Kang Jin Hayek can't see the big picture. She believes that a player who gives up on rewards for his comrades gains something far outclasses a down payment. Since he can't antagonize the guilds, he uploads the video after editing the demonic human part a bit and ends the video call. He checks his status screen, finding he is at level 12 with strength 8, dexterity 8, stamina 8, magic 41, rift 100, luck 10, and adaptability 10. He has 22,740 coins, and his unique abilities include Fusion, Grave of Swords, Blessing of the Star, and many other skills. He thinks he's already at level 12 after not even a day in the spawning ground, and things are going much smoother than he expected. Alice comes from behind and asks how he could leave everything to her. He replies that since she has the strength to complain, it looks like she won't die. She asks if he thinks that's funny and states that what they have isn't a partnership, but a slave contract. He is shocked and asks if it's a slave contract, 
saying she is hurting his feelings and he was going to buy her a mana supplement. She apologizes, saying that kind of supplement won't cut it. He asks if it won't work, and she explains that there's no way a mere supplement can fill her mana. Moreover, if she's low on mana, she can't provide him with decent support. She declares that she'll take every drop of the mana she consumes. He tells Alice to calm down and says he told her to wait, looking scared. She drinks and comments that it is delicious while cleaning her face. He wonders how much blood she sucked from him while she says that her mana is now complete and asks what they do next. He replies that he'll be doing some shopping, purchases some items, and receives a notification thanking him for his purchase. She asks what the hell this is, as he bought some useless stuff. He explains that it may look like that, but they all have their purposes. He calls her and says they will be getting extremely busy from now on, and they have to get to the end of the underground first floor by today. He stands near a big hole. Meanwhile, she sits on his shoulder and he instructs her to hold on tight as he dives down. She questions why he is jumping down when he doesn't even know how deep it is. He thinks about how deep it is and concludes that he knows precisely since he has jumped down over a hundred times. Alice activates the unknown reverse gravity skill and they land on the floor. She remarks that he's too reckless and asks if he's skilled or lucky. He receives a notification that the level 4 element of fire has been activated, lighting a fire in the center, and he assures her that it's okay as he knows he's in the right place. He looks around at the many giant insects and confidently states that insects of this caliber do not match him. He challenges the boss to come out himself. The boss emerges from behind and he asks if he knows about him, to which the boss replies of course he does. The hound who roams the desert is Anubis. Anubis states that he was planning on amusing himself before killing Kang Jin Hayek since he's the first human here, but he didn't expect him to want to hasten his death. Kang Jin Hayek retorts that he didn't come here to chat, he wants Anubis to bring it. Anubis finds it absurd and questions if Kang Jin Hayek suggests that a god should fight him personally. Alice steps forward, expressing concern that Anubis is dangerous. She offers to try to hold her back while Kang Jin Hayek escapes back up. He assures her not to worry and watch. She warns that this isn't the time to be arrogant, looking at Anubis. Kang Jin Hayek replies, letting him show her what kind of person she contracted with, and he receives a notification that Anubis's innate ability, Judgment of Anubis, has been activated. Anubis asks Kang Jin Hayek if he heard about him from the vampire he brought with him, presenting the first question. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek thinks that this skill is one Anubis always activates every time they confront each other, an absolute judgment skill that starts just by answering three questions, the judgment of Anubis. He receives a notification stating that the condition to copy the skill which destroys the vessel containing Anubis consciousness is to make him lose his patience. He contemplates that if he makes Anubis lose his patience, he can obtain the power to ask the most intensive questions. He thinks all he needs to do is answer Anubis' questions without any concern for whether the answers are true. He confidently states that Anubis is right, asking how else he could have come there, and receives a notification that he has answered the target's question. Anubis acknowledges that Kang Jin Hayek's goal for coming here is the hive, and another notification follows, indicating that the second question has been presented. Kang Jin Hayek responds that the hive can be sold for quite a bit of money on the black market. He observes and gets another notification that he has answered the target's question. Meanwhile, Anubis states he will ask Kang Jin Hayek one last question if he thinks he can leave there alive after stepping into Anubis's territory. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that the third question has been presented. He responds that if he can't deal with Anubis, he should give away his items and give up on life. Another notification follows, indicating that he has answered the target's question, all conditions have been met, and the judgment of Anubis has been activated. He gets more messages that all his stats have decreased by 50% and his innate abilities and skills will be sealed for one minute. Anubis remarks that Kang Jin Hayuk will need an agent to bring his judgment. Kang Jin Hayuk receives another message that Anubis has selected a judgment champion. 
The giant mantis steps forward, and Anubis introduces it as the champion who will give Kang Jin Hayak his judgment. Anubis asks Kang Jin Hayak what he thinks of his dignified winner. Kang Jin Hayak comments that the giant mantis is impressive, but this will be enough to defeat it. He receives a notification about the mini gramophone, explaining that it plays a specific song once and can't be destroyed until the song is done playing. Anubis asks if Kang Jin Hayuk is suddenly playing human music and asks if he has gone mad in front of the champion. Kang Jin Hayuk retorts that he's not angry and says music is something to be engrossed in. He dances and thinks he found the perfect song after searching hundreds and thousands of times. He experimented with accurately assigned beats that followed the same attack patterns as the giant mantis, ensuring that he would follow the music and render his attacks useless. Anubis thinks that Kang Jin Hayek plans to use the beat of the music to avoid the attacks perfectly, and it's not a coincidence. He believes Kang Jin Hayek planned all of this. Kang Jin Hayek thinks it's about time, and as the penalty ends, he gets a notification that he may now use his innate abilities and skills since one minute has passed. After a while, Kang Jin Hayek gets ready for the fight and is notified that Sword Cemetery has been activated. He attacks the giant mantis. Anubis questions if Kang Jin Hayek thought that would kill his champion, explaining that the champion can regenerate in mere seconds, but is finished when it's out of stamina. Kang Jin Hayek agrees, stating that he can't kill the mantis the way he is now, but he can make it so that it no longer wishes to live. He attacks again. Watching this, Alice thinks he's altogether playing with the mantis. She acknowledges that she knew he was strong, but she never thought it would be to this extent. She feels that if it's him, he may be able to help her get her revenge. Anubis questions what Kang Jin Hayek is doing and instructs him to keep fighting and stop backing down as he sees the mantis in pieces. Kang Jin Hayek contemplates that the mantis are proud warriors chosen by the gods, the champion. He sees this as the last straw in breaking the will of the warrior who believed that he could never lose an insult and provocation. He sits at the head of the mantis. Meanwhile, the mantis gets up again, throws Kang Jin Hayek away, and cuts his head. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that Anubis's champion has been defeated. Anubis looks at him in shock and thinks the champion committed suicide. Kang Jin Hayek gets a message that he has leveled up and unlocked the magic castle of the Duchy of Peltanus. He can now learn ice magic after analyzing it. He observes, realizing that he can only see the middle floor of the tower, and wonders if this is the effect of monopolization. Another message informs him that he has gained the skill level 1 ice molding, and level 1 ice molding has been activated. Kang Jin Hayek looks at this unexpected gain. Anubis acknowledges that Kang Jin Hayek is not an average human, but questions if he plans on fighting him with those ice toys. He responds that Anubis can't even step up so he should say it right. He mocks Anubis for doing nothing but kibitzing on the 42nd floor. Anubis retorts that he already knows that he's a consciousness. In that case, he asks why Kang Jin Hayuk has come to fight him. He smiles and wants to know why, stating it's fun. Anubis questions what's fun and challenges Kang Jin Hayuk for looking at him as mere entertainment, finding it disrespectful. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that Hive, an ancient beehive capable of infinitely summoning giant insects, is being operated by Anubis. Anubis commands to kill the insolent human instantly. Many honeybees swarm in, but Kang Jin Hayek attacks them with ice balls, eliminating them individually. Kang Jin Hayek realizes this won't be enough and activates the fire element. He receives a message indicating that he has chosen to combine the skills of Fire Element B and Ice Molding A, and another notification confirms the successful combination. He attacks the bees again. Kang Jin Hayak gets another message informing him that he has gained the skill of Daylight A. Kang Jin Hayak receives a message that Level 1 Daylight has been activated, causing the bees to become blind and unable to attack him. He gets additional details about Daylight, learning that it's a wide-ranging skill that compresses and releases magical power. White magic, powerful in itself, becomes even more effective in battle due to its blinding flash, affecting the enemy's field of vision. 
Anubis acknowledges that he must change his battle strategy. Kang Jin Hayek then receives a notification that Anubis has activated Chosen Target and the Hive has spawned a powered-up entity. Another message informs him that Level 1 Ice Molos has been activated. Kang Jin Hayek attacks the bees with Ice Molos, successfully eliminating them. Anubis, however, dismisses the effectiveness, stating that Chosen Targets won't die but will only multiply, observing the bees. He believes that no matter how strong a skill Kang Jin Hayek uses, it will be useless. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek retrieves a capsule, expressing relief that it has finally appeared. He checks its details and discovers that it's a giant pill, a particular item that will increase the target's size to 10 times. He decides to use it and attacks the bees once again. A message informs him that the effects of the giant pill will be activated in one minute. Kang Jin Hayek rides on a bee and grabs its antenna, causing Anubis to become angry and demand that the bee kill him immediately. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on the situation, realizing that dealing with enemies that don't die but keep multiplying can lead to despair. Another bee approaches to attack him, and he understands the situation's complexity. He receives a notification that he has used the Unknown Cube D, Ability Booster D, Sticky Glue F, Cobwebs from the Culturist Forest F, and 100 MG of Twin Head Ogre Snot F. He receives a notification again that the four items will be combined to strengthen the Unknown Cube. Then, he contemplates whether he can identify the pattern through countless repetitions, calmly analyzes the situation, and descends to the floor. Observing the bees, he activates the level 5 fire element, believing that the result will enable him to change his thinking. He receives a notification that the effectiveness of the giant pill has been activated and gets notified that a giant pill has dropped again. Thinking ahead, he contemplates the necessity of acquiring as many giant pills as possible if he wants to face a boss monster that commands an army. He believes that this monster, which multiplies infinitely, serves as an experience points multiplier and an item duplicator, making it the perfect copy machine. After a while, Anubis inquires about what is happening in the world. He questions whether the items were prepared to achieve this combination and if he has already figured out the hive's unique feature, laying this trap. Anubis asserts that he is sure Kang Jin Hayuk was aiming for this from the beginning while placing his hand in anger on the chair. Kang Jin Hayuk receives a notification that Anubis has destroyed the hive, to which Kang Jin Hayuk replies that it is getting fun too. Anubis, angered, questions how a mere human dare humiliate him, expressing his displeasure. He stands up to fight Kang Jin Hayuk, insisting he better survive and climb the tower. Kang Jin Hayek calmly responds that's what he's planning on doing, even without having to scream about it. He asserts that he'll pass judgment on Anubis for his disrespect at that time. Kang Jin Hayek then receives a notification that the vessel of Anubis has been destroyed and the conditions have been met. He checks the details about the judgment of Anubis, where the conditions will be met when he asks the target three questions, reduces the target's stats by 50%, and limits the activation of skills and innate ability for one minute. He receives a notification that this skill can be used against a target one time. However, if this rule is abused, the wrath of the ancient Egyptian gods may be inflicted upon him. He also receives another notification that the ancient Egyptian gods have shown interest in his existence, and some have expressed hostility towards him. He remarks, swearing that these gods are so narrow-minded. Alice asks what in the world just happened, and he replies, asking what does she mean. He states that he won, and he rechecks his status screen, seeing that his level is now 19. He reflects that this is the first time he has leveled up this much in this area, and he doesn't know what will happen from now on. So, he decides to distribute the stat points evenly. He says go over there for a second, Alice, and mentions that it's a surprise with her calling him. He receives a call from Chin Yusung, who asks him where he is right now and inquires if that is a place he doesn't know about. He replies that it isn't any of Chin Yusung's business. Chin Yusung then proposes that the Awakened Association hold a martial arts tournament in 24 hours. He mentions that players judged to be A-ranked and above, including him, will participate. 
Chin Yusung expresses surprise that the association is having a martial arts tournament at a time when they have kept failing to defeat the third floor boss. Chin Yusung suggests that he should participate in the tournament with him to have their last fight to determine the winner and loser. He questions why he would go there and waste his precious time on him, thinking it would have been a different story if he had a skill he wanted to copy. Chen Yusung firmly refuses, stating that he will never accept this proposal because he has an invitation ticket to the black market. The auction host taps the hammer on the table and announces it's sold. He explains that according to Chen Yusung, a black market different from the coin exchange used by players is a secret auction house that sells items through auctions with real money. This auction house is exclusive, only accessible to a select few members. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on how auction houses like these have formed now that the Tower of Trials has become a reality. He realizes he requires some items to clear the third floor boss and considers that if it's an auction house that only rich people secretly come to, there should be some good items that he can acquire. He notices a notification and wonders if the rumors have already spread, thinking about the video uploaded through the newly made unknown channel. He believes that on the screen, he could see unknown individuals and the rankers of large guilds, along with Teresa. Since he edited out the part where the demonic human appeared, there wasn't anyone insulting the guilds. Meanwhile, he further contemplates that there aren't any benefits to making an enemy out of the significant guilds. He receives numerous comments, and he thinks the reactions were as expected. The player of interest, covered in veils that everyone wants to know about unknown, declares to clear a dungeon that all the large guilds failed to remove, and he believes everyone is bound to be hyped. Considering that a person can only watch a video daily, he finds 50 million views quite astounding. Since a hundred coins are given for every 10,000 views, and 50 million views would give him 5 million coins with the 90% commission fee, it comes to around 50,000 coins. He acknowledges that although the commission fee is high, it's not bad. Feeling a yawn coming on, he says anyway, when this damn martial arts tournament is going to end. Meanwhile, he considers that 24 martial arts tournament participants are a rank or higher. He reflects on the decision to raise public trust in the Awakened Association and the large guilds that have fallen due to consecutive third-floor boss raid failures. The association has decided to broadcast it live without any edits to show the citizens how strong and trustworthy the players are. He thinks in other words it's a show, and he guesses it makes sense since not everyone watches NewTube and they don't get to see the players' abilities very often. He thinks loosening the tense atmosphere is not a bad idea. Recalling that Chen Yusung told him on the call that if he agrees to the match, he will give him this ticket, he replies wait, he hasn't even been judged as a rank or over, and he can't participate in the tournament. He mentions again that the winner of the tournament is given two choices. One is the opportunity to choose one divine artifact replica from the National Museum of Korea. Kang Jin Hayek thinks he's completely ignoring him. At the same time he mentions again that the other choice is the opportunity to choose a player to duel against who hasn't participated in the tournament. He gets a bad feeling while Chin Yusung asserts that this time when everyone is watching, he will defeat him. Kang Jin Hayek asks if that's all he's got and says he guesses Chin Yusung has become a has-been. A soldier replies, telling Kang Jin Hayek not to get too full of himself and mentions that Chen Yusung is just going easy on him because he doesn't want to kill him. Suddenly, they see a giant monster attacking them, killing them. The chief observes that the group of two also looks quite helpful as he looks at Min Yungwu and Li Yuri, mentioning that they are pretty powerful. Ten Y says that with this, the public should feel somewhat relieved. The chief replies that there are many talents to scout and asks if the director agrees. Hong Diokpio, the Black Cloud Guild director and S-rank, replies that only one person catches his eye. He thinks the individual has marvelous and excellent power control and a wide field of view. Most importantly, he appreciates the well-groomed battle spirit of the person. He recalls someone asking if he would like to join the Black Cloud Guild and he replies that he's not interested and refuses. 
Meanwhile, he reflects that he's the first to refuse his offer to join his guild, and he finds the individual to have quite the spirit for someone of this generation. He remarks this is so hard to watch. Black Cloud Guild Ale Rank Young Doyeon arrives and says that if only he let him participate, he would have destroyed all those insects and even made that arrogant Chen Yusung kneel before him. He asks if the director doesn't think so. Hong Diokpio tells him to stop saying the same thing repeatedly and to worry about his interview later. He mentions that he used money to prepare for it and asks if he understands. He replies not to worry, as he's more photogenic than he thinks. Hong Diokpio thinks Young Doyeon has enough talent to rise to S rank within three years, and if word gets out that they recruited such a prospect, their guild's reputation is naturally bound to increase. He adds that it would be great if Young Doyeon could stop bragging though. After a while, Chen Yusung arrives and attacks them all, defeating them. The news broadcasts that they have a winner and everyone sees the information on their phones. A girl comments that there's already a winner, and another girl expresses her desire to watch too, asking to let her see. She questions if the person shown is the winner and comments on Chen Yusung, saying he isn't quite the looker. The news reporter says congratulations Chen Yusung. Now he will choose between the replica artifact and opponent designation. He replies with opponent designation, while an individual sees him and asks if he will fight someone else. Another man asks if he wants to fight against someone big, like a guild master, while he waves a sword. The news reporter mentions that Chen Yusung is saying that he wants to use the designation and wonders who his opponent will be. He points his sword towards Kang Jin Hayuk, who gets up from his seat. Yung Doyan says he sure knows his stuff and agrees, saying very well he will. Hong Diokpio grabs him and says to sit down, as he's not designating him. He adds to look at the point of his sword and his gaze, pointing out that he is indicating somewhere above them. Chen Yusung says stop acting dumb and come out, while Yung Doyan thinks there shouldn't be anyone here worth fighting other than him and Hong Diokpio. Kang Jin Hayuk remarks that he's an expert at annoying people and Park comments that Chen Yusung has lowered his sword, indicating that it looks like it's that person whoever he is. Another person says to look through the database this instant. After searching, they announce they found it. His name is Kang Jin Hayuk, an F-rank player. Hong Diokpio thinks it would be a huge topic if Chen Yusung dueled against someone like their ALA rank Yong Doyan, but he chose an F-rank player. He reflects that this doesn't benefit Chen Yusung while Kang Jin Hayek returns to the battlefield. He wonders if Chen Yusung has some fetish for tormenting the weak in front of a crowd and questions what he is thinking. Kang Jin Hayek pleads with Chen Yusung, saying if he loses this match, he should stop challenging him, emphasizing that he needs to know when to give up. Chen Yusung responds, asking if he's seriously saying that after seeing him win the tournament, he laughs and acknowledges that it does seem like his skills have improved. He insists that he didn't stop for a single moment and did his absolute best to catch up to him. He asserts that if Chin Yusung wants the ticket, he must give it his all and be ready to fight. He is notified that Chin Yusung has activated level 6 Soul Chasing Sword Kai and the Soul Chasing Sword Arts second movement, Soul Chasing Inferno Emperor. He confidently says, all right, bring it on, the damn stalker. Kang Jin Hayuk explodes the place while Chin Yusung falls and asks him how many damn skills he has. He comes closer to him, takes out a market ticket from his pocket, and says he'll make good use of this black market ticket. A girl asks her partner if he saw that giant ice missile. Not only that, but he also destroys the ceiling with some light rays. He asks was an F rank, then she says forget F rank, if is he even human. Kang Jin Hayek comes down from the ring and says to Min Young Woo and Li Yuri, it's been a while, hasn't it? Min Young Woo agrees, mentioning they haven't met since the museum. Kang Jin Hayek replies that their first meeting was a bit savage, but if isn't it all water under the bridge, he starts coughing and says he also doesn't want to be his enemy. She says she neither. He then says, as a way for them to get along from now on, please do him a favor and give him her number. He says she can refuse if she doesn't want to. 
She thinks a bit while he says of course, that's only if she can handle the consequences and shows her phone. She thinks it's only a favor in name, and it's practically a threat. Meanwhile, Yong Douyin quickly gets up from his seat and reaches the battlefield, expressing his surprise. He thought he'd get floored since Kang Jin Hyuk is an F-ranker, but he's impressed by how powerful he is. Kang Jin Hyuk activates level 3 Eye of Truth and checks the status screen of Yong Douyin. He learns that Yong Douyin is a 33-year-old male with a level of 21. His strength is 40, dexterity is 17, stats are 18, and magic is 8. Yong Douyin has 8,535 coins, and his unique ability is the power of a giant. His skills include level 5 Giant's Clutch, level 5 Giant's Shield, level 5 Pain Suppression, and some others. Kang Jin Hayek reflects that he never imagined an event like this would happen. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that the current subject Yong Douyin has approached him with some sort of scheme in mind. If he figures out what his intentions are, he will be able to copy the skill giant's clutch. He wonders about the scheme and, more importantly, how the system knows exactly what other people are thinking every time. He says not to glare at him like that because he didn't come there to fight. Kang Jin Hayek then asks what Yong Douyin wants. Yong Douyin replies that it's simple. As a person who works in the same business, he'll be seeing Kang Jin Hayek quite often as a colleague who will be working together with him from now on. Yong Douyin extends his hand for a handshake and says he'll be in Kang Jin Hayek's care. Kang Jin Hayek thinks about what Yong Douyin means by being in his care. He activates level 3 Eye of Truth and sees that Yong Douyin's words are a lie. Behind his superficially composed face, there's a subtle amount of inferiority and rage displayed. The gathering reporters seem to be waiting for this moment. Kang Jin Hayek notices that in Yong Douyin's hand, requesting a handshake, there's his unique ability, the power of a giant, and the black cloud representative has an expression full of expectation by overpowering the recruit who is defeated. He sees the winner of the tournament in front of all these reporters and he plans on redirecting all the attention gathered to himself. He thinks it's an obvious scheme and gets another notification that he has seen through Yong Douyin's intentions and the copy conditions have been fulfilled. Meanwhile, he receives more messages that he has obtained the skill Giant's Clutch B and checks Giant's Clutch details. He can use the power of a giant and his grip strength will dramatically increase. He is freely able to use items that are 10 times his weight. He thinks back to when Tower of Trials was a virtual reality game. He didn't have many chances to copy skills due to the lack of players. However, now that the game has become a reality, all the skills that other people have obtained through all kinds of efforts are just waiting to be collected by him. He remarks, colleagues, how interesting and questions whether this handshake symbolizes the Black Cloud Guild. Yong Douyin responds affirmatively, stating that it seems Kang Jin Hayek isn't affiliated with any guilds, so if he joins them, he'll receive special treatment. Kang Jin Hayek inquires if he would get a substantial down payment upon joining. Yong Douyin chuckles, saying it's obvious, and suggests Kang Jin Hayek name a number, assuring that they will match it. The two shake hands, and Kang Jin Hayek poses a final question, asking if Yong Douyin believes he could win in a contest of strength. Yong Douyin confidently replies, of course, while Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that Yong Douyin has activated level 5 Giant's Clutch. Yong Douyin questions if it isn't obvious, and Kang Jin Hayek counters by activating Judgment of Anubis, freezing him in place. Despite being immobilized, Yong Douyin insists Kang Jin Hayek is exaggerating his pain, and Kang Jin Hayek presses his hand. Yong Douyin in pain eventually sits down, and Kang Jin Hayek remarks that he seems quite confident in his strength, but may be exaggerating his pain. Yong Douyin shouts in pain, pleading for Kang Jin Hayek to stop. Kang Jin Hayek halts, punches him, throws him away, and disapproves of Yong Douyin's attempt to act friendly. He activates his Eye of Truth, while Hong Diok Pio exclaims how Kang Jin Hayek dared to make a rag out of Yong Douyin, questioning if he understands how hard Yong Douyin worked for this moment. 
Checking Hong Diokpio's status screen, Kang Jin Hayek learns that Hong Diokpio is a 41-year-old male, level 34, with strength at 38, stats at 20, magic level at 15, and a unique ability called Blood Demon. Hong Diokpio possesses 25,580 coins and numerous skills. He receives a notification about the copy condition, stating that if he succeeds, he will be able to copy the subject's unique ability, Blood Demon Kai. Kang Jin Hyuk thinks Young Doyen is proud, and he understands his anger, but he wishes they could hold off on the fighting. Hong Diokpio questions if Kang Jin Hyuk is getting cold feet after coming this far. Kang Jin Hyuk denies it, explaining that he just doesn't want to destroy any guild masters yet. Hong Diokpio becomes angry, abuses him, and charges to attack while Kang Jin Hayuk gets a notification that Hong Diokpio has activated his unique ability, Blood Demon Kai. As Hong Diokpio questions if Kang Jin Hayuk is seriously saying that, Kang Jin Hayuk activates his level 2 daylight and counterattacks. Meanwhile, a person from the audience comments that they can't see a thing, and a girl wonders what the hell is happening. Kang Jin Hayuk takes his dagger and walks forward, while Hong Diokpio continues his assault. Kang Jin Hayuk stops his attack with his dagger and receives a message that the rift stat has been activated, using the 99 points, and the difference has been reduced by 33 levels. Hong Diokpio thinks this guy can withstand his blood demon Kai, that's impossible. He believes he's on par against him, who was at the vanguard of the raid against Colossus, the boss of the second floor, and shouts for him to stop, saying it's ridiculous. Kang Jin Hayek gets a notification that level 4 arbitration has been activated. Meanwhile, Association President Han Sangjin arrives and suggests they should try to look dependable in this martial arts tournament that everyone is watching. They both look at him. Meanwhile, Han Sangjin mentions that there were some weird things about it, so he decided to investigate Kang Jin Hayuk's test results. He sees that Kang Jin Hayuk pressured his examiner. Han Sangjin congratulates Kang Jin Hayuk on becoming the 16th rank in Korea. He bows down in front of him and states that the association takes responsibility for the misassessment in the ranking and deeply apologizes. The audience shouts that he's a new s rank player, and an individual from the audience says to tell everyone in the reporter conference room to get the hell over here. What a scoop. They all run towards him. Hong Diokpio thinks about what kind of a situation this is. The martial arts tournament was supposed to be the Black Cloud Guild stage, but they're being completely buried in the ground. He thinks he has to mend the situation somehow. Hong Diokpio grabs the reporter's hand and states that the Black Cloud Guild will be clearing the third floor boss. The reporter apologizes and quickly runs away, asking them to give him a call next time. He leaves his coat in Hong Diokpio's hand. All the reporters gather around Kang Jin Hayuk and take his pictures while he receives a notification that the condition has been fulfilled and he has acquired the unique ability of Blood Demon Kai. The scene shifts to Kang Jin Hayuk watching the news about the appearance of Korea's 16th rank and seeing many comments. He mentions that he sees some good reactions and recalls Han Sangjin asking him if he said he would be heading to Las Vegas. As an apology, they will prepare a plane for him. Kang Jin Hayuk realizes that this is why people want a high rank, it's a completely different treatment. He sits in the plane, contemplating the changes. The air hostess comes and apologizes, presenting him with a delicious lunch. He thinks, so this is what first class is like while eating lunch. Alice calls him and says she sees the man in front of him. He confirms, and then she mentions that the scent he gives off is strange, a displeasing and uncomfortable smell of blood. She adds that she's certain she doesn't want to taste his blood. Kang Jin Hayek asks what she is going on about. She replies that she's not joking, that man isn't some ordinary human. Meanwhile, he thinks if Alice, who sees humans as mere blood packets, is saying something like that, then there must be something to him. He activates level 3 Eye of Truth and checks that man's details. His name is Alex Judro, 24 years old, male, level 27, strength 15, stats 20, magic 61, and his unique ability is the Forgotten Ancient Tomb with a level 5 resurrection skill. 
he receives a notification about a copying condition, stating that based on his affinity with the subject, he may copy his unique ability and one of his skills. However, to reach maximum affinity with the subject, he must apply to the Daimonic Human Association. He thinks about what a Daimonic Human is and mentions that Alex Judro was one of the Daimonic Humans. He can't believe he's putting on an act with such a calm look on his face. After a while, Alex Judro asks him if he is the player Kang Jin Hayek and inquires if he is the person who was recently assessed as S rank in Korea. He thinks this can't be a coincidence. He definitely got on the same plane as him on purpose. He concludes that the large guilds aren't the only ones taking interest in him after the S rank announcement. He confirms and says he was reassessed as S rank not too long ago. Alex Judro says he thought so. He saw the martial arts tournament coverage, what a surprise. He gives him his card and says to please excuse his manners, mentioning that his name is Alex Judro. Alex Judro says it must be fate for them to have met like this and asks if they will go have a drink. He says there's nothing like alcohol to pass the time during such a long flight. He thinks he guesses he can play along for a bit and takes his card, saying he guesses he's right. He thinks Alex told him all kinds of stories as he pulled out some high-quality cognac and his story about how his cosmetics business has been booming. He contemplates the kinds of hardships he faced after the Tower of Trials appeared. He wonders if this demonic human, who's trying his hardest to tell him who he is, knows and thinks about the fact that he already knows who he really is. Alex Judro takes his drink and says to be honest, the reason he went to Korea wasn't because of his cosmetics business, mentioning that it was to expand his business related to the Awakened. He asks what an Awakened related business is, and then Alex Judro confirms, saying he thought he'd give it a go, considering the change in times. However, there's a slight problem, he mentions while having a sip of his drink. He asks what kind of problem it is. Alex Judro replies if he is aware of the recent player who has been going around wearing a mask. He mentions that unknown person. He saw him declaring that he'll clear the third floor boss and asks if he has some sort of relationship with the unknown person while having his drink. Meanwhile, Alex Judro, being honest, stated that they were planning to participate in the third floor raid, but they have encountered a difficult situation because he is vehemently opposing their efforts. He claims it is to protect his comrade and mentions instructing them not to bother him since he has a solo task to accomplish. He retorts, stating that he speaks as if he personally knows the unknown. Alex Jedro notes that he could say that while contemplating how calmly the unknown is lying to the person in question's face. He comments on the unknown's greediness and Alex Judro laughs, agreeing that the unknown is excessively greedy. He adds ice to his glass and asserts that the unknown's point is valid, suggesting that if he joins them in the third floor boss room, he would be a great help. When asked why him, Alex Judro questions whether the unknown declared a solo raid. Alex Judro explains that since S ranks are granted the right to act independently, no one will be able to touch him. Moreover, he emphasizes that the unknown will be able to obtain a hidden item from the third floor boss's room pouring more drinks as he speaks. Meanwhile, he contemplates a situation where the large guilds have pledged a solo raid to the unknown. They will be strictly limiting any entry into the third floor boss room, and he believes they are attempting to enter through this avenue while declining more drink. He remarks that this request seems a bit excessive, considering he has only recently attained an S rank. Essentially, it appears as though they are asking him to go against the large guilds already. Alex Judro responds by stating that he's an entrepreneur, and the more demanding the request, the more rewarding the payment he'll receive in exchange. He wonders if the other person has heard of this philosophy, and a bottle of potion materializes in his hand. He describes it as the potion of legends, capable of curing any disease and even healing a shattered heart, it's an elixir. Kang Jin Hayek is shocked to see this and wonders what the Demonic Human Association did to acquire something so rare. He takes the potion and admits that it's quite tempting. Alex Judro remarks that anyone would desire such an item. He takes something out of his pocket and states that he will provide him with that elixir as an advance payment if he simply signs this contract. 
he places the contract documents on the table. A notification appears, indicating that Alex has activated Level 6 Contract of the Dead. Alex Judro mentions that such an opportunity doesn't come by often, and while he believes it's just a contract by its appearance, it is, in fact, a contract where breaching the conditions will lead to death. He thinks there's nothing to worry about as long as he doesn't sign it. He politely declines, apologizing that he can't sign it due to being the cautious type. Making an enemy out of the large guilds is a bit challenging for him. Alex Judro expresses disappointment, stating that even this won't satisfy him, and he had high hopes for him. He suggests forgetting about the deal with the elixir. Alex Judro inquires about his decision, to which he responds that despite being cautious, he is also the greedy type who needs to have everything he wants. Perplexed, Alex Judro asks what he is talking about. Alex Jedro gazes at Kang Jin Hayek and wonders what he is attempting to do by drawing out this much mana. He ponders whether this seemingly reckless man is planning to crash the plane if necessary. An announcement informs all passengers in the cabin that the plane is currently experiencing sudden turbulence and requests everyone to return to their seats and fasten their seat belts. Kang Jin Hayek acknowledges the announcement and remarks that he should return to his seat. Alex Judro asks if he knew from the beginning where he is affiliated. Kang Jin Hayek responds that he had a rough idea, highlighting his proficiency in acting. Alex Judro advises him to avoid irritating them too much, as unknown will undoubtedly make him pay the price for this matter, regardless of the circumstances. Kang Jin Hayek dismisses the warning, stating that it's an obvious lie considering he is on the same side as Unknown, especially after being humiliated during the Olympus meeting. Meanwhile, Alex Jodro ponders how the person knows that information. He considers the possibility that this guy might be actually close to Unknown, but then he doubts it, thinking he might just be bluffing. The large guilds may have shared some information with him, given that he recently attained his rank. He casually suggests that perhaps if he's nice, the person might share some information about unknown with him and mentions they'll meet again when the plane lands. Upon reaching Las Vegas, he admires the beautiful city, and Alice inquires if it's a human city. He responds that, well, he guesses it's not bad. He reminds her of their agreement not to cause trouble, as he takes her out as a reward for discovering the demonic human. He notes that 150 cm is his limit with his current mana. He decides to call out the memory of the world and receives a notification that fusing the skills of Eye of Truth SS and Blood Demon Kai S was successful. He acquires the skill Eye of Gluttony SSS and gains details about it. The Eye of Gluttony not only allows him to inspect a target's status window, but also enables view sharing and mind reading. He contemplates that he was planning to fuse it with a more stable spirit-type ability in the future, but it can't be helped since he needs it right now. Alice asks if they are going to a place like that, pointing towards a casino. He declines and states they are going somewhere else, mentioning that he can't use skills in regular casinos like that. She inquires about what skill means, and he clarifies that he's referring to magic. He reflects that although he could forcefully take money from regular casinos, earning funds for the auction, taking money from hardworking people crosses the line. Curious, she asks where they are going, and he responds, saying it's somewhere incomparable to an ordinary place like that. When they arrive at the private gambling house Tortuga, she expresses a preference for the other building. He reiterates that they aren't there to play around. This is where he has to go. He observes a man crying and begging someone, remarking on what the man saw him do with his own eyes, using some sort of trick. The man kicks him away, insisting that he used all sorts of skills himself, so there's nothing to complain about. He adds that in this place, the one who gets scammed is the dumbass, and they both enter. Kang Jin Hayek acknowledges that it's true, while Alice excitedly points out the various fun-looking things in the area. She questions what's so different about this place compared to others. He takes her by the waist and explains that this is a casino where she can freely use magic. He seats her in a chair and instructs the bartender to put everything on his tab, offering to make any drink she desires. She questions whether he expects her to just sit still there, 
especially when it's been so long since she has come outside. She inquires about his plans while he has a drink. He responds that he plans to earn some foreign currency, activates level 3 source seal, and receives a message stating that the designated object is not affected by skills for 10 minutes, although the user's skills still take effect. Engaging with Tortuga table dealer Pedro, he considers it a decent hand and reflects on already losing over $5 million to this Asian opponent. He realizes it would be bad to lose anymore and determines to finish the round with this hand, no matter what. Pedro suggests raising the issue, mentioning that this round may decide the outcome, and comments on the absurd amount. Holding a coin, he confidently declares all in, prompting Pedro to react, noting that it's at least $50 million. He expresses concern about the substantial amount of money, and Pedro reassures him, stating that the house is always confident. Lifting his glass, he shifts the conversation, inquiring about which guild manages the place. Pedro reveals that the scavenger guild invests in and manages the establishment. Puzzled by the sudden questions, Pedro wonders if he has some kind of mind-reading skill. He insists on his right to ask questions, and Pedro assures him that he can answer questions to that extent, contemplating the possibility of a mind-reading skill. He then suggests flipping the cards, acknowledging that it doesn't matter if he substitutes the cards as soon as they are revealed, he won't be able to do anything about it. Receiving a notification that level 3 strange gestures activates, he plans to manipulate the outcome with his ability. As he looks at the cards, he is shocked to find that it's still a pair of jacks. He wonders what happened and is certain that he substituted them with his ability, finding it impossible. Observing the cards, Kang Jin Hayuk expresses relief, stating that he won by a hair's width with his pair of kings. He acknowledges the usefulness of his newly obtained Eye of Gluttony, particularly its mind-reading function. Confidently, he announces that he will take all the chips. Suddenly, a punk approaches from behind, demanding him to wait and stating that he doesn't know what skill he used to win so big, but he needs to come with them. Displeased, he questions if this is how they treat their customers. The section chief intervenes, explaining that they don't consider people who take this much money from them to be customers. Kang Jin Hayek asks if that's the case, prompting the section chief to instruct his subordinates to drag him into a room. Reacting swiftly, Kang Jin Hayek gets up and punches the punk away, reflecting on the section chief's words and recalling a similar sentiment he heard outside as he entered the place. He contemplates the nature of this place, where the one who gets scammed is considered the dumbass. King Jin Hayek rises, preparing for a fight, and a guard opens fire on him. However, he quickly evades the attack. The section chief observes him and commends his skill, while a girl accompanying the section chief instructs him to destroy their opponents. King Jin Hayek engages in the fight, attempting to defeat them. Meanwhile, Alice calmly sits at the bar, enjoying her drink, and inquires about its name. The bartender responds, stating it's a cocktail called Kiss of Fire, and describes it as an alcohol that represents the passionate love between couples. She muses on the concept of passionate love between couples, while Kang Jin Hyuk employs a fire element behind her to attack the guards. The section chief questions whether the guild executives have arrived yet, and his subordinate informs him that they mentioned it would take at least 30 minutes. Kang Jin Hayek continues to overpower the section chief's team members. Observing the situation, he senses that something is amiss with Kang Jin Hayek, realizing that, despite the lawlessness of the place, no one goes wild like this all by themselves. Meanwhile, Pedro urgently summons him, pointing to his phone and stating that there's serious trouble, requesting him to take a look. The section chief, initially questioning what could be more serious than the current situation, shifts his gaze to the phone. He looks shocked as he reads the news about Kang Jin Hayuk, identifying him as someone newly assessed as an S-rank in South Korea, a few days ago, player Kang Jin Hayuk. Processing this information, he considers the significance of an S rank, noting that even America only has about 20 S ranks. He contemplates the potential destruction Kang Jin Hayek could cause if he decides to act. Reacting swiftly, he instructs everyone to stop, removes his jacket, and kneels in front of Kang Jin Hayek. 
expressing remorse, he offers an apology, acknowledging that they acted rudely towards him without recognizing who he is. He pleads for forgiveness, asking Kang Jin Hayek to let this incident pass. Kang Jin Hayek questions the sudden apology and wonders if the section chief thinks that he crossed paths with the wrong person after learning his rank. After a while, the section chief responds, clarifying that it's not what he meant. Kang Jin Hayek, finding the situation absurd, questions if this wasn't the nature of the place from the beginning, where the one who gets scammed is considered the dumbass. He asserts his intention to claim the money he won, along with compensation for the mental damage caused by their attempt to deceive him after winning fair and square. He suggests settling for just $10 million. The section chief, surprised, repeats, $10 million. Kang Jin Hayek seizes him by the collar, asserting that he can either pay up or close his doors for good, and then he exits. After some time, he checks his account and finds $10 million deposited. He contemplates that this amount should be more than enough to purchase the items he desires and assumes that they should arrive soon. A car pulls up near him, and an individual from the car inquires if he is customer 117. Confirming that he is, Kang Jin Hayek is told that he will be escorted to the auction house, and the person shows him the black market card. Seated in the car, Kang Jin Hayek contemplates that he can't see the outside from within and assumes the auction house's location is in the top sector. The car driver expresses anticipation for the upcoming event and urges him to enjoy his stay. Upon exiting the car and walking towards the building, Alice reminds him of his promise and he retrieves his chain. He assures her to wait, stating that he's going to a place where people can't see them, to which she impatiently urges him to hurry up. He instructs her to stop pestering him and proceeds to take her outside. She expresses joy in the outside air, and he questions if she's that happy. She responds affirmatively, stating that this place befits a noble being like herself. Inquiring about the auction, she asks if they are going to start now. Kang Jin Hayek confirms and emphasizes not doing anything that stands out there. When she questions why she can't do something, he explains that there are many eyes watching. Reflecting on the significance of the occasion, he mentions that it's the 175th auction, and despite attending every year, he feels particularly nervous today. Alice then asks if items from the Tower of Trials will be featured, and he responds that, based on what he heard, the ichthyosaur's heart is set to appear in this year's auction. Excitedly, she asks if the ichthyosaur's heart will really appear. He explains that it's all thanks to the emergence of the Tower of Trials, and various ancient treasures are reappearing due to the mana wave or whatever. Despite knowing he probably won't be able to buy it, he expresses anticipation for the opportunity to see it with his own eyes. Suddenly, she senses a bad smell and covers her face. Concerned, he inquires about what's wrong. Julius Cedric approaches them, introducing himself and stating that he must have a vague idea, but as evident, he is the master of the person with him, referring to Alex Judro. Reflecting on the situation, Kang Jin Hayek thinks that his master arrived quickly, yet it seems he received a considerable beating, likely because he lost an elixir without achieving any results. Activating his eye of gluttony, Kang Jin Hayek checks Julius Cedric's status screen. He notes that Julius Cedric is a 58-year-old male with a level of 30, strength of 11, a magic level of 49, an evil rating of 25, and possessing 1,30,855 coins. Julius Cedric's unique ability is the Guardian of the Pyramid, and his skills include Level 6 Wailing Wall and Level 6 Commander's Order. He reflects that, as expected, Julius Cedric has a marvelous state, noting the unique ability that is well suited for a necromancer, providing good synergy. He recognizes it as an ability that is advantageous for the long run as it allows manipulation of many summons with little mana. Receiving a notification about the copy condition, he learns that Julius Cedric is in a furious state due to continuous failures from his subordinates. If Kang Jin Hayek completes his black magic education and receives an A+, he can copy Julius Cedric's unique ability or one of his skills. 
Annoyed by the seemingly complicated copy condition, he thinks that the system is becoming increasingly chaotic and decides to provoke Julius Cedric. He mentions receiving something valuable from his disciple during the flight and notes that it was quite a pleasant journey. Julius Cedric expresses relief at hearing that and brings up the reason for their visit to ask for information once again. Kang Jin Hayek inquires if they want to know about Unknown and Julius Cedric confirms, stating that it's something very important to them. Kang Jin Hayek acknowledges the straightforward nature of the old man and suggests discussing it some other time, given the pleasant place they are in. Meanwhile, Julius Cedric becomes angry, stating that, unfortunately, there is no other time and they must take care of this as soon as possible. Kang Jin Hayek asserts his independence, expressing that he missed the part where that's his problem, and walks away. Alex Judro abuses him from behind, prompting Alice to hear it and warn him. Julius Cedric intervenes by putting his hand on Alex Judro's shoulder, advising him to leave Kang Jin Hayek alone because they're still away. Alice finds the men irritating due to their smell and asks if she should erase them. Kang Jin Hayek advises her to leave them, as making a fuss won't lead to anything good. He suggests focusing on buying useful items and they both enter the auction hall. The auction host addresses the attendees, thanking them for waiting. Kang Jin Hayek mentions that it's starting and they proceed to their seats. The auction host announces the commencement of the 175th Black Market Auction, revealing the first item, a meteorite that landed in the state of Arizona. It's said to have emitted powerful mana ever since the Tower of Trials appeared, and the bidding will start at one lakh dollars. The bidding progresses as he announces an offer of one lakh and fifty thousand. Another bid comes in, raising it to two lakh. Kang Jin Hayek considers the current lack of artisans capable of working with meteoric iron. Thinking that, at the moment, there is no one who knows how to use it, he deems it the best time to buy it cheap and places a bid for 3 lakh. The auction host acknowledges the 3 lakh bid, prompting Kang Jin Hayek to calmly sit back, satisfied with acquiring meteoric iron at a low cost. However, Julius Cedric enters the scene and places a bid for $1 million. The auction host announces the $1 million bid, leaving Kang Jin Hayek shocked. He wonders if Julius Cedric will notice them, and the auction host inquires if anyone else is bidding. The auction host announces that the bidding for the sealed psychiatric ward catalog will now start at $100,000. Kang Jin Hayek placed a bid of $300,000, while Julius Cedric bid $1 million. Another man announces they have $1 million and suddenly triples the offer. The host asks if anyone else is bidding more, and after a few minutes, he declares that it has been sold to the old gentleman for $1 million. Kang Jin Hayek looks at Julius Cedric and thinks he knows. He's planning on buying everything bid for. That's how he will play. He smiles. The auction host announces that the next item has been found in South America, from the Maya civilizations. Kang Jin Hayek quickly bids $500,000, and the auction host states they have $500,000. Alice asks him if he's buying it without listening to its description. He replies wait, he has a plan. Julius Cedric bids $1 million again, and the auction host declares they have $1 million. Then he asks if anyone else is bidding more, and Kang Jin Hayek says $1.5 million, while Julius Cedric bids $3 million. The auction host announces they have $3 million and asks if there are any more bids. Finally, he says it's sold to the old gentleman for $3 million. Julius Cedric wonders if Kang Jin Hayek will look at him while the auction host announces the next item. Julius Cedric purchases it as well, along with some other things. The auction host mentions that the following article is also quite impressive, dating back to when Columbus discovered the new continent. Alex Judro asks Julius Cedric why they don't give up on something at least once. Julius Cedric replies that if he quickly gets something he wants, what would he do if they give up, and then proceeds to beat him badly? He thinks he has plenty of funds, although he's suffering some losses. He'll secure the items he's aiming for and exchange them for information on the unknown. The auction host announces that the following item is for true fans and introduces the first chessboard. 
Someone from the audience asks what they are supposed to do with a chessboard without any pieces. Another person suggests conserving their funds for the ichthyosaur's heart, which will come out later. Kang Jin Hayek bids 50000 for the chessboard. The auction host says they have $50,000 and the older man bids with $100,000. The auction host says he bid higher and they both continue bidding higher one by one until Julius Cedric makes the final bid of $8 million. The audience questions if there's something they don't know, calling it crazy to buy a chess board for $8 million. Kang Jin Hayek bids $10 million, then Julius Cedric laughs and says $30 million. He adds that $10 million seems to be all Kang Jin Hayek has, and he finally found what he wanted. He further states that Kang Jin Hayek must beg him on his knees if he wants this item. The auction host inquires if anyone else is willing to bid as Kang Jin Hayek contemplates that he has expended a significant amount of his funds, yet he still has a substantial amount left. He realizes he has more than he expected and needs a plan. Meanwhile, the auction host announces that the 56th auction item, the first chessboard, is sold to the old gentleman for $30 million. Suddenly, Alice stands up and declares a bid of $100 million. Julius Cedric is shocked and thinks $100 million for that chessboard and asks what the hell is with that brat. He believes he has already bought over $700 million worth of trash, and it would all be for nothing if he stopped here. Julius Cedric bids 110 million, but she counters with 200 million. Julius Cedric shouts at her to stop that foolishness and questions whether they expect him to believe they have 200 million dollars. The auction host addresses her, stating that it's not that he's doubting her, but that he can provide proof of balance. Meanwhile, she insists that they need proof and perform some magic, causing a considerable amount of gold coins to appear. She asks if this is enough, leaving everyone in the auction shocked. Park Hajin takes a crown from the treasure, checks it, and exclaims that it's unbelievable. He states that this crown alone is worth over $500 million. The older man thinks that the crown alone is worth over $500 million and wonders if she is not an ordinary human. However, he considers Kang Jin Hayek more dangerous, treating the girl as if she's his subordinate. He contemplates the possibility of a more troublesome enemy than unknown appearing and acknowledges that their plan has been overturned. Alex Judro suggests proceeding with plan B and walks to another side, mentioning that he has been waiting for him to say that while taking something of his pocket. The auction host congratulates Alice and assures her they will deliver the first chessboard. Kang Jin Hayuk expresses his gratitude but questions if it isn't too much. She responds that it doesn't matter, and she was thinking of clearing out his treasury anyway since it was so full. Moreover, she states she won't tolerate imbeciles looking down on her contractor. He thinks the girl is crazy and knows how to say some commendable things. Suddenly, an explosion occurs and a girl shouts that it's collapsing, urging everyone to evacuate. She insists they must escape, and everyone runs to save their lives. Alex Judro attacks them asking where they are all in a rush and declaring they are all precious sacrifices to be his materials. A kid falls and cries for help and Kang Jin Hayuk saves him. Kang Jin Hayuk is notified that Alex is activating the mana furnace and killing them while they all call for help. Kang Jin Hayuk tells him he has crossed too far beyond the line. Alex Judro takes the souls of people and transforms them into necromancers to destroy everything. Kang Jin Hayek sees them and comments on what a repulsive necromancer is. Alex Judro comes in front of them and asks how he can call these lovely beings despicable, stating that, as expected of an S rank, he could stand within this magic. He vividly remembers the humiliation he gave him on the plane and mentions that now that he has received the order to kill him, he no longer has a reason to hold back. He sends necromancers to attack Kang Jin Hayek but he escapes from the attack. Alex Jodro comments that he's quick on his feet and inquires about Alice, asking where the arrogant rich brat ran off to. Kang Jin Hayek responded that she hates disgusting things like these, so she ran away already. He thinks that her materialization was released because it became harder for him to maintain his mana within this mana furnace, and he realizes he's accumulating damage from the furnace. 
He looks at the necromancers and thinks that the longer this drags on, the worse it will be for him, and he'll end this as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, he activates his Grave of Swords while Alex Judro taunts him, saying wow, how surprising, he couldn't even see what just happened. However, he's enjoying himself quite a lot with this many materials and asks what business could be easier than this. He destroys the necromancers and builds stronger ones. He thinks he sees that he's planning on stalling for a time like this and continuing to raise as many monsters with the vitalities of those around him playing around with the opponent until their mana bottoms out, the standard battle style of a necromancer. He runs to attack them, saying he'd consider something like this his trump card and burn them all before they resurrect. He activates daylight, and the necromancers cry because of the daylight. Alex Judro says he knew he'd use that and thinks he knows all his skills from watching the martial arts tournament footage. He instructs the necromancers to disperse and attack before the light ray fully charges. However, he looks at the necromancers and wonders why they aren't moving, realizing their legs are frozen. He thinks Kang Jin Hayek used the flash of light to prevent him from seeing the use of an ice skill. Kang Jin Hayek spreads daylight everywhere, causing Alex Judro to fall. When he gets up and looks for his necromancers, he sees them dead and shouts that's impossible. Kang Jin Hayek approaches and taunts him to look at his precious darlings. Becoming angrier, Alex Judro tries to attack Kang Jin Hayek, but he quickly counters and throws a potion bottle at him, breaking it in the air. Alex Judro observes this and wonders how he lost, convinced he was the one at an advantage. He gets out of there and regroups with his master running away. However, Kang Jin Hayek attacks him from behind and states that this is how he's supposed to throw, stabbing him with his dagger. Kang Jin Hayek mentions that Alex Judro caused this considerable mess and now all he can do is run away. He informs him that he'll explain how he's going to die, stating that his lungs will slowly fill with blood over the next 30 minutes, and once his lungs are filled, he'll finally be able to die from suffocation. Meanwhile, he mentions that he heard the second most painful death after burning is probably suffocation. He adds that of course he can make it so that he won't have to suffer for so long and Alex Judro starts vomiting blood. Kang Jin Hayek states that if Alex Judro gives him information about the Daimonic Human Association, he can live, showing him the potion bottle. Alex Judro attempts to get up and speak, but he can't. Then he thinks he can't talk because his throat is blocked. If so, he decides to write and attempts to do so on the floor. However, Kang Jin Hayek puts his foot on his hand and says that if he doesn't want to tell him, then it can't be helped. Alex Judro thinks he never planned to listen to him in the first place. Kang Jin Hayek puts his hand in his pocket and says he guesses he won't need this anymore. He takes out his visiting card and throws it toward Alex Judro, saying he can have it back. Kang Jin Hayek adds that he's begging him to try to suffer for as long as possible before he dies and walks away. After a while, Kang Jin Hayek notices some treasure items. He receives a notification about a safe made by Michelangelo and the Ichthyosaur's heart. He considers that combining these items can create a large subspace inventory. He gets a notification that he has created a massive subspace inventory plus 5000 kg. The auction host comes and thanks him for saving them, and a kid, who is also with him, expresses gratitude. Kang Jin Hayek looks at the kid and realizes he is the host's son. He thinks he needs this item and contemplates what he should say to convince them to let him have it. He says it's not like he would take these items. The host replies that it's all right and mentions that he saw him before he completely lost consciousness. The host asks if he wasn't who saved them, and he hugs his child. He adds that he doesn't have even the slightest desire to report someone who saved his one and only son. Kang Jin Hayek thinks this is the first time, but it's not bad. The scene shifts to the third floor of the Tower of Trials Cathedral of Abhorrence, where Melina attempts to hide herself from arrow attacks. She questions why the security here is so annoying, expressing irritation at the repeated attacks. Lee Kao responds, telling her to stop complaining since he's already upset that the idiot Alex Judro is dead. She asks why he's upset, 
prompting him to suggest it wouldn't be a good idea for him if he doesn't want to die, and she places her dagger at his neck. Lancelot arrives at the scene and tells them to stop, stating that they, who have survived together for more than ten years, should not be at each other's throats. He takes them both with him to a church. Lancelot explains that the reason he called them there is because of the appearance of a new blacklisted player named Kang Jin Hayek. Meanwhile, Melina yawns and remarks that Kang Jin Hayek probably played some games before, but that doesn't make him any different from other rankers. Lancelot warns her not to get careless, emphasizing that Kang Jin Hayek could be someone who has advanced to a higher stage than them. She replies, questioning if he thinks so, primarily when their bosses are known to be determined to reach the twelfth floor of the tower. Lee Ko intervenes, stating that Lancelot's worries are excessive. He explains that they chose the Tower of Trials, an unpopular virtual reality world, to avoid the surveillance of the international police, so they know a lot about the tower, but Melina quickly cuts him off. She adds that other people don't have a reason like theirs and argues that even if someone has nothing else to do, there's no reason why anyone would continue to play that sadistic game unless there's some pervert. Lancelot thinks these two aren't taking the situation seriously, but they can understand each other. He reflects that they shouldn't underestimate Kang Jin Hayek and must eliminate potential threats. After a while, Lancelot states that he wants the two of them to follow Julius Cedric and assist him so that the plan doesn't go astray this time. He then disappears and Melina comments on what a worrisome older man he is. On the other side, Lee Timon and Yu Yonha practice a fight. She kicks him away, and then she asks if he's okay. He agrees, and they change and move to another room. He asks her to come and take a look at something. He shows her news about Unknown and mentions that he has been watching this guy for a while now, and something doesn't seem right. She asks if he isn't just an aggro like other guys. He replies that he could be, but something feels different about him. She questions if that's the man Face Tree's temple where the third floor boss is located, and he confirms that's right. He explains that the place was pretty famous in the past, and if he answers all three of his questions, he'll apparently give her an item with a unique ability as a reward. He adds that the real problem is that his questions are ridiculously difficult. Kang Jin Hayek approaches the man Face Tree while everyone watches the live video and comments. The tree remarks that it's been a long time since a human came to find him and asks if Kang Jin Hayek also came to answer his questions. Kang Jin Hayek replies affirmatively, telling the tree to give him his best shot. The tree agrees, stating that if Kang Jin Hayek can answer all three of his questions correctly, then he will receive one type of maple leaf. However, if he answers just one question incorrectly, he will be punished, and some giant monsters will appear behind Kang Jin Hayek. The tree presents the first question. What is the optimal depth and temperature for the seawater species Kelgorn to inhabit? Lee Timon comments, asking if the question is designed for Kang Jin Hayek to get it wrong, and Yu Yonoa questions who would know something like that. Kang Jin Hayek confidently replies that the depth is 175 meters and the temperature is 15 degrees and he asks for the next question. The tree however doesn't confirm whether his answer is correct. Kang Jin Hayek insists that he knows it's the correct answer and urges the tree to ask him the next question. After a while, the tree replies fine so this next question won't be as easy. It presents the second question. How can he take Felyanese's spongy body? Kang Jin Hayek confidently answers that all he has to do is slowly cook the sunlight desert salt and holy water of a priest who completed his second class quest under low heat for five hours, leaving Li Timon and Yu Yonhua shocked. The tree acknowledges that it's the correct answer. The tree then proceeds with the final question of whether the giant eagles of the sky plateau mate only once a year. When is that time? Kang Jin Hayek responds that it happens when the first snow falls on the tower. The tree becomes happy and congratulates him, stating that he's the first human who was able to answer all of his questions. Kang Jin Hayek mentions that it was pretty fun for him too, as he was able to talk about the tower after a long time and received many comments. 
the tree says all right and keeps its promise to give Kang Jin Hayuk the maple leaves he desires. It asks him to choose between red, yellow, and green leaves. Meanwhile, Lee Timon explains that red leaves have fire attributes, yellow leaves increase defense, and green leaves increase movement speed, that's what he heard. Yu Yonhua adds that since Kang Jin Hayuk will raid the third floor boss, he'll probably pick the movement speed, which is what she would choose. She suggests putting away those ordinary leaves and mentions that she wants something else. Kang Jin Hayek responds, asking for the hidden black leaves. The tree then inquires about the black leaves and questions how Kang Jin Hayek knew about them. The tree pleads with him, saying anything but that, and offers a deal. If he picks the red leaves, he'll also throw in the green ones. Kang Jin Hayek evaluated the offer and commented that it was pretty good. However, he reminds the man-faced tree that it said it would give him anything he asked for as long as he answered all his questions. He accuses the tree of trying to get around it. He sternly instructs the tree to stop wasting his time and demands the immediate appearance of the black leaf. He asserts that he's not attempting to tarnish the honor of the tree spirit and suggests that he wonders what will happen if he reports the tree to management. The tree becomes frightened and throws the black leaves. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification stating that, according to the tree spirit's honor, he has been given the reward. He checks the details of the black leaves, discovering that when used on a weapon or armor, the unique effect of corruption is added. This effect inflicts additional damage equal to 1% of the target's total health every 3 minutes when hit. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that with this, the final puzzle piece is ready, and he declares that it's time to go after dealing with those monsters first as he looks at them. The guards at the gate of the tower's third floor talk to each other. One mentions that Unknown has already started the third floor boss raid alone, and the other replies that it's sooner than expected. The first guard responds, saying that all they have to do is stand there for a while and then go home. The second guard questions if there's even a reason to guard this place, as no one is crazy enough to come here. The first guard insists they are just doing what they are told, and there must be a reason for all this. He adds that if they question everything, nothing will get done, asking if that isn't right. Suddenly, magic appears and they look around. The first guard asks where everyone went, and both are captured with magical restraints. Julius Cedric arrives, sees them tied up, and instructs them to save all their life forces, stating that they'll need as many as possible. He adds that they have more time to waste as the crazy one has already started. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek kills the guards and moves forward, receiving comments from people watching the livestream. He states that it doesn't matter whether they believe him and all the viewers are annoying, so they should just shut up. Some people ask if he's talking to them and send weird comments. He confirms that he is talking to them and suggests they watch if they want to. If not, they can leave. One person looks at his comment and remarks that it's common for most broadcasters to flatter their viewers to increase the number of views, but Kang Jin Hayek is showing a his way concept from the beginning, questioning what's up with him. He explains that a fandom is formed centered on the viewer who likes this kind of thing. As Kang Jin Hayek walks forward, he witnesses an explosion and wonders if someone else is present. He declares that this is the end of the broadcast, puts his hand on the camera, turns it off, and receives a notification that he has ended the broadcast. He walks towards a mountain and observes below, where Julius Cedric's soldiers and necromancers fight with statue guards. He thinks the demon bastards are evenly matched or slightly better. Julius Cedric's team leader comments that the soldiers are leaning towards their side, and another one urges them to push even more. He mentions they'll use this advantage to defeat Kyok. Suddenly, there's a long-range enemy attack, and Kang Jin Hayuk too attacks them. Julius Cedric's team leader commands them to bring up shields to defend against the attack. Kang Jin Hayuk wonders where it's coming from and identifies a guy in a mask. The team leader instructs them to hurry and get rid of him. They all throw arrows at Kang Jin Hayek runs and hides behind statue guards. Kang Jin Hayek is notified that he has activated the blessing of the stars and summons the necromancers. 
One soldier remarks that they can't control them because of the divine power and suggests focusing on trying to gain control of them. Meanwhile, the necromancers attack the soldiers. Another soldier reports that Julius Cedric's Team 3 has been destroyed. Julius Cedric becomes angry, stating that he can see without them telling him. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that to control these undead monsters effectively, he formed four teams, but now Team 3 is gone. If Team 1 is destroyed, the link they formed to control them will ultimately collapse. Kang Jin Hayek calls out, telling them to come over and questions if they think he'll be able to catch him when he's so slow. He receives a notification that battle-type Moe statues have appeared behind him. A soldier expresses concern, asking if that person is headed their way right now, while another soldier suggests they think he can't see them, so they should try to stop him. Kang Jin Hayat comes from behind both of them, puts his hand on their shoulders, and asserts that they can't stop him. They all run to save their lives when the Moe statues attack them. One of the soldiers reports that Team 1 is being destroyed, and they will be surrounded if this continues. Julius Cedric expresses his knowledge of the situation, becoming extremely angry. He questions Kang Jin Hayuk about his grievances with them and why he keeps disrupting their plans. Julius Cedric is notified that the Guardian of the Pyramid has been activated. One of the soldiers warns Julius Cedric that if he uses that skill here, he won't have enough mana to face the boss monster. Julius Cedric dismisses the warning, telling the soldier to shut up, as he intends to kill Kang Jin Hayuk using all his power to awaken his guardians. After using the skill, he sits down and a soldier approaches him, asking if he's alright. Julius Cedric admits he might have overdone it and instructs the soldier to come closer. The soldier complies and Julius Cedric absorbs his energy, causing the soldier to cry in pain. Julius Cedric tells him to stay still, mentioning that it'll be more painful if he keeps struggling. Kang Jin Hayek witnesses this and thinks Julius Cedric is crazy for absorbing his teammate. Julius Cedric completes the absorption, stating that he now feels better and asking if Kang Jin Hayek waited long. He declares that they can begin again. Julius Cedric laughs and boasts about his strongest army, stating that his mummy soldiers can use their steel-like bindings freely. He describes them as the most potent undead with defensive and offensive skills. Julius Cedric mentions that he had intended to save them for the boss fight, but he now believes it's worthwhile to kill Kang Jin Hayek here. Melina and Lee Ko arrive, and Melina comments that the masked individual is better than she expected. She remarks that it's been a while since she has seen Julius Cedric get so angry. Lee Ko acknowledges that Kang Jin Hayek was doing well initially, but his current actions are idiotic. He suggests that Kang Jin Hayek is miscalculating the difference between his and Julius Cedric's power. Lee Ko explains that Kang Jin Hayek probably thought Julius Cedric was someone he could fight after seeing the skeletons and the Death Knight. He concludes that Kang Jin Hayuk made a terrible misjudgment as Julius Cedric's innate ability is far more troublesome than those undead. Lee Ko states that he doesn't think they need to step up since it has come to this. She asks what happens when Kang Jin Hayuk attacks Julius Cedric's team. She recalls her experience at that time. The master appears and acknowledges that Kang Jin Hayuk's blade is intense and penetrating but the power disperses because he puts too much strength into it. Master demonstrates by using a rope, explaining that a real expert can cut with the same power, comparing it to how wind enfolds the air. He advises Kang Jin Hayek to handle it with tenderness and release it with strength at the right moment. Master then asks if Kang Jin Hayek is interested in learning his pendulum spirit sword arts. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that he has been able to imitate a portion of the Pendulum Spirit Sword Arts skill, and another notification that his mastery of the Pendulum Spirit Sword Arts skill has increased tremendously. Meanwhile, Julius Cedric observes the situation and realizes that the vortex of magic created by Kang Jin Hayek is powerful enough to draw in his surroundings, executing the Pendulum Spirit Sword Art's fifth move and the Pendulum Spirit Nirvana. This results in the demise of his mummy and undead soldiers. Julius Cedric quickly activates his double shield to protect himself. 
He wonders how Kang Jin Hayek became so strong in just half a year, and despite attempting to defend himself, he finds himself unable to withstand the attack. He contemplates the need to run, acknowledging that this is a fight he can never win. Desperately, he screams for someone to stop Kang Jin Hayek and protect him, giving orders to everyone. Kang Jin Hayek reaches the scene and comments on Julius Cedric's behavior, noting that once he realizes he's losing after being arrogant, all he tries to do is pathetically run away. Kang Jin Hayek adds that Julius Cedric probably learned this from him. In response, Julius Cedric acknowledges his identity, stating that he's Kang Jin Hayek. He confirms and replies, instructing Kang Jin Hayek to say hi to his disciple for him. Julius Cedric becomes angry and shouts at Kang Jin Hayek. In response, Kang Jin Hayek mentions that he thought Julius Cedric would be bored, so he sent his disciple and burned Julius Cedric with the element of fire, causing all his soldiers to disappear. One of his soldiers asks what's wrong with the summons, and another wonders if Sir Julius Cedric was defeated. Kang Jin Hayek mentions that suddenly using the pendulum spirit Nirvana at this level is exhausting, thinking he might have overdone it. He receives a notification that he has purchased four mid-tiered mana recovery potions. Kang Jin Hayek comments that it will still be a waste if he doesn't go all out, so he decides to use the potions. He notices a shield that flies all the way there, bringing back memories of playing with one in the past. He looks at a big statue and asks if it is the guardians of the temple, the four great heavenly kings. Kang Jin Hayek blocks the attack of that giant statue and says he loves that the guys are silent. He counterattacks them and says, spit out the key already because he's tired. They attack him again and he asks if they have a pattern like this. He sees a key appear in the hand of the stone pagoda of enlightenment and puts it in its keyhole. A huge plant appears. Kang Jin Hayek is notified that the key leading to the main room is reacting, and the being beyond the gate responds to the call. He says damn, he was more determined than he thought. He gets a notification that the monster thousand-armed and thousand-eyed Avalokitesvara is manifesting. He looks at the monster coming out of the huge plant. The thousand-armed monster says it's been a while since the four heavenly kings summoned him. It says a human among the invaders could even threaten the key within the stone pagoda. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek replies that it's nothing, and that he will slay the boss on this floor too. Monster Thousand Armed acknowledges his bravery if nothing else. Kang Jin Hayek replies that the monster must think he's joking and says let's end this. He's so goddamn tired. Monster Thousand Armed desires to chat with him longer, but he guesses their intentions are not mutual. Kang Jin Hayek says he's not into chit-chatting with statues and prepares to attack. Monster Thousand Armed remarks that every second is a gift and calls Kang Jin Hayek a foolish young man. It suggests savoring the moment because he'll long for even this moment when on the brink of death. The monster attacked, but Kang Jin Hayek managed to escape. He thinks that, as he thought, the monster's power is overwhelming. Even redirecting it makes his body feel like it's about to shatter, but he has to endure it. He realizes he only has one chance. Monster Thousand Armed says he'd react to a sonic attack and expresses increasing interest in Kang Jin Hayek. After a while, Kang Jin Hayek activates ice formation and attacks the monster. Monster Thousand Armed replies that he uses filthy western witchcraft and comments on how stupid Kang Jin Hayek is for using such a shallow trick. Kang Jin Hayek attacks him again. Monster Thousand Armed remarks that he's crazy for using two shallow tricks and asks what Kang Jin Hayek did. He looks at his arm, where Kang Jin Hayek stabs him with a dagger and says something like poison shouldn't work on him. Kang Jin Hayek explains that it's something called Blood Demon Kai, and he can deal a continuous amount of damage once he causes even one injury. Monster Thousand Armed replies that such a petty trick will not work a second time, and what will Kang Jin Hayek do by merely taking one arm from him? Kang Jin Hayek confirms and says taking a single arm from him is nothing if he wants to kill him. He puts his foot on that broken arm and says he also knows the same thing won't work twice on him, but does Monster Thousand Armed know that he got exactly what he wanted, holding a huge jewel? 
Monster Thousand thinks Kang Jin Hayuk was aiming for the arm, the jewel attached to from the start. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayuk blames himself for thinking that a single arm is insignificant. He combines the grimoire of the Feltaris Principality and Thousand Armed Avalokitesvara's jewel, creating the Lemigeton of the Golden Dawn, then checks its details. After that he thinks this is enough for the next step and activates his Eye of Gluttony. He checks Monster Thousand Arms' status screen, finding that his name is Thousand Armed and Thousand Eyed Avalokitesvara, whose unique ability is Mandala, and he can't check his skills. He receives a notification about the copy condition. Thousand Armed and Thousand Eyed Avalokitesvara is disgusted with Western magic which mocks the opponent for five minutes using ice magic and creates a large and beautiful sculpture for him. However, an appropriate song and attire must accompany the fulfillment of the condition. He asks if he's not seeing a song and a sculpture wrong. He thinks the system is growing increasingly insane by the minute and says okay he can do this much. The thousand armed monster looks at him and asks what he is doing all of a sudden. He replies that no matter how eccentric the condition is, he can't give this up, and this is the only place where he can obtain the mandala beneath the 25th floor after all. The thousand armed monster asks just what he thinks he's doing. He replies that he's begging him not to ask anything from here on out while singing a song and says he hates it too, while a long hair wig appears. The thousand-armed monster shouts how dare he play around in front of him and gets a notification that the thousand-armed Avalokitesvara is activating Mandala. He says he'll let him experience pain worth a million samsaras. At the same time, Kang Jin Hayuk activates his glacier formation to counterattack and says the advanced version of the ice formation sure is impressive. Melina and Lee Kao watch this duel between them and say they can't believe it. She remarks that he suddenly turned on music and is fighting the thousand-armed Avalokitesvara. She also can't believe he advanced his ice magic to this extent already. She questions why he is wearing a wig out of nowhere, speculating that it looks like a consumable wig from the coin exchange. Lee Kao thinks about what an unpredictable guy unknown is, challenging the thousand-armed Avalokitesvara right after killing Julius Cedric. He notes the overwhelming force of the thousand-armed Avalokitesvara that he can barely handle after getting past the tenth floor. He acknowledges that it's truly worth being called the third floor's second boss, but the person facing such a thing head-on has gone well beyond the realm of humans. She asks if he thinks they'd win if they teamed up. He replies that it'd be difficult. She suggests giving up, stating that they can't do this alone and need support from at least an executive. Lee Kao refuses and says that if they do that, the position they rose to after all this time will come crumbling down all at once. She asks if he wants to die just because he wants to keep his position. He replies that he thinks the time has come to use this and takes out a magical coin. Kang Jin Hayek also senses their appearance and thinks he would look at that. He believes it looks like Julius Cedric wasn't the only one sent by the demonic humans while trying to stop Monster Thousand Armed. Monster Thousand Armed asks how he dares look away from him. Kang Jin Hayek activates the element of fire and says sorry about that. He gets distracted, fixes his hair, and activates Glacier Formation, attacking him. He says thanks to him because he's feeling some tension. Monster Thousand Armed attacks him but he blocks all his attacks. Monster Thousand Armed becomes so angry and activates his inescapable lattice. He asks if he is defending all he can do and inquires where his confidence from earlier went. Monster Thousand Armed activates all his powers and the heaven and earth amalgamation skill attacking him. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayuk quickly activates Glacier Formation, building a shield around himself. Monster Thousand Armed says it's pointless resistance and expresses displeasure. He activates the swastika spear and attacks while saying Guanian Bodhisattva. King Jin Hayek stops his attack with Glacier Formation. Monster Thousand Armed looks at him and says such a petty trick won't work a second time. He quickly comes closer to him and says attacking him and turning him into ice works well. Using Glacial Prison, he locks King Jin Hayek in ice. 
He asks if he knows how much his hate for his ice magic saddens him and how someone said to have attained nirvana through self-discipline can be so prejudiced. Meanwhile, he touches that glacial prison and says there's nothing better than shock treatment for such an obsession. Monster Thousand Armed thinks he'll make him suffer endless pain in the Avasai, and adds that he'll make him reincarnate into a bug, a thousand times, no, ten thousand times over. He receives a notification that the condition has been fulfilled, and he has succeeded in copying Mandala's unique ability. He checks Mandala's details, a special ability that players who have learned Dharma can use. It allows the user to infuse extraordinary power into weapons and, through training the mind, may also use its effect to predict the direction of the opponent's attack. He gets another notification about saving the copied skill in the memory of the world. He tells Monster Thousand Armed not to waste his strength while removing his wig and walking away. Monster Thousand Armed shouts that it's impossible and questions how he uses that ability. Kang Jin Hayek activates the mandala, and Monster Thousand Armed asks how his likes could reproduce the mandala he created through endless days of perpetuity. Kang Jin Hayek replies that he will be using his mandala very well from now on, and he can screw off now. He uses his skills to remove Mandala from Monster Thousand Armed and break him into pieces. Kang Jin Hayuk receives a notification that he has leveled up and gained the Stone Statue's key, allowing him to summon the area's boss regardless of his progress. However, this can only be used on the third floor. He remarks that dealing with craziness is always tiring and thinks about facing Julius Cedric and Thousand Armed Avalokajvara, realizing it was a bit much. Kang Jin Hayek checks his status screen and finds that he is now at L strength, dexterity and health at 16, and magic at 71. His innate abilities include combine, sword cemetery, blessing of the stars, judgment, etc. He thinks he'll need more points in magic and, while looking at the status screen, receives a notification that his magic has risen from 71 to 77. He says he can finally breathe easy and mentions that he should store some mana replenishing supplies next time. Excitedly, he says that's right. Meanwhile, he mentions that he still has annoying things left to deal with and thinks the environment within the Tower of Trials is a bit unique. When night falls, the air temperature drops tremendously and the ferocity and attack power of the monsters skyrocket. That's why most players leave when night falls. He thinks they are looking for a safe place after stopping the hunt while he has dinner, eats shrimp, and receives a notification about a rare shrimp that can be caught in the river next to the Buddhist temple on the third floor of the Tower of Trials. He can't believe it's been so long since he has tasted this and it can only be eaten here. He thinks he should copy some cooking skills next time. Lee Ko and Melina come there and say that it smells good. She says they must also spend the night here and asks if it would be okay for them to join him. Lee Ko also thinks they should have left before night fell but couldn't. He replies sure has a seat and says he can at least share the fire. They both thank him and sit with him, introducing themselves, while Kang Jin Hayek replies that they look tired. They respond, don't even start, and mention they thought they'd die from the cold. Kang Jin Hayuk says he made a lot of food and asks what they think, if they would like some, and gives them some food. Lee Ko thanks him and says they are cautious of the food given to them by strangers, especially from those who cover their faces. He replies that it looks like he doesn't like his mask. Lee Ko asks if that isn't obvious and says one would wear one if they have something to hide. He replies that he can take it off if it makes them uncomfortable. They ask if he can do that and he replies that taking it off is boring, so why not play a little game? They ask what the game is, and he replies that since they are curious about one another, let's take turns asking three questions. After a while, he responds, stating that he will remove his mask if he answers their questions. Meanwhile, Lee Ko believes that answering his questions is inconsequential because he cannot ascertain the truth. She thinks he doesn't know what he's scheming, but she's confident there's nothing harmful for them. They both agree, and she tosses a coin in the air, suggesting they let the coin decide who gets to ask first. She calls heads and observes that they land as heads. 
she remarks that it looks like they win and senses faint magical energy resembling Caligula's coin. She contemplates infusing magic into it for five minutes, choosing a target and enabling him to control the mind of that target briefly. She then asks if he came with anyone, emphasizing that it's clear he won't disclose his name or affiliation. She considers this a practical question aimed at confirming the presence of any external variables. He responds, stating that he came alone and that it is his turn to ask. Meanwhile, he inquires if those guys look like they are also aiming for the boss. If so, why did they stand by and watch? He asserts that they must have seen him amid the fight. She responds, explaining that they were waiting for the right time for him to enter inside. Given the notorious nature of the place, they had to be cautious. Now it's her turn, and she asks why Mask Brother is climbing the tower, whether for money, fame, or something else. He speculates that they might be attempting to persuade him to join their side if the conditions align and suggests finding out if there's something he desires and if he's someone capable of fulfilling that desire. She assures him that if their goals align, there are many things they can accomplish together. He responds, then answers this last question. If she does, he'll remove his mask as promised. She agrees, asking what he wants to inquire. He states that the last thing he's curious about is whether they genuinely believe that the two of them from the Demon Society can defeat him. She acknowledges that he must have known their identities from the start, pointing out that it became apparent after witnessing his skills. She adds that he could have defeated Thousand Armed Avalokiteshvara alone, but overdid it. She reveals that they have already deduced his current weakness, so dealing with Mask Brother using just one of them will be sufficient. As she attacks him with a magical coin, she wonders why it's not working. Lee Ko questions her actions, asking if it's broken. He clarifies that Caligula's coin is in perfect condition. He disabled her magic. He receives a notification, Judgment of Anubis, which reduces the target's stats by 50% and limits the activation of skills and innate abilities for one minute. Meanwhile, Lee Ko exclaims that they've been discovered and they're moving to Plan B, so she should use her skills. She responds that she can't use anything right now. He asks why they are so flustered just as he receives a notification that the Shrine Spirits are sincerely satisfied choosing a champion to execute the judgment of Anubis, with Jang Xiang, Heaven's General, selected for the task. Another notification follows, indicating that Jang Xiang Hell's General has also been chosen as the champion. She expresses disbelief, noting that she has never heard of anything like the Guardian Gods of Earth, Heaven's General, and Hell's General. Li Keo speculates that the food was offered as a sacrifice to those spirits, awakening the Jiang Xiangs and suggesting that it wasn't just for consumption. He collapses for a moment to relax, stating that it's tiring. He suggests it might be a good idea not to move around recklessly since it's impossible to escape anyway. He is notified that Hell's General has activated prohibit entry and launches attacks on them. Meanwhile, Li Ko comments that these things will vanish if they kill him, urging them to die as he attacks. Despite his earlier instruction not to move, Heaven's General attacks him from behind, prompting him to shout. Another notification follows, stating that Heaven's General has activated exemplary punishment. Li Ko falls, and his magical coin also falls, causing Melina to look at him with fear. She says she told him they should have run away from the beginning. Kang Jin Hayek gets up, instructs his generals to stop, and suggests to her that since it seems they've more or less established the hierarchy, they should have a chat now. He receives a notification that he activates the Eye of Gluttony, but another notification follows, indicating that skill activation has been cancelled due to the level difference. He thinks the luck stat isn't activating this time, but that can't be helped. He expresses hope that he'll answer the question he's about to ask truthfully. She asks what he wants to know, and he responds that he knows about the demonic humans since he has heard a lot about them, but he doesn't know their motive. He points out that humanity will go extinct if they don't climb the tower, so why are they interfering with the players? She tries to explain, but Lee Ko interrupts, shouting at her to shut her mouth, insisting that she mustn't tell him anything. Heaven's general punishes him again, and he screams, falling in agony. 
Sitting at the edge of the pit, she acknowledges that it's commendable that he's trying to stay loyal, but he really should know the time and place for it. She asserts that it's her policy never to spare those who aim for her life, but she might let them live if they provide helpful information. She asks if he'll let her live, and he confirms that information from the inside is quite costly, though not as expensive as her life. She reveals that she doesn't know the actual name of the person who sent them to kill him, but they refer to that person as Lancelot. She mentions 11 other executives besides him, but she doesn't know much about them as she belongs to the assassination division. He activates the Eye of Gluttony and verifies that Melina's words are the truth, urging her to provide more information. She explains that the executives have stated that they can survive, even if humanity goes extinct, if he gathers all 12 cursed divine artifacts. They will receive enormous rewards for it. She adds that beyond this, she doesn't know anything else, this is all her information. He receives another notification confirming that her words are the truth. Meanwhile, he contemplates that this is probably the extent of what he'll be able to learn about Lancelot and the Twelve Cursed Divine Artifacts. He considers that they are even more deranged than he initially thought. The demonic human's objective seems to be summoning the Demon King, and he ponders the idea of them surviving, even if humanity goes extinct. He realizes he should factor this information into his future plans and expresses gratitude to her for providing helpful information, acknowledging that she was a great help. She asks if she can go now, but he refuses. Reminding him of his promise to let her live, she questions why he won't honor his word. He assures her not to worry, he'll keep his promise, but she has to sign a contract first. She asks about the contract, and he activates the brand of tribulation explaining that it's a contract stating she'll do everything he says from now on. She becomes frightened but thinks that it's a hundred times better than dying as long as she can live by entering into that contract with him. After a while, Kang Jin Hayek wakes up and notices a message accompanied by some comments stating that he will not be streaming the third floor boss raid. Checking the messages, he acknowledges that people must be upset since he previously mentioned streaming it. Moving forward, he looks at the stone statue's key and poses a question, asking if he should begin. He then enters the key into the portal gate, receiving another message that the stone statue's key is reacting. Observing the gate opening, he gets another message stating that the master of the third floor is answering his call. Stone guards emerge, and the third floor boss Muhan is seen enjoying a drink. He demands to know who dares to interfere with his break time. Kang Jin Hayek activates his Eye of Gluttony, nullifying the level difference with the luck and adaptivity stats. Checking Muhan's status screen, he learns that Muhan is at level 105, possesses the unique ability of a heartless army, and has numerous skills. Another notification follows, mentioning the copy condition, stating that copying special abilities or skills is impossible due to the level difference. Meanwhile, Muhan remarks that countless humans have challenged his army in the past, and Kang Jin Hayek is the first to call him using the key. He questions the whereabouts of Kang Jin Hayek's army while comfortably sitting on his commander's head. Kang Jin Hayek observes Muhan's one lakh stone statue soldiers and assures Muhan that his army will arrive soon. He then summons the first chessboard and activates it calling forth Tanonanti 851 mana-infused chess pieces. Muhan smiles at Kang Jin Hayek, commenting on the original idea. He acknowledges that Kang Jin Hayek could act as a one-man army with those pieces, but wonders what he can do with those little things. Kang Jin Hayek responds, asking Muhan to wait, as he's not done yet. He proceeds to use 2851 gigantification pills on the mana-infused chess pieces while Muhan calmly continues to drink. Kang Jin Hayek assembles his army and states that he must admit, he's not like the other humans who came before him, summoning 2851 giant chess soldiers. The scene shifts to Min Yung Wu and Park Hana crafting chess pieces. Min Yung Wu asks Li Yuri how many more they are supposed to make, and Park Hana adds that they should be given a specific number so they understand the task and why they are suddenly being compelled to make these pieces. 
Li Yuri performs a magic spell on the chess pieces and tells both of them that there's no time to complain. She activates her mana infusion spell on the pieces, mentioning that they have already made more than 2,000. She emphasizes the danger of incurring the wrath of the demon Kang Jin Hayek and states that now that they are in this situation, she puts the pieces into boxes. Li Yuri suggests they might as well show him they are on his side. On the other side, Kang Jin Hayek tells Miu Han that he acknowledges him, but considers the acknowledgement from a boss putting on airs on merely the third floor worthless. He remains seated on a horse as he delivers his statement. Miu Han questions what Kang Jin Hayek said, and Kang Jin Hayek responds by asking if he's incorrect. He asserts that Miu Han is on a high horse after only defeating a few weaklings, and that's why he stays on the third floor he's not strong enough to ascend any higher. Kang Jin Hayek reflects that the boss monsters of the Tower of Trials act as gatekeepers of each floor and exercise influence on the floor thereon. He contemplates the possibility that they can climb the tower like players to gain more power. Muhan laughs at Kang Jin Hayek's audacity, calling him an impudent human. He questions whether Kang Jin Hayek seriously thinks he can't overcome the fourth floor due to a lack of strength. He responds affirmatively, acknowledging that he's essentially a poltergeist stuck on the third floor. Muhan dismissively comments that he can keep babbling on as he likes, speculating that agitating his opponent must be part of his plan. Nevertheless, Muhan is determined to demonstrate the absolute difference in their forces and prove that the superiority of his tactics cannot be surpassed. Muhan orders his first squadron to move forward, observing them and surmising that it's an advance force of a thousand meant to assess his opponent's ability to make countermeasures. Activating the ability of the first chessboard, he increases the attack and defense power of all chess pieces in the field by 30%. He commands pawns at each end to move three squares forward and instructs all forces in the first row to prepare a line of defense. A notification follows, indicating that pawn chess pieces are activating iron perseverance. Muhan directs them to maintain the formation and endure until the end, while mutant soldiers attack them. Following this, Kang Jin Hayek orders his soldiers to fire, receiving a notification that rook chess pieces are activating arrow barrage and initiating a counterattack. He receives another notification that bishop chess pieces are activating flame strike and launches attacks on them. Observing this, Muhan acknowledges the annihilation of the advance force of a thousand units, stating that it's not bad. He then commands the second and third squadron to move forward. Additionally, he orders a hundred knight chess pieces to turn the enemy's flank. He receives a message indicating that knight chess pieces are activating wedge formation, increasing collision damage by 200% upon impact. Muhan expresses confidence that they'll break through in a flash while attacking the Heartless Army. Kang Jin Hayek continues moving forward, attacking the Heartless Army. Muhan observes him and acknowledges his adeptness as a commander, noting flawless transitions between attacking and defending and accurate timing of commands. However, Muhan questions the apparent opening left on their flank, deeming it too good to be true, like a poisoned apple. He then receives a notification that Muhan is activating weakness detection. Meanwhile, Muhan receives a notification that all chess pieces on the chessboard will stop if the crown is destroyed. It notes that only the king or queen can wear the crown, and their stats will increase by 100% in battle when they're not wearing it. Muhan considers that he can trounce them as long as he destroys the crown, expressing laughter at Kang Jin Hayuk's daring move. He comments on initially thinking that Kang Jin Hayuk made a blunder that not even novices would make but realizes that isn't the case. Alice arrives, noting that Kang Jin Hayuk is daring her to enter. Muhan orders scouts to move forward. Kang Jin Hayuk observes them, estimating there are around 3,000, including the 15-meter units, and anticipates that Muhan would aim for the headquarters as soon as he left. Kang Jin Hayuk shouts to ignore them, reasoning that the enemy's defense is 3,000 units weaker. Muhan thinks that Kang Jin Hayuk is well aware that this is a trap to draw him into attacking the crown by intentionally leaving a gap in his defenses. 
Both teams are trying to defeat each other as Muhan's soldiers reach near Alice. Muhan sees this and declares that it's over now. Muhan acknowledges that Kang Jin Hayek managed to crawl there, commending him for reaching that point with so few troops. Kang Jin Hayek, however, cuts through the pleasantries and asks why Muhan doesn't stop the nonsense, pointing out that he intentionally opened up a path for him. Muhan admits that he knew it was a trap and dismisses Kang Jin Hayuk's efforts, stating that he entrusted the crown to a scrawny girl and came with only that many troops. He declares his intent to finish the situation immediately and calls forth his two commanders, Vajriaksa and David. They step forward, with Vajriaksa questioning if the mundane world has no more decent and David noting the absence of anyone with perfect body proportions. Muhan looks at Kang Jin Hayek and criticizes him, asking if he is insane and questioning why he is smiling in such a situation. Alice expresses concern, asking if Kang Jin Hayek will be alright on his own. He responds by asking what she is worried about. Meanwhile, she gazes at him and expresses concern, stating that she is worried because that guy isn't the guardian of the third floor for nothing. He responds, noting that it's the first time he's seen her praise someone so much, and asks if she is implying that he's stronger than her. She becomes angry, questioning how dare he say such a thing, and asking if he's comparing this high noble of the night to those stone heads. She asserts that she would have dealt with them differently if only she weren't confined in that corridor. He then asks if he can leave things here to her, to which she replies affirmatively. She states that handling 10,000 of those stone heads is a walk in the park, even in her current state. He comments that he's sure a certain someone would be pissed off by what she just said. She activates blood spears and attacks Muhan's soldiers, expressing anger at their attempt to lay their hands on her head. She kills numerous soldiers and then activates blood explosion, commanding them to die as she attacks. She successfully eliminates them and stands on the head of one of the fallen soldiers. After a while, Muhan observes the shocking turn of events and asks what this is, questioning how such a feeble girl can possess such power. Kang Jin Hayek responds by telling him that his biggest blunder allowed him to get this close, assuming with certainty that his advanced troops could defeat the queen. Kang Jin Hayek then activates Blood Demon Kai and receives a notification that Black Leaf is reacting to Blood Demon Kai, granting a new item attribute. Another message follows, stating that Mental Breakdown deals continuous decay damage, rendering the attack target unable to distinguish friend from foe. Kang Jin Hayek throws his spear towards a soldier and summons them. Vajriaksa expresses his dislike for them from the start attacking David and criticizing his damn dandy face and smooth muscles, finding them unbearable. He proceeds to smash David's face, and the other soldiers also attack each other, resulting in casualties. Meanwhile, Muhan observes the situation and thinks that his army and tactics can't believe they're all being ruined by one man. Kang Jin Hayat calls out to him, telling him to stop freaking out, as it makes him look weak, and activates Glacier Formation. Muhan, realizing that the rear is blocked, deems it impossible. While holding an ice spear, Kang Jin Hayek questions where Muhan thinks he's going and runs after him, ordering his soldiers to stop him. One of Muhan's soldiers punches the floor, throwing away Kang Jin Hayek and his army. Kang Jin Hayek quickly activates Mandala, criticizing the soldier's habit of leaving everything to his subordinates after being driven into a corner and notes that it's the same as always. He receives a notification that Glacier Formation and Mandala are resonating with each other and attacks Muhan with an ice spear, declaring checkmate. The spear stabs Muhan's soldiers and reaches him, stabbing him as well, prompting him to scream. A notification follows, stating that the third floor boss monster Muhan has fallen, and the fourth floor of the Tower of Trials is opening. Park Hana and Li Yuri also receive that notification and become ecstatic. Another message informs them that the time left to conquer the next floor is 89 days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. Maria, Beek Jinho, and Teresa also receive the message, along with another one stating that the third floor of the Tower of Trials has been successfully conquered. Kang Jin Hayek receives notifications repeatedly indicating that he has leveled up. 
he allocates all his stats to mana and says, let's go and get his rewards. Reflecting on the treasures he can earn from killing a boss monster, he notes that their colors can distinguish them. The rewards from the 10th floor and below are all red. The lowest rank, but this time, an orange rank has appeared. Kang Jin Hayek attributes this to the effect of Monopoly, where he can get the best reward possible if he hunts alone. Opening the reward, he receives a message indicating that he has acquired a pink diamond, top priority ticket, squishy grain, natural water, solar seed, and a fire-spitting snail. Delighted, he exclaims wow, what a haul and gazes at something, pondering whether it is the Eclipse Stone. He considers the Monopoly effect insanely beneficial and anticipates scoring big when conquering the fourth floor. He remarks that he can never get used to that face while Alice looks at him. Meanwhile, Patrick expresses that he truly succeeded, prompting Beak Jinho to laugh and declare it the birth of a hero. Maria expresses gratitude, saying they bought 90 days worth of time for the next floor, and emphasizes the need to prepare properly for the fourth floor. Ten Y interrupts her, expressing disbelief that she's thanking God and asserting that raids like this won't benefit them. He proclaims that he's going to get all the views on his videos from now on. Teresa questions what he is talking about, stating that they were the ones who almost joined forces with the demonic humans after continuously failing the raid. She points out that, thanks to him, humanity obtained 90 days worth of time without the demonic humans' help. Teresa asks how he could say something like that about someone who helped them in such a crisis and urges Maria and Beak Jinho to speak up. She looks at them, but they remain silent. Then she asks if they are all serious and questions whether they really feel the same way as Ten Y. She urges them to say something and states that it can't be helped. She declares that she will withdraw herself from the conference from today onwards, while they all look at her. Maria asks what she is talking about and suggests that she think it over again. She acknowledges how hard she worked to get her in here. Patrick adds that the conference is not a group she can just enter and leave as she pleases. He emphasizes that it's a super elite group that only allows entry to people most adequate in saving humanity and notes that once she leaves, she can never come back. He questions if she really trusts that man to that extent while she walks out, responding affirmatively with her life. The scene shifts to Kang Jin Hayuk, who walks on a beach and contemplates having tons of money. When his phone rings, he wonders if he should try staying at a luxury hotel, and he checks that Yu Yonoa is calling him. He receives the call and asks if she called because he was in the tower and couldn't pick up earlier. She informs him that her grandpa isn't opening his eyes. Kang Jin Hayek asks about her location. He reflects on Yu Yonhua, also known as Bolguang Nuclear Fist, who is the granddaughter of Yu Chenyong, the legendary martial artist at the peak of the South Korean martial arts world. He notes that it's the first time he has seen Yonhua, who is always challenging, cheerful and bright, make such an expression. Kang Jin Hayek reaches her place and observes her crying. He asks if she can tell him what happened. She mentions that she thinks it started happening not long after the Tower of Trials appeared and inquires if he remembers the outbreak in Incheon. Kang Jin Hayek recalls the time when he and Park Hana were in the labyrinth and states that he saw it on the news. Meanwhile, she explains that her grandpa was on the scene during the outbreak. Although her grandpa, who awakened during the outbreak, succeeded in subjugating the monsters, he couldn't fully recover after getting badly hurt that day. She looks at her grandpa and notes that his condition has gotten worse recently. Kang Jin Hayek looks at the grandpa and realizes that this person is Yu Chunyong, the man who used to be called the strongest man in Korea. He checks his status screen, revealing that Yu Chunyong is a 78-year-old male with a level of 5, an immortal energy of 103, a unique ability called Formless Teiji, and skills including level 13 True Heaven Flower Cultivation Techniques and level 12 Refusal to Retreat. He receives a notification about the copy condition, stating that Yu Chenong's death is almost inevitable, and if he saves his life, he may copy one of his skills. He contemplates whether he is seriously someone who has never entered the tower. 
At the same time, a rank healer Hyo Jinsu questions Yu Yonhua about her abrupt departure and bringing a celebrity who knows nothing but how to fight. He asks Kang Jin Hyuk if he doesn't understand why he is here and asserts that even an S-rank awakened wouldn't be able to do anything in this situation. Kang Jin Hyuk replies that he has known Yu Yonhua for a long time and came to see if he could do anything. Hyo Jinsu checks Yu Chinong and expresses relief mentioning that he almost came to a misunderstanding. He adds that he was nervous about the famous Kang Jin Hayuk laying hands on even the world of healing. Hyo Jinsu asks how frustrated Kang Jin Hayuk must be to bring him here. Yu Yonua questions Hyo Jinsu, stating that the most excellent experts in the field are looking after her grandpa, but he isn't showing any signs of getting better. Hyo Jinsu replies that they are doing their best while cleaning his glasses but emphasizes that they are severely lacking in time to research every disease caused by the Tower of Trials with their current medical expertise. He urges her to understand that they are doing their very best. Meanwhile, she apologizes, acknowledging that she let her emotions get the better of her. Kang Jin Hayek activates his eye of gluttony while she suggests leaving so the doctors can focus. She reads the mind of Hyo Jinsu, who suddenly wonders why an ranker is here. He contemplates their successful endeavors and expresses fatigue, questioning how long they must keep pretending to treat him. Kang Jin Hayek thinks about the leeches in the room. Hyo Jinsu comments that the elder's cultivation technique and the tower's mana collide, causing this state of cum. Hyo Jinsu proposes a treatment method involving magic crystals, they're researching but mentions that the material costs are pretty expensive. She reassures him not to worry about the money, expressing her willingness to prepare it even if she has to sell the entire dojo. She declares that she doesn't care as long as her grandpa can fully recover. Hyo Jinsu acknowledges her sentiment. Kang Jin Hayek questions Hyo Jinsu, asking what kind of nonsense he is spouting to scam her, calling him a thug. Another healer queries Kang Jin Hayek about his accusations, wondering what he means by scamming and if he is insulting them. Hyo Jinsu responds that it is very unpleasant, even if Kang Jin Hayek is the young lady's guest and he cannot spout whatever he wants. Hyo Jinsu wonders if Kang Jin Hayek is trying to provoke him. Noting that even if they're caught, there's no way he can find out about the seven borrowed name accounts and crypto wallet, even if he's a god. Kang Jin Hayek expresses his disbelief, questioning how far he has gone with borrowed name accounts and even a crypto wallet. Yu Yonhua asks Kang Jin Hayek to clarify his statement. Hyo Jinsu intervenes, shouting that it's a bare-faced lie and demanding proof for the accusations. Hyo Jinsu wonders about Kang Jin Hayek's knowledge and whether he knows about their contact with the Black Cloud Guild and the Resident. Kang Jin Hayek thinks about their connection with the Black Cloud Guild and the Resident, pondering why a Tower Resident would make contact with a human. Kang Jin Hayek thinks he can't believe Hong Diokpio would make contact with a Resident. In the eyes of the residents, humanity is viewed as outsiders that threaten the tower, and he wonders what they are thinking. Yu Chunong starts vomiting blood, and Yu Yonghua shouts Grandpa. Hyo Jinsu tries to run out, but she blocks his way and asks where he thinks he's going. Since he's running, he must be hiding something. She adds that if Grandpa passes away, he had better give up on getting out of there alive. Kang Jin Hayek tells her to calm down, emphasizing that the elder's treatment comes first. Hyo Jinsu acknowledges he's right, mentioning he's just trying to get seizure medication. She questions why he is acting like this all of a sudden and says it's thanks to them that Yu Chinong's condition is only this bad. Kang Jin Hayek remarks that he's still spouting nonsense after getting caught and tells Yu Yonhua to kick him just once. She promptly kicks him away. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek comes closer to Yu Chunyong and thinks it's mana congestion disease and it's severe. An average person would have died a long time ago. He believes he can't let him die and retrieves an elixir while Hyo Jinsu looks at him. Kang Jin Hayek says he guesses he's not a complete quack and asks if he knows what this is while showing him the potion. He intended to use this only when necessary, setting aside his long-standing friendship with Yu Yonhua. 
He thinks there's no way he'd let a chance to copy a skill from a big shot like Yu Chinyong slip by and pour the entire potion on him. He receives a message that the elixir is being absorbed and Yu Chinyong starts recovering. After a while, she looks at him and becomes so emotional. Kang Jin Hayek receives a message that the condition has been fulfilled and he has successfully copied the true heavenly flower cultivation technique. He checks its details, discovering that it's a cultivation technique developed by Yu Chinyong. This technique can absorb mana from the atmosphere, and once used, it increases mana's recovery speed by 30% and can make the body appear young just from learning it. Hyo Jinsu initially thinks it can't be cured, but Kang Jin Hayak has healed him. He informs his subordinates that they have to get out of here. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayak kicks Hyo Jinsu from behind and comes closer to him, saying screw off and let's talk to him and him. Kang Jin Hayek takes him to another room and throws him on the floor, asking what he is going to do to him and if he is going to kill him. Kang Jin Hayek replies that no, he doesn't kill people just because they scammed someone out of their money. He adds that he'll let him go if he returns all the money he scammed. Meanwhile, Hyo Jinsu asks if he'll let him go if he returns the money. He replies that's right, and it's not a bad deal. He says he'll put in a good word to Yu Yonawa, so she shouldn't worry either. Hyo Jinsu thinks it's getting resolved too quickly, sensing something suspicious. He asks if he wants to live, transfers money to Yu Yonghua's account, and runs away, thinking he's alive. Kang Jin Hayek looks at him while running, and Alice asks him if he will let him off like that, saying it's unlike him. He replies of course not, and tells her to follow him to find out who he goes to see. She asks if he let him go on purpose. He confirms and tells her she won't get anything useful from a drag like him. He says it's better to use him to find out where their base of operations is and instructs her to go if she understands. She goes away while he says not to stray off anywhere. She laughs and says okay. He also goes inside Yu Yonhua's house and asks her if she can give them a minute because he needs to confirm if the elixir was correctly absorbed. She says okay to call her when he's done and then goes out. He tells Yu Chinong that everyone's gone now and he quickly opens his eyes. Yu Chinong says he knows it but he thought he had hidden it entirely and asks if his breathing was that awkward while getting up. He replies no, it was perfect, sir. Then Yu Chinong says he's sorry, he didn't intentionally try to fool him. He replies that it's all right and says he fully understands him for being wary of someone who appeared out of nowhere and treated a disease that no one else could treat. He would have done the same. Yu Chinong laughs and asks how he can figure out how someone feels so well. He says he guesses what he was thinking so accurately that he has nothing to say now. He replies that he's happy to see him healthy and mentions that Yu Yonhua was worried about him. He adds that she was concerned that she called him when she usually doesn't ask for help. Yu Chinong says he sees, so he's friends with his granddaughter. He replies that there was something he wanted to ask him when he woke up. Yu Chinong responds that he's his lifesaver, so he'll answer anything he can. He asks what happened during the outbreak. Yu Chinong says it all happened while he was heading to a conference. He recalls that something appeared in front of their car and asks why this thing is here in the world. He sees many crab monsters attacking people, but he quickly saves a guard and asks him to evacuate the people, saying he will keep those creatures at bay. The demonic man comes there and says he sees some helpful people among the outsiders. Well then, let's play. Yu Chenung attacks monsters and kills them while he thinks he can more or less take care of these giant monsters, but his fists aren't reaching this man. He looks at that demonic man and the demonic man attacks him, but Yu Chenung can't defeat him. Yu Chenung says that's his last memory and mentions he has never seen someone have command over such a swift sword. Kang Jin Hayek thinks about who that long-haired person with Asian attire is. If the Elder is telling the truth, then the Miram faction that rules over the 21st floor has started to move in an unpredictable direction. He thinks they would use any means necessary to get what they wanted and reflects that he had a hard time because of him, even when he was playing the game. 
He contemplates what they could be planning for them to go as far as to pry their way into reality and states that the man who attacked him is one of the tower's residents. Yu Chinong asks who the tower's residents are. He replies that he never expected them to come out of the tower and things might get more complicated than he expected. Yu Chinong asks if he said he has known Yu Yonhua for a while. He replies yes, it's been quite a long time. Yu Chinong laughs and says to proceed with his marriage to his granddaughter immediately. He replies that he and Yu Yonhua don't have that sort of relationship. Yu Chinong says one thing he's sure about is that, as he aged and some things got better, even if he didn't want them to, his eye for people improved. Yu Chinong says there's a saying that one needs to dedicate at least 10,000 hours to a field to know it honestly, and he doesn't think that's wrong either. Kang Jin Hayek gets a notification that playtime is 50,000, 125 hours, and says that only a few months after the tower appeared, the ones who are the most overestimated are those awakened or whoever calls themselves experts. Yu Chenxiang says however, there's something different about them and mentions, how should he say it, it's like they have been endlessly tempered. He can see they know the bitter taste of victory and defeat through all kinds of hardships and how seasoned they have become through overcoming them. Kang Jin Hayak says he's overpraising him, while he replies that he's also humble. However, he can't hide the composure that seeps out naturally. He says he'd like to repay his life's savior somehow and asks if there is anything he wants. Kang Jin Hayek thinks about a favor from the most influential martial artist family in South Korea and says he wants something, asking if he can ask for anything. Yu Chenong says not to worry and tell him. Yu Yonhua enters and asks how grandpa is and if he is alright now. He replies that the elixir has been adequately absorbed and says he'll fully recover in a few days. She expresses relief and asks how she can repay him for this. He reassures her, saying it's all right, and the elder has already expressed more than enough gratitude. Yu Chenjong becomes emotional, stating that he can't believe he asked him to give him that. Kang Jin Hayuk reaches the 101st floor, gazes out the window, and reflects on the benefits of having money. He acknowledges the luxurious setting, calls room service, and orders food. As he enjoys the meal, he comments on the incredible flavor, emphasizing how nice it is compared to when cup ramen was his only option. He mentions that people used to pay to watch him eat, and Yu Yonhua responds, noting that he sure is eating deliciously. The news segment broadcasts an invitation to an expert in tower conquest for Beyond the Tower of Trials, featuring a ranker from Korea's strongest guild, Dangun Jang Yunsiak. The audience is encouraged to welcome him with warm applause. The news reporter asks Jang Yunsiak what he thinks is the key to climbing the tower. Jang Yunsiak responds, stating that the most crucial factor in climbing the tower is initially becoming stronger. He explains two primary ways to enhance strength in the Tower of Trials. He continues, mentioning the first and widely known method, which involves increasing skill levels and personal levels. When asked about the second way, related to using coins, he confirms that he refers to the currency exclusive to the Tower of Trials. Jang Yunsiak elaborates, emphasizing that having the purchasing power to acquire superior items is one of the most effective ways to become a ranker. Drawing a comparison, he notes that if the dollar was the key currency that made the world go round until now, then coins will play the same crucial role. Regarding the fourth floor, which has recently opened, Jang Yunxiak shares information about the third floor's apparent privileges. He mentions that the person who clears the third floor is given the right to be the first to enter the fourth floor. He describes the fourth floor as a unique dungeon featuring hundreds of large-scale waves. He reveals that the key to clearing this floor is to occupy a base in the field and protect it until the end. He explains that the issue lies in the fact that if all the players who entered fail to defend the base, the entire fourth floor will be sealed for 20 days. She asks if he won't be able to enter for 20 days, and he responds that there is a massive risk of calamity if each floor isn't cleared within 90 days, and not even the unknown will be able to announce his entry so recklessly. She inquires whether humanity will honestly face extinction after 90 days pass. 
He replies that he believes the tower's system possesses an absolute right to exercise over the world's rules. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek takes a shower while listening to the news. The news reporter mentions Jiang Yunxiak and how he could assert that it can ignore the law of causality. Jiang Yunxiak responds, considering that it is highly likely that humanity could become extinct, and he walks out with a girl. She asks if he's free for a month, and he replies, of course. She expresses her concern that even a month out of the 90 days will be barely enough time to prepare for clearing the floor. He suggests going somewhere lovely for about a month, to which she agrees. Meanwhile, he receives a message that Player Unknown has announced the start of the fourth floor conquest. The message urges all players who will challenge the fourth floor to prepare, as the first wave will begin in eight hours. While driving, he receives the notification and suddenly stops the car. Jang Yunxiak declares an emergency, instructing the gathering of all the rankers. He is inundated with numerous messages, realizing they only have eight hours and nothing is prepared. He wonders what unknown is thinking to pull something like this. In the morning, Kang Jin Hayek remarks that he slept like a baby and Alice also wakes up. He asks her if they should head out now, receiving a message that the time until the first wave begins is 1 hour, 37 minutes, and 51 seconds. Kang Jin Hayek thinks it's the fourth floor of the Tower of Trials, with hundreds of waves of normal and special zombies. He believes there are only two ways players can block them. They can either optimally set up thousands of defense tower combinations or choose a base that can be defended efficiently. He thinks that this is not easy for average players. While thinking about this, he receives a message stating that he's the first to enter the fourth floor of the Tower of Trials, and other players may enter the fourth floor in 20 minutes. He remarks that this place is as dreary as always and mentions that 20 minutes isn't enough, so he should hurry. Upon reaching the Sangam World Cup Stadium and using a high-priority base ticket, he gets notified that Sangam World Cup Stadium has been selected as his base. He proceeds to spread squishy grain, plant five solar seeds, and use natural water, which increases plant growth speed by 20%. He comments preparations are complete, let's head back. Meanwhile, he observes that some other players have also reached the starting point of the fourth floor. He seated himself against a wall and notes that the most famous large guilds are participating. Li Timin and Yu Yonghua also arrive and greet him. Teresa also arrives and greets him, surprising Li Timin and Yu Yonghua. She reassures them not to be surprised as he calls her here. Kang Jin Hayek descends and apologizes for calling them all here suddenly because things progressed faster than expected, leaving him with no time to explain. Li Timin responds, saying they'd naturally come when he calls them. Teresa adds that she doesn't mind either since he's not affiliated with anything anymore and being together is better. Another player looks at them and exclaims look over there, it's Yu Yonghua and Li Timin, and his partner girl mentions that Teresa is next to them too. She expresses disbelief that she's seeing Teresa in person, mentioning that she subscribed to her YouTube but can't believe she's seeing her in person. Surprisingly, he remarks that the person next to them is Kang Jin Hayek, the new top-class star who has emerged in Korea. He notes that such stars are not numerous, but the lineup is impressive. Kang Jin Hayek inquires if they have all come prepared. Yu Yonghua responds affirmatively but expresses concern about whether it will be sufficient given the insane number of zombies in this floor's waves. Lee Timin mentions that his ability to control summons isn't very high, so it will be difficult. Kang Jin Hayat counters, asking if a bit of difficulty isn't what makes it fun. He points towards the stadium, stating that he deliberately chose it as the base. Yu Yonghua asks which stadium and clarifies that he doesn't mean the Sangam Stadium, hoping he hasn't picked that one. Lee Timin comments that they would need at least a hundred people to defend such a huge place, while Yu Yonghua questions what he means by fun. She asserts that this isn't a game anymore, and they will die for real if they die here. Lee Timin responds, saying he can tell from his face that he still has his old habits. Teresa comments that he's acting like a pervert and advises him not to be so stressed. 
She suggests that a place like the stadium is perfect for horde hunting. Yu Yonghua responds that it's only possible for her and hard for them. Teresa then asks if she can also inquire about something, and Kang Jin Hayek asks what it is. She mentions hearing that he needs at least five people to defend a base, but he knows that only four are here. Kang Jin Hayek replies that she's right and assures her not to worry about it, as the last one will be here soon. Cheng Yusung arrives and declares that he'll kill Kang Jin Hayek. Kang Jin Hayek recalls receiving a message to run over to the starting point of the fourth floor within an hour, finding it hilarious. He thinks there's no reason to go just because he said so. He then receives another message stating that if he comes now, he'll face him without using his left arm and right leg. Kang Jin Hayek thinks it's an obvious taunt, superficial and childish, and believes he'll only be dancing in the palm of his hand if he takes the bait while practicing with his sword. Meanwhile, he agrees, stating that he'll even have his eyes closed deal. He thinks of enduring it, using this rage as fertilizer for his future revenge. He believes he'll kill him and walks toward Kang Jin Hayek. Kang Jin Hayek acknowledges his arrival, calling him over and noticing the sword in his hand. He identifies it as an attribute sword that compensates for the weakness of swordsmen in long-range battles by infusing elemental magic into the weapon. Kang Jin Hayek anticipates getting his hands on that sword and wonders how predictable he can be. Cheng Yusung questions if he's a chicken, stating that he'll show him right there whether he is. Kang Jin Hayek responds that it's good to prove him wrong, but mentions that he will fight him with that incomplete sword. Cheng Yusung asks what he means, and Kang Jin Hayek clarifies that an attribute sword isn't evil, but needs to be completed to display its full power. He further explains that the random box appearing on this floor includes the item that can complete the attribute sword and asks if the fire attribute is what he wants, showing him the mystery box. After a while, Chin Yusung shouts stop bluffing. It's a random box, just as its name suggests it's random. He emphasizes that they never know what will come out of it. Kang Jin Hayek replies, asking if he doesn't already know that he prefers abnormal shortcuts. He offers to give that to him if he participates in the defense, suggesting they agree to fight after he completes it. He asks how about it. Chin Yusung looks at his sword and demands that the item come out of that random box. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that a five-member party has been established and the minimum number of members for the base defense has been fulfilled. Teresa asks if it will be okay to be on the same side as Chin Yusung like this. Kang Jin Hayek responds that he probably won't stab him in the back until he gets what he wants, mentioning that he may look like that, but he surprisingly has a pure side. Yu Yonghua agrees, saying that she almost forgot, and gives him swords, saying take these twin dragon swords. He thinks he knew that the artifacts of the past gained enough mana to rival divine artifacts due to the Tower of Trials, but it's even more impressive after touching them. She says her grandpa asked her to deliver these to him and mentioned that he greatly values them. She asks how he got them. He replies that he thinks he's taken a liking to him personally. He takes out the sword and sees a tag of dowry, thinking that the old man sure is consistent with his jokes. He informs them that they're here, and this is their base. Yu Yonghua expresses disbelief that they're supposed to defend this massive base with just the five. Chen Yusung comments that he's peerless as always when it comes to thoughtlessness. Kang Jin Hayek reassures them, saying he has a plan, so there's no need to worry. Nam Goong arrives and remarks that he wondered who made the stadium their base, realizing it was these guys. He looks at Kang Jin Hayek and says so it was him. Kang Jin Hayek looks at his sword and wonders whose guild pattern it is. Kang Jin Hayek thinks about that emblem, he's sure of it. He believes it's one of the symbols of Miram from the 21st floor of the Tower of Trials. First, the Black Cloud Guild, and now the Triad, it looks like it's true that the residents are reaching out to people outside of the tower. A person with black glasses asks if he is Kang Jin Hayuk. He replies that's right, it's him. Namgung introduces himself, while Kang Jin Hayuk annoyingly says he doesn't care if he's here to introduce himself, forget it. He mentions that he already knows how foolish the Namgung noble clan is. 
Namgung asks what did he say? Teresa asks Kang Jin Hayek what's wrong, what the Namgung noble clan is, and if he is acquainted with them. He replies that he used to know them and thinks the Namgung noble clan is one of the famous sects of the Murum world on the 21st floor of the Tower of Trials. He believes they may be thoroughly trained elites, but they're nothing but a gang of arrogant fools. Namgung becomes very angry and asks if he knows who he's talking to. He demands to know how dare he look down on the Namgung noble clan, threatening to destroy three generations of his entire family. Kang Jin Hayek replies that he can do without those threats. If that's what Namgung will say, that kind of third-rate phrase is boring. He questions whether the Namgung clan actually has any leftover pride to protect and suggests that all they have going for them is their name now. Namgung expresses disbelief, stating that he doesn't know how Kang Jin Hayek knew, but he dared not insult the Namgung noble clan. He takes out his sword. Kang Jin Hayek checks Namgung's status screen, revealing his name as Namgung Hayun, age 22 male. His level is 68, strength is 36, dexterity is 48, health is 37, and magic is 35. His innate ability is the body of a sword god, and he has level 11 infinite steps skill, level 14 form of the emperor's sword skill, and level 12 blade of the lone soul skill. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification about the condition for copying the skill. It states that he has met a resident of Miram, and he, along with the other residents who came with him, have currently hidden themselves inside the triad. He may copy any skills he desires if he can identify them all. Meanwhile, he thinks that there are other residents here besides Namgung Hayan, so just picking a fight with them won't be good enough. Teresa asks Kang Jin Hayek what they should do now. He thinks he doesn't care about the condition, all he needs to do is copy the skill. He says they gotta get ready for a fight of course. Namgung instructs his team to cut off all their limbs. Lee Timin tells Yu Yonghua to take care of the left side, and she says it looks like she'll be able to loosen up her body after a long time. Lee Timin activates his Lord of Machines skill, and mechanical summons are materialized. She activates her Never Retreat in Battle skill, and she gets a notification that the damage received will decrease by 15% as long as she doesn't retreat. Teresa says she will take care of the back, while Chin Yusung says to Kang Jin Hayek that he has always felt this, but he really lives life without looking in front or behind him. He replies that he needs about three minutes and asks if he thinks he can hold for that time. After a while, Chin Yusun questions what he says about just three minutes, stating it won't even take him that long since he'll take care of them all on his end. Teresa activates her strength in divine power and song of battle. Yu Yonghua receives a message that all stats will increase by five for ten minutes and says this is nice, so eat this, then attacks them with small missiles. Teresa also runs to attack them, while Namgung's team members comment that they are crazy and those bastards are strong. Chin Yusung quickly attacks and kills them, remarking that it looks like there aren't only weaklings. He moves forward to fight Namgung Hyun, who looks at him and says that's a pretty good reaction speed, guessing that he's entirely trained in the sword. However, he adds that they're swinging the sword without any fundamentals. He states that he'll kindly show them what real swordsmanship is with their clan's sword arts and activates form of the Emperor's sword. He attacks Chen Yusung, who tries to defeat him, thinking the swings are heavy compared to the triad because he's on a different level. They both try to defeat each other, but Chen Yusung is unable to handle those swings. Teresa quickly comes there and blocks the swings, while Kang Jin Hayek also moves forward and says nice timing Teresa. He tells Chin Yusung that three minutes are over, and he activates his fire element. He captures Namgung with fire, and Namgung says it's a cheap trick, planning to run somewhere he can't escape from and pierce him in midair, but his legs start freezing. Kang Jin Hayek says people have a tendency to not check places they've already cleared, stating that it's obvious since he didn't check where the fire went out. He activates the daylight skill and throws it towards Namgung while H. Wangbo Gun Ak quickly appears and uses 10 split slashes to block daylight. Kang Jin Hayek comments that this is totally unexpected and mentions that sending Hyun alone wasn't a good idea. 
H. Wangbo Gun Ak remarks that he didn't think someone from outside the tower would possess this much internal energy, while the girl with him asks if indeed he is the first. Kang Jin Hayek looks at them and says they're finally here, and he gets a message that he has discovered all the residents within the triad, and the condition has been fulfilled. He receives another message that he has successfully copied the skill Infinite Steps and fused Infinite Steps with Grave of Swords. He gets another message that he has acquired the Sword Demon King's Step skill and checks its details, which state that movement speed increases by 70% upon usage and can also be used as a form of attack if mana is focused on the feet. He thinks he is alright, while H. Wangbo Gun Ak asks Namgung Hyun if he is alright. He replies that he's perfectly fine. The girl with him whispers that it's her first time seeing brother Namgung Hyun so dumbfounded, while the person with long hair says it looks like he's past his prime. Namgung Hyun hears this and shouts that he is fine on his own, asking who told them to butt in. With a weird haircut, they weren't doubting his skill. However, they remind him not to forget that the Lord's order was not an execution but a conciliation. She adds that brother H. Wangbo Gun Ak is correct, and if he plans to be with them, there is no need to fight. Namgung Hyun says he already knows something like that, abuses Kang Jin Hayek, and knows they were from the tower. The others are shocked and ask what he is saying, if he knows about them, and if that's true. He replies why he would lie about this and speaks to forget conciliation. He has to kill at least that guy of all people because he doesn't like him. H. Wang Bo Gun Ak says he understands his rage, but they must go now. Namgung Hyun asks what he is doing. The other person replies that there's a zombie wave coming from the right, and they're three minutes away. Kang Jin Hyuk says the stadium is theirs, so they should find another place. H. Wang Bo Gun Ak responds that they wouldn't take such a garbage location, even if he asked them to, as they already have their base. He adds that it's much more magnificent than a place like this, as huge as a construction site, and tells them to hold out. They'll be back once the first wave is over. He instructs his team members to move to the base and build a strong point. Namgung Hyun tells Kang Jin Hayek to consider himself lucky, he won't let his guard down next time. Yu Yonghua mentions that she wasted energy before they even began and emphasizes the need to save as much stamina as possible. Lee Timin suggests they should get ready too. Kang Jin Hayek looks at a mall and thinks a supermarket would be an ideal place for a long-term siege due to its tall walls and abundant food inside, although it has a fatal flaw. He agrees and says let's go. Meanwhile, Lee Timin and Yu Yonghua send a drone to check the situation outside and see so many zombies. Lee Timin asks if they can stop all those zombies by themselves. Yu Yonghua says to Kang Jin Hayek that he didn't choose this place for the thrill he used to do in the past. He replies don't worry and activates the solar plant, saying these things are more valuable than they look, while Teresa comments that she has never seen such huge plant defense towers. Kang Jin Hayek continues now. He'll explain the plan, and all of them gather around. The purpose of this base defense is to stop the zombies from occupying the flag. He explains that he set up the flag in the middle of the stadium so they don't lose sight of it. The stadium has four large entrances in all four directions, and he has spread those plants around each of those entrances. He states that as long as these plants are safe, not only will they be able to protect this huge base, but they'll also be able to aim for the most kills reward using this vast field. After a while, Lee Timin asks if plant towers are that strong and questions what they should do. Kang Jin Hayuk explains that the plants will kill most of the zombies that come with each wave, but they need around one minute to change occasionally. Chin Yusung suggests they are being asked to stop the zombies during that time, and then he will take the west. Kang Jin Hayuk advises him not to push himself too hard and get bitten by the zombies. Chin Yusung retorts, asking if Kang Jin Hayek thinks mere zombies do him in. Kang Jin Hayek recalls that those Murum guys beat him after he said the same thing. Chin Yusung argues that it's different from this while walking away. 
Kang Jin Hayek tells Lee Timin that he's in charge of checking the situation from the center and assisting when necessary, reminding him not to forget to widen his field of view using a drone. Lee Timin replies all right, leave it to him. At the same time, Yu Yonghua asks if she can take care of the north. Teresa declares that she will handle the south entrance, and Kang Jin Hayek responds all right, everyone to their positions. He thinks he can finally test these twin swords out, and they all set up their weapons, getting ready for the fight. Lee Timon alerts them that the zombies are coming, and they see a large horde approaching. Kang Jin Hayek is notified that the solar plants activate sunlight, which burns the zombies. The group runs to save themselves. Yu Yongkuo comments on the solid firepower, saying they can't even compare to regular defense towers, as many zombies burn due to the sunlight. Kang Jin Hayek remarks that this is when it begins and instructs them to hold out for one minute. Teresa looks at him and reflects on how Kang Jin Hayek was always there in moments of danger, and every time they overcame adversities by trusting each other. She receives a notification that she's just doing what needs to be done for the person she considers her precious comrade. She also thinks she will put her wholehearted faith in Kang Jin Hayek this time. Kang Jin Hayek receives a message that the first wave has ended and the second wave will begin in three hours. A soldier exhales, remarking that even the first wave is so tricky. Dengun Guild's Song Chinhua advises him not to push himself too hard, suggesting he should focus only on the items and experience points, and they can run away if things take a turn for the worse. Kang Jin Hayek confirms and says he'll be careful. They receive a notification about broadcasting highlights from each base for popularity votes. Song Chinua asks if the Triad Guild took over the supermarket and if they're defending the narrow entrance using holy defense towers as support. His partner replies that they're not bad and shows him something on the screen, mentioning a team that took over Sangam Stadium 2 with only five people. Song Chinua becomes shocked and exclaims that only five people are in the massive stadium. He wants to see it and quickly checks the screen. He says no way, how can a plant be that powerful? And adds take a look at this. These guys are way out of the ordinary while looking at Kang Jin Hayek and his team fighting with zombies. He remarks that they aren't being pushed back by the sheer numbers at all, while his subordinate girl comments on Lee Timin, Yu Yonghua, and even the s rank Kang Jin Hayek, noting that the team is made up of famous rookies. Song Chinua looks at Teresa and says, shockingly, Lady Teresa is there too, recalling when she saved him. He says all of them vote for this video and adds damn it. This guy's going crazy because of Teresa again, hold him down. He praises Teresa, saying she's the best and does his best. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek is notified that solar energy is being calculated and 18 solar energy has been obtained. They ask what that is, and he explains that it's what they obtain by killing the zombies, and they need it to strengthen the plant towers. They all feel exhausted. Teresa says it'll get more accessible for them then. King Jin Hayek agrees and receives a notification that Bullet Plant X2 requires 600 energy points. Freezing Plant X1 requires 350 energy points, Boulder Plant needs 250 points, and Berserk Plant needs 600. He instructs Teresa and Yu Yonghua to plant one bullet plant at the east and south entrances, tells Li Timin to grow a freezing plant in the center instructs Chin Yusung to produce one boulder plant in the west and thinks about the berserk plant. Yu Yongkuo quickly asks if it's just burying it in the ground, and he confirms that's all they have to do. Kang Jin Hayek replies that the plants won't grow in time if they use standard methods and assures them to wait as he explains that they need a special fertilizer to make the plants grow quickly. He receives a message about infertile Planto's cow poop, the final fallen leaf, Pentella's dung beetle, gray worm, and the seed leaves of the plant shaking. The message describes them licking their lips from the sweetness they've never experienced, and Kang Jin Hayek declares that it's all done. He addresses the plants, saying they eat lots and grow big. Lee Timin observes him doing this and comments to Yu Yonghua that he thinks Kang Jin Hayek has finally gone insane. She asks how long she has to be stuck in the tower to become like that. 
Chin Yusung gets irritated, saying it's against someone like that. While Teresa remarks to Kang Jin Hayek that he's like a pervert, he replies anyway, if they use this fertilizer, they'll grow in no time, and adds, take good care of the plants until the next wave. Lee Timon comes closer to the bag of fertilizer and covers his nose because it smells terrible. Yu Yonghua asks Kang Jin Hayek where he is going. He replies to clean up a mess, and she asks what's to clean. As he leaves the stadium and looks at other people, he thinks they're all frantically gathering supplies in the field and believes they must prepare for a long-term battle. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek walks away, stating they're only wasting their time and claiming that only weaklings prepare for a long-term battle. He reflects on the passage of time, mentioning that it's been around eight years since he has been there. Entering a building, he notes the familiar sight of numerous spider webs and the unchanged view from the window. Removing the cloth covering a mirror, he remarks that it's the same and touches the mirror, saying, let's see. Through the magical mirror, he arrives in a storeroom where he sees Namgung Hyun angrily putting his hand on the wall and breaking it. Namgung Hyun expresses his intent to kill Kang Jin Hayuk, vowing not to let him live, and abuses him. H. Wang Bo Gun Ak remarks that he'd usually disagree with Namgun Hyun, while Tang Soha, who eats chips, chimes in, saying she thinks he's correct for once. She argues that, no matter how much they need to increase their forces, there's no need to take in someone challenging to control. Namgun Hyun asks what's with her and says she never takes his side, while H. Wang Bo Gun Ak thinks they've secretly made contact with many outsiders until now but none of them ever figured out their identities as he did. He wonders how in the world he knows and considers that they may be better off eliminating him, as Namgung Hyun said. Suddenly, they hear voices, and H. Wangbo Gun Ak asks what's happening. One of their team members says the voices are coming from the storeroom, and they all run towards the storeroom. They see the monster plant there, and Kang Jin Hayuk says he has brought a housewarming gift, but his little cherry here has quite an appetite, as they can see. He holds a branch of the plant and says, unfortunately, it ate all the food they had in their storage room. H. Wangbo Gun Ak shouts, asking how he got in here, and says whatever he's thinking of doing, stop it, and stop it this instant. He asks why he should stop. H. Wangbo Gun Ak says he dared evil, and asks if he has any idea what he's doing. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek asks if he's talking about the Queen, while they all shockingly ask what he knows about the Queen. The other team members start whispering about the Queen, questioning what that is. Kang Jin Hayek explains that the Queen appears when a base with 200 people or more defending it is destroyed before the third wave, and she is the ruler of the fourth floor, known as the Mother of the Dead or Queen. He mentions he wondered how to fill that number, but thankfully, the guys set up their base there. Tang Soha says it's impossible to defeat the queen even if everyone there were to join forces and asks why someone already knows he is trying to summon her. He laughs and says facing a hundred waves of zombies is a hassle, while she asks what's a hassle. He replies so, just let themselves be destroyed, and jumps out from the storeroom, while Namgung Hyun continues to abuse him, saying not to dare run away after he has expressed his fill and asks him to come back and fight. He gets a notification that the supermarket base has been destroyed. On the other side, Lee Timon checks the screen while Teresa asks about this vibration. He looks at the screen and says the supermarket is being destroyed. By the supermarket, she questions if he means the base that the triad who fought them earlier made as theirs. Yu Yonghua asks, no way, could it have something to do with Kang Jin Hayak's brother? Chin Yusung expresses his bad feelings about this, and is notified that a unique event has been triggered. Pindariel arrives and comments that weak humans get punished, and he receives a notification that the master of the fourth floor, Pindariel, is making her move. They all receive a message that the master of the fourth floor, Pindariel, is making her move to punish the weak player. Yu Yonghua asks what the hell it means by the master of the fourth floor. Lee Timon says no way, wasn't blocking the zombie waves all they needed to do. Chin Yusung wonders what Kang Jin Hayuk is planning, while Kang Jin Hayuk stands at a building and observes the situation. 
He says this seems like a good spot, and thinks about the item he earned by killing the third floor boss, the Eclipse Stone, which can cover the sun and bring about darkness. It weakens all light attribute abilities within the field by 50% and strengthens dark attribute abilities by 100%. He believes it's time to use it and activates the Eclipse Stone, strengthening dark attribute capabilities by 100% and the zombies gain more power. He is notified that the Eclipse Stone is weakening light attribute abilities by 50% and Teresa becomes weak. Lee Tiemann looks at her and asks what's wrong with her. Meanwhile, she exclaims no way, her sacred power was reduced by half suddenly. 100% strengthens Pandariel's dark attribute abilities. Kang Jin Hayek receives a message that the master of the fourth floor is staring at his position. The master of the fourth floor declares an all-out attack on the Sangam Stadium base. After checking those messages, Kang Jin Hayek says that's good, and he asks his camera if he will start uploading now. One of the Song Chongjue team members commented that this is crazy, he had never heard about there being a boss on the fourth floor. He suggests let's get the hell out of here. This run is already over because of those damn triad persons. He adds that this floor will be locked for 20 days if they don't clear it. Song Chongjue insists they shouldn't be running like this but rather helping. Shut the hell up and says they'll figure it out after they survive. Kang Jin Hayek gets a notification that a new video has been updated. He receives some comments and updates another video, getting some comments on that video as well. After a while, Yu Yonghua and Li Timin observe the videos. She inquires when he manages to find time to shoot a video. He responds that the views are already impressive. She then asks Kang Jin Hayek if he set too big of a stage. Lee Tiemann questions why he made them come to this base. Teresa remarks that the second wave hasn't even begun, and the one who destroyed the supermarket base wasn't him, right? Kang Jin Hayek replies that he's not too sure about it, while Cheng Yusung states that regardless of whether he destroyed the supermarket, he couldn't care less about pointless stuff like that. He asks if Kang Jin Hayek has a way to face the queen, to which Kang Jin Hayek responds that he has a way to win. Ching Yusung expresses relief that he didn't do this without any plan and asks what the goal is. Kang Jin Hayek points a finger at Ching Yusung and says he will be the most essential part of this plan. Pindariel approaches them with his zombie army and declares that weak humans are here for her to punish. Meanwhile, Teresa observes them and shouts they're coming. Everyone, retreat. Li Tinan warns Yu Yongkuo to be careful and remarks damn it, these guys are unique zombies. Just use everything without holding back. Pandariel enters the stadium and declares that idiotic and weak humans will be punished. She moves forward with her zombies and the monster plants attack the zombies, but she escapes and moves ahead, stating that this is her home. Upon encountering an ice barrier, she questions its presence and they find themselves inside it. Kang Jin Hayek throws a stone towards her and she catches it. Cheng Yusung tells Kang Jin Hayek that he swears he won't die a comfortable death. He recalls that Kang Jin Hayek received one lakh coin from him and realizes that no one else has money like that. He resigns, thinking it can't be helped, and purchases the item. After receiving a notification thanking him for the purchase, Kang Jin Hayek informs Cheng Yusung that, from now on, they will all be bait. Annoyed, Cheng Yusung asks what bait is, questioning if Kang Jin Hayek is kidding him. Kang Jin Hayek corrects himself, saying that bait is a bit of a strange word. He suggests he'll be a booby trap and shows Cheng Yusung the stone that Pandariel currently holds. Then he activates Glacier Formation to construct a brilliant ice prison realm and freeze all the zombies. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that Pandariel is activating Black Death breaking her ice and getting closer to Teresa. He instructs Teresa to get out of her home. Kang Jin Hayek activates shallow breathing and initiates Sword Demon King's steps, running towards Pindariel's base. She shouts that he's heading to her base. Kang Jin Hayek contemplates Pindariel, the mother of the dead, also known as the Queen. He reflects on her level, her skills, and especially her fatally poisonous attacks. He acknowledges that as the boss of the fourth floor, she is overwhelming in all aspects except her intelligence. 
Nevertheless, he realizes that the core of the fourth floor is base defense, applicable to both players and zombies when the queen is in the Sangam Stadium. Kang Jin Hayek concludes that this means her base is empty and decides to head towards it, with Pandariel following him. He remarks that she figured it out faster than he expected, but she's still too late due to the distance between them. Kang Jin Hayek smiles, thinking he has plenty of time. Upon reaching her base, he notices some zombies and activates Grave of Swords and Blessing of the Star. He swiftly attacks and kills the zombies, considering the place as repulsive as always. He resolves to finish this quickly, thinking that in any case, the solution should be appearing soon. Spotting a flag among a heap of skeletons, he identifies it as the flag and runs to retrieve it. As he does so, someone attacks him, but he manages to escape. Meanwhile, he contemplates that it appears while the watchman who protected the queen's flag, butcher, dodges and laughs, happily saying meat to him. Kang Jin Hayek runs towards Butcher and considers how he should take care of him now. Butcher holds his considerable scissors to cut him, but Kang Jin Hayek moves his swords forward to intercept the scissors. He remarks that it doesn't cut and adds that it's not his average sword. Kang Jin Hayek activates Fire Element to attack him from behind, burning Butcher's head. He acknowledges that Butcher's recovery speed alone is legendary, but this is enough to restrict its visibility. Kang Jin Hayek retrieves his sword and observes Butcher recovering. He quickly attacks Butcher from all sides, making Butcher angry, who insists that he won't die with just those small attacks. Butcher goes behind Kang Jin Hayek, activating Mandala, and the sun appears, burning Butcher while he shouts. Kang Jin Hayek is notified that he has leveled up and acquired scissors filled with a vengeful spirit. He looks at the scissors and notes that it's his 31st victory. He wonders if he will end this now as he gazes at the flag. After a while, he exclaims would he look at this as he receives a message that Black Hound is revealing their presence and wishes to make him a proposal as the representative of Egyptian mythology. He identifies the Black Hound as Anubis and thinks it's interesting that he thought it would be dormant for a while after giving him a scolding on the underground first floor. He says he's listening and receives another message. Black Hound is making a low roar. He asks if it's getting angry and requests that he pull out the flag he holds. He gets another message that Black Hound is flustered and they urge him to calm down. They claim that the Egyptian gods want a proper end to this battle. Considering it from the perspective of the ones who rule the tower's higher floors, he thinks it's challenging to acknowledge that the fourth floor was cleared without even a proper battle with the boss. He wonders if it could simply be because they don't like this impudent human and asks why he should accept that proposal, stating that he can win if he pulls the flag out. He receives a message that Black Hound proposes a contract. As he looks at the contract, he remarks that it sure is generous. Seeing Pandariel reach the location, he hides while she looks at the flag and asks why it's untouched. He explains that she's asking why he didn't pull the flag out to win immediately. It's because someone insisted that he fight her. He appears with a mask and wields the scissors differently, stating that he has already received a deposit. Therefore, he can't pull the flag out until he defeats her. She asks what the promise is and he confirms while preparing for the fight. Pandariel activates her magic skills and warns that he'll regret it. In contrast, Kang Jin Hayek activates Blessing of the Star, weakening light attribute abilities by 50% due to the effect of the Eclipse Stone. He acknowledges that even if his Rift stat takes maximum effect, he has nowhere near sufficient stats to kill her. She runs to attack him, but he escapes from her attack. She asks how he blocked it, and he activates Mandala, hiding behind it. She questions why he isn't disappearing and shouts for him to disappear. Kang Jin Hayek activates Sword Demon King's steps, increasing movement speed by 70% and also activates Glacier Formation, freezing her. He runs to attack her, but she breaks the ice, stating that she won't die with just that. He replies that he knows it's nowhere near enough, and she counterattacks. However, he quickly activates Glacier Formation again, freezing her eyes. Meanwhile, he attacks her with scissors, but she breaks the ice, calling him an irritating human. She states that was a mistake and blocks his attack. 
She then activates Requiem of the Dead to attack him. He receives a message that Blackhound is gloating and offering the item Jackal's Tooth as the deposit. He thinks it's a material item that increases movement speed by 10% and attack by 30% and remarks that it's pretty generous, although it feels a little lacking. He says he'll agree to this battle if Blackhound agrees to one condition. He receives a message that Blackhound is curious about the condition. He says it's nothing special and mentions a B-grade item called White Branch, asking Blackhound to give that to him. He thinks the White Branch is an item used for medical purposes and is actually an extremely common item that can be obtained easily from the 10th floor and above, even in the eyes of Anubis on the 42nd floor. He considers it nothing but worthless trash. After a while, he receives a message that Blackhound accepts his condition. He receives Jackal's Tooth and White Branch items, and he may not pull out the flag until his battle with the Queen is over. Activating both skills, he combines White Branch with Jackal's Tooth and Scissors, filled with a vengeful spirit. He gets notified that the fusion is successful, describing the resulting item as the significant god's divine artifact for absolute judgment. It can kill what can't be killed and slash what can't be slashed. He attacks her. A warning message appears, indicating that the system is intervening due to the appearance of a divine artifact that must not exist on the fourth floor. Due to the downward scaling effect, this item may only be used once. He thinks that an artifact that goes against probability can only be used once, but that one chance is plenty. He attacks her while she thinks it's dangerous, saying she can't dodge and he's difficult to defeat. They both run to attack each other. He hits her sword, breaking it, and stabs her. She falls and Blackhound becomes shocked to see this. She sees the door open and light comes inside. She walks towards the door while he remarks that Muhan did nothing but hide at the back, but he is far more substantial. He bids her farewell as she disappears due to sunlight. He receives a notification that the fourth floor boss monster Pendariel has been defeated. Kang Jin Hayek receives notifications that he has leveled up and successfully defended the base. Each party member will receive a rank random boxes X5. He breaks the glacier prison and they all come out. Teresa tells him that this time as well they faced death. The news broadcasts that only 24 hours have passed since the fourth floor opened and he still can't believe it. Another reporter confirms that everyone expected it would take at least 20 days to defend against all 100 waves. It's certainly hard to believe that Kang Jin Hayek and his team cleared the floor in just one day. He says he thinks they've seen the true power of an rank, and that's truly amazing. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek goes somewhere and meets Lee Timon and Yu Yonghua, who welcome him. He apologizes for being late and explains that he had to pick someone up. Just as Alice arrives, she asks who he is and comments that the banquet hall looks quite shabby. Lee Timon informs her that this is Miss Alice, the person they met before. Kang Jin Hayek explains that he brought her here because she's also a veteran company member. Lee Timon asks what the veteran company is and questions the name. Kang Jin Hayek then inquires about Teresa. Yu Yonghua mentions that Teresa would be here in about an hour, so she instructed them to go ahead and eat. Kang Jin Hayuk expresses surprise, stating that he thought she wouldn't come, but he guesses she still made it. Chin Yusung interjects, stating that he's only here for the secret method of the random reward that Kang Jin Hayuk promised him. He approaches him and says okay, he'll tell him, so there's no need to stiffen the mood, they should have a drink. After a while, Park Hana, Li Yuri, Min Youngwoo, and Kim Hee-wong arrive and announce that they are here too. They bow before him, congratulating him on clearing the fourth floor. He thanks them all and invites them to eat as much as they want tonight, all on him, as a commemoration for clearing the fourth floor. He then asks Alice for some coins and she gives them to him. They all enjoy the food, with him commenting that it hits the spot and she replies that she can't believe she can eat something this delicious with just two coins. She mentions that she has had a lot of meat, but the taste of this region is on another level. He replies okay, he can have it, and she thanks him, expressing that she'll never forget it. 
He looks at her and thinks about how hard it is to believe she's one of the strongest in the tower just by looking at her. Lee Timin asks Chin Yusung about what he did before all this happened, and Chin Yusung responds that he was a medical student. Lee Timin expresses disbelief, and Teresa enters, apologizing for being late. Lee Yuri stands up, grabs her phone, and says Teresa in the flesh. She asks if she can tag her and suggests taking a selfie together. She mentions that whenever Teresa cleared floors in the tower trials before, she was always alone. Meanwhile, they all listen to her, and Kang Jin Hayek smiles. Alice asks why he is smiling, and he replies that it's just because it's pretty rowdy. He then goes to his room, checks his status screen, and sees that his level has reached 29, with his strength at 16, dex at 16, stamina at 16, magic at 92, rift at 100, luck at 10, and adaptability at 10. He has 235,341 coins. He mentions that he went up three levels and reflects on how he thought he grew in the most ideal way in the past, but is now growing incomparably faster than before. He wonders if it's being influenced by the variables showing up now that the game has become a reality. However, he thinks it's okay since he's getting more profits than losses. He then says now then, let's take a look at the fourth floor reward, and receives a notification for a high-grade skill strengthening scroll. He decides to use it on Glacier Formation, the skill he's making the most use of, and gets a notification that the skill Glacier Formation has become level 8. On the other side, a waiter asks if it hasn't suddenly gotten cold and questions whether someone turned on the air conditioner. Chin using shouts, asking what he's talking about, and tells him to wear more clothes if he's cold. He warns the waiter not to dare take a half day off after pretending to be sick again. Kang Jin Hayek becomes irritated due to the noise, scrolls for the following item, and purchases an agreed random gacha box. As he looks at it, he thinks it's a probability-based item that allows him to pull an agreed item by spinning a roulette. He spins the roulette and receives a notification instructing him to press the red button in the middle, as there is not much time remaining. He considers that letting the roulette keep spinning will draw out the user's anxiety through a countdown and stress-inducing sounds implying the threat of grave peril. Another notification pops up, indicating that the time has run out, and he is prompted to spin the roulette again. He thinks that most people press the button around this time, but this is something that he, who used to search for all kinds of bugs, knows well. He thinks that someone has purposefully hidden within the system and he realizes this as he gets a warning notification that the time has run out. It instructs him to spin the roulette again. He spins and considers that if he keeps spinning the roulette without doing anything, then on the 37th attempt, the roulette speed is reduced by 99%. Chen Yusung asks if he seriously says he can choose the agreed item he wants by doing something like this and questions how much he has played this game. He thinks about letting Chin Yusung select the reward he wants using the same method. Chin Yusung says he can finally beat him while holding his sword. He reconsiders, noting that there's a penalty. The reward will be destroyed after one week if he uses this method. He expresses his happiness, stating that he was delighted to complete his attribute sword, and he can't wait to see the expression on his face next week. He presses the red button and receives a notification that he has obtained tricolored pills. Considering that he'll have to use them within one week, he believes it's the best item among those he can use to clear the next floor. He thinks he has the final and most important item needed to clear the fifth floor, along with the Great Magic Library entry ticket that opened the Great Magic Library. Upon entering the library, he contemplates whether he should see the geezer after a long time. Inside, Rick Hennessy sits and reads a book. He asks Kang Jin Hayek what in the world this is about, mentioning that he heard the fourth floor has been cleared but didn't expect to see a guest already. He welcomes Kang Jin Hayek and introduces himself as Rick Hennessy, the library manager. Kang Jin Hayek recognizes Rick Hennessy as an intermediate administrator grade big shot who manages the Tower of Trials Great Magic Library. He thinks it's his first encounter with a tower administrator and introduces himself as Kang Jin Hayek. Rick Hennessy expresses surprise, stating that he doesn't see this often. 
He never imagined that someone would set foot in there so soon, even if they managed to enter. He finds it attractive that Kang Jin Hayek navigated through the giant labyrinth of the library. Kang Jin Hayek replies that he happens to be a fortunate person as he grabs a book. Rick Hennessy mentions that he doesn't mind Kang Jin Hayek browsing through the books, but there are no books at his level that he can read there. He further explains that at least a fundamental understanding of rune language is required to enter the Sixth Circle, as written by the Empire's court mage Telemos. Kang Jin Hayek replies that he knows rune language, and when he asks if he knows it, he responds that he knows a lot of people, so he has picked up things here and there. Rick Hennessy thinks that Kang Jin Hayek should be a player who has only just entered the fifth floor, but he already knows rune language. Meanwhile, Rick Hennessy asks if he may inquire about something, and Kang Jin Hayek replies yes, go ahead. Rick Hennessy observes that he is different from the average player just because he managed to enter this place, and his background seems beyond the realm of extraordinary. He asks about Kang Jin Hayek's background and activates the judgment of Anubis. Rick Hennessy says, to be honest, the Egyptian gods are backing him, and that's why he was able to come here and learn about the tower. Rick Hennessy thinks that this is most certainly the energy of the god Anubis, and he is surprised that they'd already be showing interest in a player. Kang Jin Hayek replies that they seem to treasure him very much since they even granted him power like this. Because a subject was not selected, the judgment of Anubis will be cancelled. Rick Hennessy acknowledges that a person of value must receive corresponding treatment and admits that he has mistreated a valuable guest. He bows down in front of Kang Jin Hayek and offers his sincerest apologies. He thinks Anubis would have collapsed from stress if he saw this, while Rick Hennessy states that he will give him one of the books here as a gift to atone for his mistake. Kang Jin Hayek asks if he can really choose anything he wants, and Rick Hennessy confirms that, saying he would like to offer a valuable guest a gift of the same value. In that case, Kang Jin Hayek decides to take a particular book and show it to him. Rick Hennessy asks if he is okay with that, noting that it is indeed a good grimoire, but because it's written in ancient rune language, it can't be read unless he's an ancient species. He adds that it is the Black Dragon Maktrian's record, commemorating his ascension to an ancient dragon. Kang Jin Hayek responds that for a thousand years, he has studied a way to tear down the principles of this world, and it's just a book written by some Chunabiu lizard. He decides to take this one. Rick Hennessy laughs and pardons him, saying as expected of someone who has received the blessing of the gods. He performs some magic and mentions that he will keep his eye on him from now on. Looking forward to the day they meet again, player Kang Jin Hayek. The scene shifts to an Asian man reporting at a news outlet. He recalls running and describes the fifth floor of the Tower of Trials as resembling the world of a collapsed civilization. In that collapsed world, monsters shout to capture people and find a sacrifice. He explains that all that remained were fanatics crazed with blood, and it felt like some massive psychiatric ward. As he runs to escape, the monsters continue shouting to capture and find sacrifices. The news reporter asks about the mention of a psychiatric ward, suggesting that fanatics don't seem all that threatening and questions why the man decided to run away without fighting. He replies that he initially tried to subdue those using skills, but there was a completely different obstacle besides the fanatics, the inability to use skills. The news reporter asks if he's saying that skills can't be used there. He confirms this, stating that he couldn't even summon his subspace inventory. He adds that he could only escape by using a return stone that he had in his pocket, showing it to the reporter. He explains that this is why they offer a special 20% discount on the Exit Guild's return stone, with the discounted price of 5,000 gold. Teresa watches that video and shows it to Kang Jin Hayek, suggesting he take her to the fifth floor. He refuses, and she asks why he doesn't want her to accompany him, insisting that she's sure he's going to challenge the fifth floor right away, and she can't let him go alone. He thinks she's being persistent and wonders why she's suddenly acting like this. He tells her that no matter how much she wants to come with him, he can sneak in by himself, so she should give up. 
However, she grabs his hand and asks him to promise he won't push himself. As he goes out and sits in a car, he recalls her voice telling him not to push himself. He receives a sponsor gift from the Caladium Kingdom and thinks about how it's a kingdom hostile to the Murum forces. Another notification arrives, informing him that he has acquired a faint odor. The description explains that it's a skill that erases his odor, breathing and even his presence, with duration of 3 seconds and a cooldown of 24 hours after every 3 uses. Due to sponsorship from an upper force, he broke out from the fifth floor's restraint. Meanwhile, he considers that they have given him a gift while opposing the tower's restrictions, and it seems like they've started approaching players with potential, much like Miram. He believes he will make excellent use of this skill. He receives a notification that he has entered the fifth floor of the Tower of Trials and will start from a random location. Another warning notification informs him that skill usage is blocked and he will receive a random F-grade item. He gets another message stating that due to his possession of Maktrian's ancient grimoire, one of his skills will be free from restraint and he may use the Eye of Gluttony. He recalls choosing this in the Great Magic Library and decides to leave using it for later. As he arrives, he notices some other players and one person complains that it's so dark, while his partner asks why it is so damp here. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that people placed at the same starting point have already started to arrive, and he decides to leave the newcomers there and move on to the next. He activates the Pursuit Scroll and wonders about its purpose. Another message informs him that it allows him to move to the Pursuit Target's location. To his irritation, he sees Teresa there. She informs him that she doesn't think he'd keep his promise, so she follows him. Kang Jin Hayek tells Teresa, he believes he told her not to follow him and asks what she was thinking, coming all the way here. Teresa replies, please don't criticize someone who followed him out of worry so much. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that now he has to change his plan. Newbies mention that there's something in their pockets. Teresa checks her pocket and says she has a flashlight, then asks Kang Jin Hayek what he has. He replies that he has a pen. She comments that a pen isn't very useful, but he insists it can be useful. One of the newbies lights up a lighter, saying he can finally see a little. Teresa says she'll turn on the flashlight, but Kang Jin Hayek stops her. They both look at the newbie with the lighter, who comments on the dreary-looking place and asks his partner how they can escape when it's so dark. Devotees spot them and shout over their sacrifices as they run to capture them. The newbies become scared and one of them says idiot, turns off the lighter. Devotees run to capture them all, while Kang Jin Hayek and Teresa hide behind a big rock. After a while, they both get up and prepare to leave. She asks if they shouldn't save those people, and he replies that now that she's here, she must follow his judgment, no matter what. She bows down and says pardon. He explains that they must not unnecessarily expose themselves for the time being, as he is much too unprepared for a frontal assault at the moment. She questions if he isn't looking down on him too much and mentions that she has made her preparations. She shows him an exit return stone, stating that people say it is crucial for the fifth floor. In another scene, newbies hide in a room, trying not to open the gate while devotees attempt to go inside. They say they'll get through at this rate and call for the guys at the back to come and help. An Asian girl looks at the return stone and asks what these guys are doing. She comments on what they think and declares that they're going to escape. She bids farewell, breaks the return stone, and says, see them later. Meanwhile, one of the newbies exclaims that he bought one too. The girl with him mentions that it's not activating. A giant monster appears and they all get scared, attempting to use the return stone, but it breaks. Teresa also tries to use it, but it breaks. She declares that it was a scam. Kang Jin Hayek comments that they trusted it because it was on a broadcast. Teresa mentions that she bought two, intending to give one to him, and says she really should go. A devotee comes from behind, trying to put a rope around her neck, and says she's a sacrifice for their god. She punches him and throws him away. Another devotee arrives, and she says they have been discovered. Kang Jin Hayek observes the situation, 
and the devotee says their god desires a sacrifice of sacred blood to accomplish the advent of their king and bring eternal happiness. Kang Jin Hayuk taps the pen, killing some devotees, and asks who wants to do the next sermon. The giant monster arrives, and the devotee sees him, saying Sir Proxy, it's not that they're scared, but Proxy kills him and throws them all away. Kang Jin Hayek asks Teresa if she has played tag before and instructs her not to get caught by Proxy, pointing towards the giant head. As Proxy is about to attack them, Kang Jin Hayek tells Teresa to start the game and runs. On the other side, a devotee bows down in front of the cult leader, who inquires about the sacrifices. The devotee replies that they are capturing them without complications. The cult leader states that their god desires more sacrifices, especially now that the tower has opened and ignorant people are entering. He adds that it is the promised time for the Great One to descend once again at last. The devotee suggests showing him a video, and the cult leader asks what it is. The devotee explains that they discovered sacrifices and shows him the video where Kang Jin Hayek and Teresa run, escaping from proxy. The cult leader asks what he sees, and the devotee replies that they are sacrifices they just discovered. The cult leader comments that it's his first time seeing Proxy have such a hard time and notes that Kang Jin Hayek is quick on his feet for a mere sacrifice. Lancelot sees Kang Jin Hayek and recognizes him, while the cult leader asks if he knows him. Lancelot confirms and states that he's the most dangerous obstacle to their plan, and they all look at the screens. Proxy attacks Teresa, but she manages to escape. Kang Jin Hayek notes the impressive speed of the giant head and remarks that he can't be compared to the regular cultists. He advises Teresa that it's impossible to face Proxy right now, so they should focus on outrunning him. Kang Jin Hayek asks if she could give him something for a second. They both run and hide behind a building, turning on a flashlight towards Proxy, who attacks and breaks the flashlight. Teresa looks at Proxy secretly and comments that it should have bought them enough time to think up a strategy. Kang Jin Hayek agrees and tells her to listen carefully. She says okay, and he explains he'll lure the giant head by himself. Teresa asks for clarification, expressing surprise that he wants to lure Proxy after they barely get away from him. Kang Jin Hayek reassures her, stating that it's okay, as they'll have to face him sooner or later if they want to clear this floor. Meanwhile, Proxy continues to search for them. Kang Jin Hayek continues, saying that while he's luring Proxy, she should evacuate the others. He is confident that they have no way of leaving now, given that their precious return stones turned out to be a scam. Kang Jin Hayek expresses his intention to clear the fifth floor as quickly as possible, acknowledging that the situation has become a bit complicated. Teresa thinks about needlessly following him and agrees, asking him to remember this, just in case. Meanwhile, Proxy asks where the sacrifice is, Kang Jin Hayek calls out to him, saying isn't he way too bad at the tag and runs forward, with Proxy following him. Teresa observes them and recalls that he mentioned she needs to use it at the right time. She questions at the right time and asks when that would be. Kang Jin Hayek replies that she'll definitely feel it when that time comes. Teresa holds a stick, thinking she'll know when the time comes and decides to save those people from earlier. She runs in another direction. Kang Jin Hayek thinks Teresa must have gotten far enough and activates the Eye of Gluttony. He looks at Proxy and receives a warning notification that Proxy's name is Breaker. His level is unknown. His strength is at 100, dex is 15, state is 30, and magic is 0. Another warning notification informs Kang Jin Hayak that an act that defies the fifth floor's causality has been detected, and Rotting Heart is showing interest in him. A secondary advancement condition has been generated. Another message indicates that Rotting Heart suggests that he becomes their sword and may advance to Dark Apostle once he accepts the condition. After a while, Kang Jin Hayek thinks that Rotting Heart is one of the absolute beings of the tower, similar to Alice, who resides on the tower's upper floors. He acknowledges that Rotting Heart is commonly referred to as the Demon King in this place. In such a realm where skills have been sealed by borrowing the Demon King's power, attempting to break through the restraint in any possible way will attract attention. 
King Jin Hayek reflects on the extraordinary power boasted by the Dark Apostle, but notes that one must live as the Demon King's pawn for the rest of their life. He contemplates that the people in the Demonic Human Association would likely have accepted the offer with their mouths foaming. However, he questions how a tiger could become a dog's subordinate. Kang Jin Hayek decides to refuse the request. Suddenly, he receives a message indicating that Rotting Heart is enraged, and he will incur the Demon King's curse for the sign of refusing the Demon King's offer. The Demon King then attacks him. He receives a notification that he will become the target of all demons, and this curse will last until death. Kang Jin Hayek sits down and starts bleeding, expressing that it hurts. He challenges the onlookers, asking if they'll stand there and watch, and urges them to come at him. The newbies apologize, pleading for mercy, while a devotee claims they are sacrifices for their god and grabs an Asian girl by the hair. Teresa arrives, attacking the devotee, and instructs the Asian girl to take care of the others. The Asian girl hesitates, but Teresa calls her again, assuring her that they can all get out of there safely. Despite the Asian girl's belief that they can't escape, Teresa thinks she's already been engulfed by fear. A fanatic runs to attack Teresa, but she blocks his attack, throws him away, and encourages the Asian girl not to give up. She assures her that they can all escape safely, advising her to grab her weapon and stand up, mentioning that her comrade is in the middle of clearing the fifth floor. On the other side, Proxy captures Kang Jin Hyuk, puts him on his shoulder, and walks away. Some newbies are captured and placed in a prison. One of them expresses regret, stating that they're all dead and he shouldn't have come to this place. He had planned on returning with the item. A devotee interrupts, telling him to shut up, and threatens torture if he continues to be too noisy. The captive quiets them down and invites cult leader to speak freely. Cult leader says it's perfect and asks if this is the guy. Lancelot confirms that it's his first meeting with him in person. They also sent Kang Jin Hayek to that prison. Kang Jin Hayek looks at Lancelot and wonders if this mana belongs to a human. Considering that he's on the same side as the fifth floor boss, he ponders if Lancelot is a demon. Kang Jin Hayek activates his Eye of Gluttony and receives a warning message that the status window cannot be opened. Another notification informs him that the target has a high-level mind barrier activated. He wonders about the mind barrier and recalls that he originally planned to use it when he fought the cult leader but realizes it can't be helped. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek receives a message indicating that he has used a white pill, and the pill will double one of his stats. He opens the pill and gets another message stating that the adaptability stat has increased from 10 to 20. Through the eye of gluttony, he observes the target. Kang Jin Hayek checks his status screen, revealing the target's name as Hosenelt, who is 41 years old. Hosenelt's level is 38 with a strength of 19, dexterity of 25, health of 18, and magic level of 28. He possesses 30,855 coins. King Jin Hayek thinks that if Hasenelt is a knight of the round table, he looks like the big shot the demon who joined hands with Melina was talking about. He realizes that this situation is more significant than he expected. He contemplates that the metal barrier skill looks appealing, and could be helpful to endure against divine figures later on. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification about the condition to copy the skill, requiring the target to reveal his knight title and act like an immature kid going through puberty until the target reveals his title. Another message follows, stating that he may copy the desired skill if both conditions are met. After a while, Kang Jin Hayek reflects on who the crazy person managing the tower's system might be, and remarks that he could probably do a better job if he downed six bottles of Saju first. Hasenelt asks why he isn't saying anything. Kang Jin Hayek taps on his head and explains that he was trying to suppress the darkness within him, so he wasn't in his right mind. Cult leader questions if he is sure that this is the man they were talking about, stating that he seems strange. Hosenelt affirms that he is certain, while cult leader comments that even he is not this bad and instructs them to do what they will. Alice starts laughing and Kang Jin Hayek finds it annoying, requesting that she pretend not to see him. 
Hasenelt remarks that it seems he doesn't understand his situation and asks if he comprehends that he has been captured to become a sacrifice. Kang Jin Hayek laughs loudly and confidently asserts that he can contain the madness of his ruin, considering it insolent. Hasenelt ponders on what is going on, wondering if Kang Jin Hayek is hiding something significant. He considers Kang Jin Hayek's actions so far and finds them plausible. Addressing Kang Jin Hayek, Hasenelt acknowledges that Kang Jin Hayek is already known to be strong, but asserts that survival will be challenging with sealed skills. Kang Jin Hayek looks away, seemingly unfazed. Hasenelt informs Kang Jin Hayek about the ritual of living sacrifices, describing a slow and terrifying death that awaits him and the others, making it difficult for one to maintain sanity. However, he offers Kang Jin Hayek a key in exchange for information about unknown. Smiling, Kang Jin Hayek contemplates the key and questions why he would want to know about his identity. He suggests that since he is a dead guy, Kang Jin Hayek should reveal his identity first. Hasenelt responds by disclosing his name, also known as Lancelot, and asks if Kang Jin Hayek is satisfied now. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification indicating that he has met the conditions and successfully copied the skill Mental Barrier S. The skill details reveal that it increases the defenses of one's mind, protecting the status window from being seen and guarding the player against various psychological attacks. Meanwhile, Hasenelt asserts that it's now Kang Jin Hayek's turn to share Unknown's identity. Kang Jin Hayek responds, stating that he'll only reveal it once, urging Hasenelt to listen carefully. After Kang Jin Hayek discloses the information, Hasenelt acknowledges it, hands him the key, and affirms that he keeps his promises. Walking away, Hasenelt remarks, wishing Kang Jin Hayek a swift death. Another prisoner obtains the key and attempts to open the lock, only to realize there's no keyhole. Kang Jin Hayek understands what that guy would do and thinks that, in any case, Teresa should have arrived by now as he lies down. On the other side, Teresa is also captured, and a fanatic throws her into prison, expressing excitement about capturing their first energetic sacrifice. Another fanatic speculates that more than 20 individuals were defeated by her, indicating her considerable life force, which he believes will please their god. Teresa inquires about the whereabouts of everyone else, and the Asian girl becomes angry, blaming them for the situation and venting her frustration by beating other newbies. Teresa takes responsibility for the situation, asking the Asian girl to stop her actions. The Asian girl asserts that it's because Teresa doesn't understand the saintess. Confused, Teresa asks her to explain, and the Asian girl reveals that the child she's protecting is a tower resident, catching Teresa's attention. Another girl chimes in, blaming them for the existence of the tower, and she adds that they wouldn't be captured if it weren't for them. The Asian girl once again blames Teresa for the situation and attempts to attack her. However, Teresa intervenes, holding her hand, and emphasizes that it doesn't matter whether someone is a resident of the tower or not, they are all captives of the cultists. Teresa inquires about the little girl's name, and although the girl initially remains silent, she eventually reveals her name is Andrea. Teresa expresses the reassurance that as long as she is present, no harm will come to Andrea. Teresa introduces herself, praising Andrea's beautiful name. Andrea recounts how the devotees arrived in their village, demanding a sacrifice in exchange for saving everyone. Considering it a duty, the villagers chose Andrea due to her lack of parents. Teresa empathizes with Andrea, acknowledging her loneliness and reflects on the common humanity they share despite Andrea being a resident of the tower. Meanwhile, a devotee informs them that the next batch of sacrifices must be prepared, instructing them to select one person from each room. The threat of all participating in the ritual if no one is chosen intensifies the tension in the room. In the meantime, the Asian girl expresses frustration, exclaiming not again, while another girl voices her reluctance to die, firmly refusing. The group suggests sending out Andrea first, deeming her inhuman. As they move towards Andrea, Teresa intervenes, urging them to reconsider their impulsive decisions. The Asian girl implores them to regain composure, but the devotee encourages the struggle, claiming it delights the Lord even more. 
Kang Jin Hayek confidently raises his hand, volunteering himself, and asks if there are any objections. Another prisoner responds with a quick no, go ahead. The sacrifices are bound, and Kang Jin Hayek, seizing an opportune moment, discreetly tosses a pill into the water. As the devotee glances in his direction, Kang Jin Hayek diverts his eyes. In reflecting on the situation, Kang Jin Hayek believes the necessary preparations are complete. He speculates that Teresa should have been captured and confined by now, predicting her voluntary sacrifice due to her personality. This unconventional progression through the section feels surprisingly smooth for him. Kang Jin Hayek notes the generation of a hidden quest unfolding as planned and receives a message about the hidden quest. It states that fanatics who recklessly take lives are considered villains, and eliminating each devotee will increase the adaptive stat by 0-1. Another notification informs Kang Jin Hayek that the adaptive stat will increase by 30 upon eliminating the cult leader. Pondering this reward, he reflects on consistently granting a single stat as a reward, finding the allocation of the adaptive stat intriguing. The devotees jubilantly cheer, heralding the advent of glory for their lord, while Kang Jin Hayek observes the sizable congregation. Contemplating the surroundings, he deems the place tolerable enough not to induce nausea. However, the Lord commands the next batch of sacrifices, and the door shatters, revealing proxy waiting for the sacrificial offerings. The devotees proclaim the Lord's desire for sacrifices steeped in fear. A devoted follower declares the Lord's preference for noble sacrifices, emphasizing the act of self-sacrifice. Pointing towards Teresa, who is bound to a pillar, he hails her as a noble woman who sacrificed herself to save a child she scarcely knew. This noble act, he asserts, will culminate in the grand finale of the live sacrifice ritual a noble sacrifice. After a while, Kang Jin Hayek strides forward, determined to conclude this floor after boosting his stats, utilizing Nictrian's ancient grimoire, and breaking free from the fifth floor ruler's restraints. A message alerts him to the remaining time, 9 minutes and 59 seconds. Activating the element of fire, he employs it on a pill thrown earlier, unleashing the skill red pill blaze. Flames engulf everything, and he directs the fire toward proxy. Amidst the chaos, a devotee questions the nature of this phenomenon, questioning if it could be a skill. Another dismisses it, asserting that skills should be rendered unusable due to the Lord's commandment. Undeterred, Kang Jin Hayek throws his dagger to shatter the chains binding Teresa, then unties her and cradles her in his arms. Checking her pulse, he reassures himself of her well-being. Rising, he declares his indifference to stat increases, vowing to annihilate them all. Consuming a pill, he activates Black Pill Dark, unfurling the Black Barrier. Devotees scramble to escape, hindered by the thick, impenetrable smoke. Kang Jin Hayek readies his sword, activating Grave of Swords, prepared for the impending confrontation. One of the devotees inquires about Kang Jin Hayek's whereabouts, their vision obscured by the dense dark smoke. Another fervently prays, invoking the title God of Darkness and addressing the almighty demon King God. As the collective plea rises, they sense a surge of magical energy, attributing it to the benevolent response of their deity. Filled with jubilation, they believe their prayers have been answered. In the midst of their celebration, Kang Jin Hayek swiftly moves to engage them. A notification informs him that the criminal figures have been eliminated, causing the adaptive stat to increment by 0-1. This cycle repeats as he continues to dismantle the remaining foes. Teresa regains her footing, reflecting on the moment when the Asian girl suggested sacrificing the non-human child. Indignant, Teresa questions the fairness of such an act, emphasizing the child's innocence. The Asian girl dismissively refers to the child as an NPC non-playable character, while another girl demands that Teresa hand the child over. Defiant, Teresa forcefully repels them, asserting her confidence that she can prevail against them even without using skills. The Asian girl questions Teresa, asking if she intends to make the choice. Teresa confidently affirms that she will indeed be the one making the decision. Despite initially appearing righteous, Teresa's decision aligns her with the others in the group. 
Turning towards Andrea, she assures her that she will return and seemingly presents her for sacrifice. The devotee acknowledges this act as a noble sacrifice. Currently, King Jin Hayek utilizes glacier formation to eliminate the remaining devotees. As Teresa rises, King Jin Hayek notes that she has once again pushed herself to the limit. Expressing his assurance that he would come for her, he proceeds to break her chain. A notification informs Kang Jin Hayuk that the adaptive stat obtained through the hidden quest has reached 23. Determined to defeat the cult leader and make their escape, he prepares for the final confrontation. Meanwhile, after opening all the prisoners' doors, Teresa rushes to find Andrea. Upon reuniting, they share a heartfelt embrace. Teresa expresses relief that Andrea is safe. Kang Jin Hayuk arrives and, puzzled, inquires about the situation. Teresa explains that Andrea is a tower inhabitant and that they were forcibly brought here by the devotees given the ultimatum of becoming a sacrifice or joining their ranks. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek receives a message indicating that there are only 2 minutes and 31 seconds remaining on the effect of Maktrian's ancient grimoire. He can't believe that she made him use his precious 10 minutes on this. Glancing at Andrea, Teresa wonders if she's an inhabitant of the tower and contemplates something before calling out to her. Kang Jin Hayek questions Andrea about why she didn't become a devotee, given that the inhabitants here are fervently faithful to God. Teresa is shocked to hear this revelation. Andrea responds by expressing her reluctance to believe in the existence of a god. Having been sold by the villagers in her hometown due to the absence of her parents, she asserts that if there truly is a god, then that entity is responsible for creating this despair-filled hell. Convinced that if it was God's plan, then he must be a douchebag, she begins to cry. Kang Jin Hayek attempts to console her by sharing that he can relate to her situation. He discloses that he was abandoned in an orphanage immediately after birth and grew up on his own. As Andrea looks at him, he acknowledges that living without parents is challenging. Teresa observes the exchange and points out that he's talking about himself. Kang Jin Hayek asserts that despite the difficulties, one has to keep living, emphasizing that harboring resentment and despair doesn't change anything. After a while, Andrea expresses concern about the presence of the cult leader. Kang Jin Hayek confirms this and suggests a plan. He declares that he will eliminate the cult leader for her, allowing her to live in a world free from the restraints of that douchebag. Activating the brand of tribulation, he requests her to become his comrade underling. Performing a magical skill on her chest, he assures her that it's all done and that he'll be in her care from now on. Observing this, Teresa notes that he didn't do anything like that to her. Nevertheless, Kang Jin Hayek urges Andrea to join him in defeating the cult leader. He receives a notification stating that the duration of Maktrian's ancient grimoire has ended, sealing all skills. On the other side, the cult leader stands in his room and exclaims, Let there be joy, the glory of fear God. Kang Jin Hayek observes that the cult leader differs significantly from the other fanatics, emphasizing that although he can't use skills like them, he possesses strength comparable to Breaker. Teresa suggests defeating him easily by using skills, to which Kang Jin Hayek explains that he intended to do so, but the time limit expired, preventing him from using any more skills. He mentions that they can engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but the divine artifact cult leader wields poses the most dangerous risk. Teresa inquires about the divine artifact, and Kang Jin Hayek identifies it as the filth-eating urn, explaining that it contains a spell that guarantees the death of a designated target. She seeks clarification on absolute certainty and questions whether this means they can't win. Kang Jin Hayek assures her he will attempt to block the spell at least once and mentions the time required for the cult leader to reuse it. He emphasizes that her role is crucial, she must subdue the cult leader before the spell activates again. Kang Jin Hayek opens the gate, signaling they have arrived, and asks if they are ready. He encourages them to remember what he told them, assuring them they will find the right path if they remember. Meanwhile, the cult leader expresses amusement that the individuals who disrupted the ritual have willingly approached him. 
he inquires about the whereabouts of the person who accompanied them, and the cult leader informs him that the individual left some time ago, claiming to have obtained everything needed. He considers this person to be quick-witted and contemplates eliminating him at this moment. The cult leader asserts that he doesn't know how the intruder broke free from God's restraints and utilized skills, but he is determined to offer him as a sacrifice to atone for the perceived atrocity. Removing his gown, he charges forward to attack. Observing an urn, Teresa realizes it must be the divine artifact Kang Jin Hayek mentioned. Kang Jin Hayek instructs Teresa to attack, and she swiftly kicks the cult leader, causing him to lose balance. Kang Jin Hayek advises gagging him, and Teresa wraps a cloth around his mouth. As Kang Jin Hayek approaches, the cult leader makes a move, throwing Teresa aside. Despite the attack, Kang Jin Hayek attempts to seize the urn, but the cult leader retaliates, striking him. In response, Kang Jin Hayek delivers a powerful punch, causing the cult leader to cry in pain. Kang Jin Hayek expresses confidence, stating that he has defeated someone ten times larger than himself barehanded before. Reflecting on his capabilities, he believes that he wouldn't lose in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Teresa admires his prowess, acknowledging him as expected. The cult leader laughs approvingly, commending Kang Jin Hayek as the greatest sacrifice. He decides to use him as a sacrifice first, removing the lid of the urn and proclaiming joy to their god Pityria. Teresa recognizes the spell Kang Jin Hayek warned them about. She remembers his instructions to estimate the cooldown time by observing the urn's eyes, so she prepares to take over. The urn's spell strikes Kang Jin Hayek, causing him to vomit blood and collapse. Teresa, witnessing his condition, shouts in disbelief, insisting that he cannot die. However, a message appears indicating his death and the disappearance of the Demon King's curse due to his demise. The cult leader laughs again, noting Kang Jin Hayek's death as a fresh sacrifice and expressing confidence that the Demon King God will also be pleased. Teresa approaches Kang Jin Hayek, urging him to wake up and open his eyes. Meanwhile, the cult leader laughs sadistically and inquires if she is pained by her comrade's death, emphasizing that it can't be considered a proper sacrifice. Fueled by anger, Teresa confronts him, prompting cult leader to dismiss her concerns about insufficient pain. He callously kicks her away. Observing Andrea, he instructs her to come closer. Teresa rises and retaliates, sitting on cult leader's shoulder to deliver blows, but he swiftly throws her aside. Undeterred, Teresa declares that she will never allow him to take Andrea, gearing up for another round of confrontation. Cult leader acknowledges that she still has some fight left in her. Teresa contemplates the impossibility of facing the cult leader head-on without her skills. As he charges towards her, proclaiming glory to their god, she maneuvers to evade his punch. Swiftly, she throws a piece of rock to shatter the lights, plunging the area into darkness. The cult leader ridicules her reliance on darkness, and she seizes the opportunity to hide. Determining that restricting his visibility is essential, Teresa resolves to take the urn away before he can again activate the lethal spell. Moving stealthily, she attempts to approach him from behind. However, he quickly detects her presence, and Teresa wonders how he found her so swiftly. The cult leader acknowledges her agility, but remarks that he will find her again, noting that her radiant blonde hair stands out even in the darkness. Unperturbed, he expresses his intent to knock her out, search for the hiding child, and have Teresa witness the sacrifice to the urn once she regains consciousness. Meanwhile, Teresa continues to run, and the cult leader praises her resilience, declaring endless glory to their god. He advises her to hide as best she can, confident that it's only a matter of time until he finds her. Realizing the importance of the time Kang Jin Hayek bought for her, Teresa resolves not to waste it. She picks up a piece of wood from the ground as he continues his search. The cult leader, spotting her hair, excitedly changes his mind, suggesting he'll spare her life if she swears to become a devotee. He adds that he plans to make Andrea the demon king god Saintess. Urging her to come out with a child, he warns that if she doesn't, she'll face death. However, he soon realizes that the bundle of hair is a decoy. 
Teresa, seizing the opportunity, emerges from behind and attempts to snatch the urn from his hand. Recalling Kang Jin Hayek's sacrifice, she believes her hair is inconsequential and decides to cut it off. She observes that his reaction speed is fast, and Andrea quickly throws a vase at him. Taking advantage of the distraction, Teresa snatches the urn from his hand. Teresa commends Andrea for her excellent timing, and he asks what she plans to do after taking it, questioning if she intends to appoint herself as a sacrifice. Teresa looks at the urn, recalling Kang Jin Hyuk's words about memorizing the rune language spell. Curious, she asks about it, and he explains that it's a rune language spell to be used at the right time, assuring her she'll know when that time comes. Back in the present, Teresa gazes at the urn, realizing that now is the right time. She recalls the spell Kang Jin Hayek taught her and confidently reads it. The cult leader questions how she knows the ancient rune language, and she reveals that a veteran taught her. She shows him the urn and recites the spell again, and the urn unleashes an attack on him, ultimately killing him. Teresa receives a notification that the boss of the fifth floor has been defeated. She throws the urn to the floor, quickly grabs Andrea, and checks on her. Andrea points toward Kang Jin Hayek, mentioning that he is hurt, and Teresa reassures her that she defeated the cult leader, urging Kang Jin Hayek to wake up. She apologizes for following him without permission, promising not to do it again, and tearfully pleads for him to wake up. Meanwhile, a message arrives stating that the Demon King God's authority has disappeared due to the absence of a boss monster, lifting skill usage restrictions. He activates the Blessing of the Star, allowing him to revive once, with a cooldown time of 240 hours, and he wakes up. Witnessing his revival, they both express immense joy, and he questions why she's crying again. He remarks that dying is extremely painful, recalling her tears in the maze. She explains that she can't help it, the tears just flow. Playfully, she punches his chest, but he winces in pain, saying it still hurts. Apologetically, she responds, and he asks about the reason behind her decision to cut her hair. Teresa shows him the notification indicating the defeat of the boss on the fifth floor and questions why the notice for the next floor opening isn't appearing after defeating the boss. Kang Jin Hayek gestures toward the exit and explains that the objective of the fifth floor is strictly to escape. In other words, this floor will be considered cleared if they pass through that door. However, he adds that there's something unique about this floor. He elaborates, stating that the fifth floor's unique point is that the boss monster seat can be inherited. When Teresa asks what he means by inherited, he picks up the urn from the ground and explains that since defeating the boss is not the clearing condition, the owner of this divine artifact urn becomes the new master of the floor. Sitting down near her, he expresses his intention to entrust that seat to Andrea. Curious, Teresa asks what he means by to Andrea. He reveals that he promised her a life without the cult leader and hands her the urn, stating that she can now live as she likes and in a way that no one can make her unhappy. Kang Jin Hayek then receives a message indicating that the seat of the master is being inherited and commencing rapid growth in accordance with the ruler's authority. Meanwhile, Andrea undergoes a transformation into a young girl, leaving Teresa in shock as she observes the change and remarks that she has grown up. Andrea, now in her transformed state, bows before Kang Jin Hayuk, introducing herself as the master of this desolate land. She declares that every being on this floor, including herself, will follow his will. Kang Jin Hayek receives a message indicating that Andrea, the master of the fifth floor, has sworn allegiance to him. This event marks the first time a boss monster has sworn allegiance to him and the achievement is being recorded in the Hall of Fame. Placing his hand on her head, he encourages Andrea to live with a smile on her face from now on. Turning her attention to Teresa, Andrea rushes to hug her, expressing the desire for her to visit often. Teresa agrees, and they share a moment of connection. Shortly after, a message arrives, announcing the opening of the sixth floor of the Tower of Trials. The time remaining to conquer the next floor is stated as 89 days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. Andrea walks away, and both Kang Jin Hayek and Teresa return from the fifth floor. 
After a while, the news broadcasts about the successful clearing of the fifth floor and everyone praises them while also condemning the Asian who scammed people by selling fake return stones. As a celebration for clearing the fifth floor, the beer is on the director. Chin Yusung watches the video and reflects that Kang Jin Hyuk isn't even giving him any room to chase after him. Feeling a presence at the door, he asks who's there. Gawain breaks the door and enters. Chin Yusung, getting up from his seat, demands to know who he is. Gawain introduces himself and sarcastically remarks that it's a bit narrow for Mr. Tizen Unknown's home, expressing expectations for something more classy. Chin Yusung, confused, asks who Unknown is and what he is talking about. Gawain clarifies that he is referring to someone who would do such a thing. Chin Yusung, infuriated, mentions Kang Jin Hayuk and proceeds to explode the house. On the other side, King Jin Hayek goes shopping with Alice, and she commands the salesgirl to pack bags from here to there, declaring that she'll buy them all. The salesgirl asks for clarification, questioning if she intends to buy all of the items. King Jin Hayek remarks that inflation is going to come because of her, to which Alice responds that she doesn't know who that is but welcomes it. Kang Jin Hayek reflects that, as payment for educating Andrea from time to time, he allows Alice to enjoy a cultural life. He contemplates the attitude, daily schedule, and overall knowledge one must have as a ruler and the life of a boss. Alice is teaching him all of this, and he considers it an introduction to boss's course, confident that she will become indispensable for his plans someday. Checking his status screen, he notes that his level has reached 32, and his strength, dexterity and stamina are at 20. His magic level is 98, rift is 100, luck is 10, and adaptability is 78. He marvels at his rapid growth, considering that even with what he earned on the fifth floor, his adaptability stat is now at 78. Comparing this to rankers who grind dungeons with the support of their guilds, he believes they should be around level 30. He contemplates that, considering the Rift stat, there are currently no players with better stats than him. Reflecting on the item he obtained by clearing the fifth floor, he still can't believe it. A notification appears, indicating that the boundary-bending mirror growth type has been acquired. Its use allows connection to anywhere on the 10th floor and below, with a cooldown time of 90 days and a duration of only 30 minutes. Another message follows, stating that the floor level that the player can connect to and the duration they can do so for will increase as they grow, and it can be accompanied by one other person. Anticipating that he will have much to prepare for from now on, he calls Kim Hee Woon, who picks up and remarks that it's rare for him to call first. Kang Jin Hayek informs him that there is something he needs him to do and asks if there are any issues. Kim Hee Wong responds that the issue is that things are going too well and mentions that Kang Jin Hayek has become so famous that it's harder to find a channel without him in it. Meanwhile, Kim Hee Wong adds that there are so many people wanting to apply because they saw him and that work is about to come to a screeching halt. King Jin Hayek asks if there are that many people, glancing at Alice, who is treated like a queen. Kim Hee Wong explains that there are hundreds flowing in each day, but shifts the focus, asking how he can help him. Kang Jin Hayek responds that he'll just send him a list, so he should reserve them all. Kim Hee Wong questions what the list is, and Kang Jin Hayek confirms, adding that he should also schedule a meeting with Fighting Father. After some time, Kang Jin Hayek arrives at a cafe to meet fighting father Kim Kitty while enjoying a shake. Kim Kitty asks if he has finished replenishing his carbohydrates and mentions that he has been waiting for his call. Kang Jin Hayek remarks that the last time they met was at the test, and it has really been a while. He reflects on how having power has changed the once big-headed Kim Kitty from the test into someone polite. Kang Jin Hayek apologizes for their deal regarding the Mandragora route, explaining that he has been busy climbing the tower. Kim Kitty acknowledges his busyness, and Kang Jin Hayek suggests lighting up. As a form of apology, he expresses his desire to change the conditions of their deal. He shares that, based on what he heard, Fighting Father has around 10 a rank dungeons on the third floor. Kim Kitty affirms this, and Kang Jin Hayek suggests going with him giving him one of them. He taps his hand on the table, 
stating that what he's proposing is to change the original deal of 10 dungeons on the first floor to receiving one a rank dungeon on the third floor. Kim Kitty responds, questioning if he wants to raise the condition on their end, despite not having provided the promised antidote recipe yet. Kang Jin Hayak confirms and asserts that's exactly right. Kim Kitty questions the grounds on which he is suggesting such a deal, and Kang Jin Hayak responds, citing an increase in the inflation rate, the price of raw materials, and labor costs. Kim Kitty dismisses the notion, stating they are not a charity group and didn't come to listen to absurd demands. He angrily places his hand on the table, expressing that it seems like he wasted his time, and declares he will consider this as if it never happened. Kang Jin Hyatt counters by mentioning the third floor labyrinth Grey Temple that his guild possesses. He reveals his guild's continuous failures in attempting to conquer it. As Kim Kitty walks away, he questions how Kang Jin Hayak knew about it. Kang Jin Hayak asserts that, being a guild master, he can acquire information like this anytime he wants. Kang Jin Hayak addresses Kim Kitty's continuous challenges of the Grey Temple, emphasizing that his reputation within the guild is in shambles due to constant failures. Kang Jin Hayek suggests that his position as team leader might be in danger at this rate and offers to clear the labyrinth for him. The scene shifts to Austria Vienna, where Kang Jin Hayek and Alice enjoy a music concert. After the performance, she stands up and claps, expressing her admiration for the beautiful performance. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that he has appreciated a masterpiece influencing an era and has completed going to a concert seven times, fulfilling the condition. Another message informs him that he has successfully copied the skills of perfect pitch and understanding of instruments. They move to a dining table and she calls a waiter, requesting two more bottles of the most expensive wine. Kang Jin Hayek thinks he should be able to finish it all today and return to Korea. While eating, he receives a message to eat at a Michelin 3-star restaurant 7 out of 10, observe the chef making the food 3 out of 5, and make different genres of dishes 25 out of 30. Meanwhile, she mentions that she's not saying she doesn't like it, but wonders why they are enjoying leisure like this. He replies that it's all for a reason, so she should just enjoy it while she can. She agrees, saying that's fine with her. He thinks about the Tower of Trials sixth floor, the elven forest, and the elves who are apathetic towards foreigners, guarding the beautiful forest. The next floor will open simply by spending 90 days on the floor. Most players mark their attendance on the sixth floor and go level up on some other floor. However, every single floor has an objective, as well as opportunities that one can acquire. He plans to go there fully prepared and receives a video call request from Kim Kitty, who informs him that it's ready to enter. Kang Jin Hayek enters the call, and a gray-haired man says they're here. He thinks teleportation magic is pretty nice, and the Advancement Temple is located on the third floor of the Tower of Trials, the most popular and flourishing agency for a player's first advancement. He contemplates that most people come to see the place's priestess to change their class without realizing that there is a heinous labyrinth deep underground. Kim Kitty comes from behind and mentions that he's here. Kang Jin Hayek replies that he's just in time. Kim Kitty responds of course, since this is very important, and says there are the members participating in today's raid. They all become excited to see Kang Jin Hayek, and Lee Yongguan expresses that it's an honor to meet him. He introduces himself as the captain of the second raid team, Lee Yongguan, and approaches Kang Jin Hayuk, mentioning that he has watched every single one of his YouTube videos. Kang Jin Hayuk thinks Lee Yongguan is a rather famous raid captain of Fighting Father, while Ha Yonsu introduces herself as the sub damage dealer. She mentions that she's a huge fan of him. Another girl introduces herself as the raid team's main healer and requests an autograph. Kim Kitty becomes irritated and says this isn't some fan meeting. Kang Jin Hayek thinks even the super elites of their guild are reduced to mere fans before him, but he guesses it doesn't matter. After a while, Kim Kitty states that Lee young is the raid captain in name, but he will give all authority to player Kang Jin Hayek. He mentions that Kang Jin Hayek can also have whatever comes out from the labyrinth, but he has one request, succeed in the raid. 
Kang Jin Hayek thinks he was planning on backstabbing him if he tried anything funny, but he guesses that's not necessary and replies understood. Kim Kitty states that let's meet at the entrance in 30 minutes after finishing preparations. Kang Jin Hayek moves forward and goes up the stairs to enter the temple. The first advancement priestess says he must possess a class to become stronger and asks him which path he will pursue. He receives a notification about revealing classes, then he thinks he has tried all the popular ones with his sub-accounts and contemplates the path he will pursue. He remarks that it's unpopular and hard to play, and this is perfect. Reflecting on his experiences in the museum and the labyrinth, he recalls having a lot of pride in his barrier skills. Deciding that he should trample him more thoroughly, he receives a message that he has accepted the Barrier Master Advancement quest. Outside, he notices some people and inquires about them. The Samurai Guild arrives, and their leader asks if Kim Kitty of Fighting Father is present, suggesting they talk. Kim Kitty expresses frustration, questioning why these people are here again and reiterating that he made it clear they are not allowed to participate in the Grey Temple Raid. Meanwhile, the leader of the Samurai Guild addresses team leader Kim Kitty, questioning whether they are aware of how many people are disappointed by Fighting Father's continuous raid failures. The leader suggests that rather than clinging to a labyrinth beyond their capabilities, wouldn't it be better to conquer it together for the sake of humanity? A member of Kim Kitty's team points out the Samurai Guild's enormous growth and mentions their strong teamwork and information gathering capabilities, wondering if they could clear the Grey Temple. Kim Kitty observes them and thinks they're even swaying public opinion, realizing this isn't good. Kang Jin Hayek joins the conversation, remarking that they sure are popular. The Samurai Guild inquires about him, and Kim Kitty introduces him as Kang Jin Hayek, the Korean ranker. The leader of the Samurai Guild wonders if he is Korean's rank Kang Jin Hayek and considers whether he might have some sort of connection to Fighting Father. Kang Jin Hayek mentions that he has been listening and something has bothered him. The Samurai leader asks what he is talking about. Kang Jin Hayek explains that they have been saying they'll fail because they're lacking in strength, but from what he can see, their forces are no different. Another member of the Samurai Guild insults him, questioning how dare he say such a thing, but their leader intervenes, asking everyone to calm down, considering Kang Jin Hayek's S rank status. The leader inquires if Kang Jin Hayek is suggesting that they're lacking in strength, and he responds affirmatively, stating that they are not up to the standard. Li Yongguan thinks about Kang Jin Hayek's statement, wondering if they are also not up to standard. The samurai leader dismisses Kang Jin Hayek's words, asserting that they have strength that can't even be compared to their group. Kang Jin Hayek asks about their strength, and the samurai leader reveals that they have a real veteran who has climbed all the way up to the 30th floor of the Tower of Trials. Kang Jin Hayek looks at him, puzzled by the mention of the 30th floor. The leader of the Samurai Guild asks if everyone heard that, emphasizing that they have someone who has climbed up to the 30th floor. He attributes their rapid rise to having information about territories unknown to others, awareness of traps and strategies for preparation. He declares their intention to use this knowledge to become the first heroes to save humanity from the Tower of Trials, suggesting that getting rich in the process wouldn't be a bad outcome. Kang Jin Hayek activates his skill, the Eye of Gluttony, confirming that the subject's words are true. He considers this a belief in the truth and decides to identify the one who made such statements. Kang Jin Hayek examines the status screens of everyone present and eventually identifies the individual Yamamoto Takeshi. He checks Yamamoto Takeshi's details, revealing that he is 25 years old, at level 27, with 16 strength, 26 dex, 23 stat, 32 mana, and 25,853 coins. Additionally, Yamamoto Takeshi possesses a unique ability called Hemi Foresight and some unique skills. Examining the details of Hemi Foresight, a half-baked foresight ability that can see into the upper floors based on its mastery, Kang Jin Hayek finds the situation increasingly interesting. Yamamoto Takeshi acknowledges the accuracy of the foresight, while another member of the Samurai Guild notes that the trap did not activate. The guild leader commends Yamamoto Takeshi, recognizing him as the real deal. 
Kang Jin Hayuk, who possesses the ability, contemplates the secrecy surrounding the partially acquired skill, wondering if better treatment could be obtained by presenting it as something whole. He reflects on his certainty about this strategy and questions why the guild leader is fixating on him alone, as he observes Kang Jin Hayuk. Kang Jin Hayuk expresses his lack of knowledge about the individual, but acknowledges their greatness in climbing to the 30th floor. He emphasizes the rarity of leaked information from above the 10th floor. The leader of the Samurai Guild underscores the power of information in this era and suggests that Kang Jin Hayuk allows them to accompany him obediently. Kim Kitty expresses anger, doubting the credibility of such claims. Kang Jin Hayuk intervenes, halting Kim Kitty, and suggests that they should have been informed earlier. He questions the necessity of prolonged discussion and proposes heading inside together. Meanwhile, the leader expresses relief, finding someone with whom he can actually communicate. He instructs team leader Kim Kitty to stop frowning as he passes near him, mentioning that they can enhance his reputation if they manage to clear the temple. He orders his team to move, and they all enter the temple. Kim Kitty asks Kang Jin Hayak about the meaning of this decision and how he could let them go in with them. He questions what will become of them if they just let them in, considering all their protests. Kang Jin Hayak responds that he wouldn't have allowed them in if he hadn't conceded to them. Kim Kitty responds of course he would have done whatever it took to stop them. Kang Jin Hayuk replies that's not good and suggests looking at how much they want to become heroes. He asks, shouldn't they at least give them the opportunity to experience whether it's easy or not to play heroes by laying their hands on someone's food? Kim Kitty thinks this guy is crazy, wondering what the hell he is planning now. Li Yongguan says they'll be off as well, and they all enter the temple. Kang Jin Hayuk receives a notification that he has entered the Labyrinth Grey Temple. They observe numerous people turned into stone bodies. Yamamoto Takeshi comments, look at these, they're players who challenged the labyrinth first. Another person expresses concern, asking if there's no way to turn them back. Yamamoto Takeshi replies negatively, stating that considering oneself a goner is inevitable if one locks eyes with it. The leader reassures them, claiming he has already thought up a countermeasure and activates the shield of Perseus. All his team members commend him for being well prepared, and Kang Jin Hayek observes the shield, thinking they must have spent a significant amount of money. He doubts if they even know how to use it properly though. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification that the condition has been fulfilled, and the second perk for the one who first conquered the tower has arrived. In this critical moment, he acknowledges that getting his first class advancement quest triggered the arrival of a perk. Another message informs him that he has acquired Moon Imprint, and this ability will display its effect once the first class advancement is complete. He proceeds to check the details of the Moon Impact skill, which reduces the activation time of all barriers by 25% and increases the effects of all barriers by 30%. If he manages to find every lost language buried within the tower long ago, he can learn the nameless barriers, revealing the locations where he can find the lost languages upon his first advancement. Meanwhile, he contemplates which lost language he has encountered as he climbed the tower, but he could never find any clues for them. He concludes that all of this is the reward given to the one who first conquered the tower and realizes there's still something about the tower that he doesn't know. Yamamoto Takeshi whispers in leader's ear, prepare for combat, it's a gigant cobra. They all spot the cobra, and the leader instructs them to maintain formation, break down its spirit, and orders the main damage dealers to attack. They collectively assault the cobra, and the leader urges them to get ready, prompting them to run and attack the cobra. In one swift attempt, the leader attacks and kills the cobra, leaving Li Yongguan surprised and commenting on their incredible prowess, stating that there's nothing for them to do here. He expresses his disappointment, calling their situation pathetic. Kang Jin Hayuk observed him as he exhales, stating that these father fighters still have a long way to go and are likely demoralized by just that. From what he can discern, they wouldn't even last a minute against someone like Alice. He proceeds to the fifth floor of the Tower of Trial, where Alice guides Andrea and inquires about how many times she must emphasize that's not how she does it. 
she asserts that she'll demonstrate again, instructing Andrea to watch carefully as she commands her to submit, all the while looking down. Andrea applauds and acknowledges that she is indeed different from just feeling alone. She responds, affirming that of course she and Andrea are fundamentally different. If Andrea understands, then he should try again, which he confirms. One of the samurai team members inquires the leader about the direction they should take due to the multitude of paths. The leader surveys the surroundings and directs the question to Yamamoto Takeshi, who contemplates which path appears bright and secure versus the one that seems susceptible to ambush. Yamamoto Takeshi struggles to articulate a response, realizing that his foresight did not anticipate such a scenario. Kang Jin Hayek swiftly interjects, expressing understanding and commending the leader for choosing the left path as expected of a veteran. He remarks that most individuals might have been deceived by the seemingly dangerous right path, employing reverse psychology. Kang Jin Hayek is aware that those who fall for such superficial tricks are condemned in this labyrinth. Although uncertain of the leader's identity, Kang Jin Hayek entrusts him to lead, instructing the team to head left. They all follow Yamamoto Takeshi, while Kang Jin Hayek reflects on the limitations of his foresight and concludes that he too would have chosen the left path. He muses that it ultimately doesn't matter, as their fate is sealed regardless of the chosen direction. Suddenly, Yamamoto Takeshi spots a light ray and questions its origin, speculating if it could be a laser approaching. Meanwhile, the leader contacts Yamamoto Takeshi, who questions whether this is just a simple trap. The leader reassures him not to worry too much, activates skill mana infusion, and erects a shield around them. Instructing the team to block the impending threat, they find themselves hurt as a result of the laser. The leader notes that the opposition is breaching their defenses and urges more mana infusion. He specifically directs Yamamoto Takeshi to stay behind him. Yamamoto Takeshi, thinking it's all due to Kang Jin Hayek, acknowledges that Kang Jin Hayek won't emerge unscathed from this situation either. Kang Jin Hayek activates the beginning the Barrier Master's first advancement quest and also triggers the inadequate physical barrier. A message notifies him that he has fulfilled the first condition of the advancement quest and he successfully blocks all the lasers. Yamamoto Takeshi observes Kang Jin Hayek's actions. Li Yongguan expresses surprise, asking what in the world is happening, while Ha Yonsu remarks that it's her first time witnessing something like this. Observing the laser reflecting on his barrier, Kang Jin Hayek contemplates that this might be the limit until advancement. Nonetheless, he dismisses the significance, as he has fulfilled the first advancement condition the activation of a barrier. Instructing everyone to stay inside his barrier, he steps out, prompting Ha Yonsu to question his destination. He responds that he needs to retrieve some items. When asked why, he explains that Ha Yonsu will receive an item if she successfully evades the lasers 300 times in a row. Both of them express shock at his statement as he ventures out, inviting Ha Yonsu to join him in the challenge, assuring her that it's not as difficult as it appears as long as she follows the beat. Demonstrating, he jumps and evades the lasers, asserting that it's not that challenging. Observing Kang Jin Hayek's actions, Li Yongguan finds it unbelievable. While the samurai guild members are screaming and in complete disarray, Kang Jin Hayek is smiling. He questions Kim Kitty, wondering if it's not too great a loss for their side to concede everything to Kang Jin Hayek. Meanwhile, Kim Kitty remarks that Kang Jin Hayek must still be too young to comprehend the situation fully. He states that there are times when one needs to accept things, even if it means enduring losses and stepping aside to avoid hindering progress. Kim Kitty adds that it is a valid strategy if certainty in crushing the opponent is not guaranteed. Observing Kang Jin Hayek crossing the laser while jumping, Li Yongguan thinks this must be the reason the team leader made such a statement. As Kang Jin Hayek successfully clears the hidden mission and receives a message about it, he remarks that the best reward follows after working up a sweat. He acquires a burning flame. Meanwhile, one of the samurai team members, Yoshida, suffers a hand injury due to the laser and calls for help. His partner declares him dead and urgently requests a healer to come. 
The leader instructs everyone to get up and first confirms the number of injured and deceased. Kang Jin Hayek observes the situation and notes that many of them are injured. He explains that the barrier was designed to accommodate only 30 people, so he couldn't allow any more to enter. After a while, the leader confronts him, expressing frustration and questioning if he was aware of the trap. He calmly acknowledges that yes, he knew and inquires if that is a problem. The leader, upset, emphasizes the severity of the situation, pointing out that people are dead. Unperturbed, he explains that he yielded to the leader's insistence, allowing him to join because he boasted about being a 30th floor veteran and asserts that the leader has no right to be angry. The leader, angered by his response, continues to berate him, questioning whether he seriously believes the samurai guild will let him get away with this. In response, he dismisses the leader's concerns, questioning if this is the appropriate time for such arguments. A notification informs him that the special conditions for the quest are fulfilled. The death of more than 50% of the raid party members due to the traps and the acquisition of the burning flame. Another message alerts them to the awakening of the Guardian of the Grey Temple, and they witness a giant cobra. The leader queries the unexpected development, asking what is happening. Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification and identifies the creature as the fire-drinking snake, cautioning everyone to stay vigilant, as this is where things truly begin. He advises if anyone has something to argue about, to do it after they ensure their survival. They all witness the fire-drinking snake roaring, and Kang Jin Hayek checks its details, confirming it as the fire-drinking snake with a level of 55. It's noted as a pet snake adored by Medusa, and its entire body is composed of fire, rendering physical attacks ineffective. The leader remarks that the formation isn't ready yet, causing fear among his team members. Kang Jin Hayek questions why the leader doesn't hand it over now that he realizes his position. Confused, the leader asks what he's asking to hand over. King Jin Hayek points to his shield and suggests it would be better to give it to him if the leader doesn't use it properly. The leader dismisses the idea, stating that no lunatic would hand over a divine artifact. King Jin Hayek accepts this and activates the glacier formation, declaring that he'll take it off the leader's corpse. He moves behind the glacier as the leader shouts and calls for him to wait. A notification alerts them that the fire-drinking snake is activating the Spear of Fury. One of them advises to dodge it, but the leader points out they're in a one-way tunnel with nowhere to dodge. He calls Yamamoto Takeshi, instructing him to stay behind him. The Spears of Fury attack and the leader shouts at Yamamoto Takeshi to survive, no matter what. Meanwhile, members of the Samurai Guild are engulfed in flames, including their leader, whose shield falls down. Kang Jin Hayek arrives, grabs the fallen shield, and comments that he had warned the leader about its improper use. He turns to Yamamoto Takeshi, questioning the value of a divine artifact if the wielder is incompetent, and asks if Yamamoto Takeshi agrees. A notification informs him that it's the Shield of Perseus, a divine artifact used by the hero of Greek mythology, Perseus, to confront Medusa. The shield's ability increases proportionally to the wielder's latent potential. Yamamoto Takeshi demands to know who Kang Jin Hayek is and how he can act as if he knows everything. Kang Jin Hayek responds by asking if Yamamoto Takeshi can't see the answer with the foresight he's so proud of. Yamamoto Takeshi deems it impossible and questions how Kang Jin Hayek saw through his skill. He implores Kang Jin Hayek to reveal his connection to the tower. Kang Jin Hayek asserts that he doesn't see a single future related to Yamamoto Takeshi. As Kang Jin Hayek speaks, he notices the fire-drinking snake behind him. Kang Jin Hayek admits it's a bit embarrassing to say it himself, just as the snake attacks him. Swiftly, he activates the glacier formation, blocking the attack, and criticizes the snake for roaring when people are talking. He then confines it in a glacial prison, leaving Yamamoto Takeshi shocked by the display. He explains that he is, in fact, an exiled deity of the tower. Yamamoto Takeshi, trying to comprehend, considers if deities are the absolute beings ruling over the upper floors of the tower, explaining why Kang Jin Hayek's abilities far surpass human capability. 
Reverently, he bows down and pleads for forgiveness for not recognizing such a being. Kang Jin Hayek, contemplating the notion of being a deity, questions why he would be ascending one floor at a time if that were true, suggesting he could have created an elevator or something. He adds that his current appearance is a result of being exiled into a human body, but it seems he may be useful in conquering the upper floors in the future. Yamamoto Takeshi, now standing, expresses gratitude for Kang Jin Hayek thinking highly of him. Kang Jin Hayek proposes the idea of conquering the tower together, and Yamamoto Takeshi sees it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be chosen by a deity. He thanks Kang Jin Hayek profusely, expressing it as an honor and pledges to do his best. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek responds positively, stating that in that case, he will grant Yamamoto Takeshi a stigmata as a token of their pact. He explains that the stigmata are designed to burn the bearer to death if they betray the pact, activating it with the brand of tribulation. King Jin Hayek emphasizes that it's not the right time yet, cautioning Yamamoto Takeshi never to expose this secret. Yamamoto Takeshi acknowledges this and is instructed to go and carry out the tasks assigned to him. King Jin Hayek deactivates the inadequate physical barrier, allowing all raid members to come out of the glacier. Li Yongguan expresses gratitude, stating that Kang Jin Hayek defeated the monster that wiped out the Samurai Guild single-handedly. Li Yongguan adds their survival is owed to him, though Kang Jin Hayek downplays their contribution, appreciating their gratitude. However, he notes it's too early to speak, as if everything is over. Li Yongguan interjects, stating she's not the type to stand for the death of her pet. Kang Jin Hayek agrees, cautioning them to prepare for combat as he spots another snake. A team member raises concerns about looking at Medusa, and Kang Jin Hayek quickly intervenes, placing a hand over the team member's mouth. Medusa gazes into the eyes of the restrained team member, transforming them into stone. She shouts in anger, condemning the disgraceful humans for invading her temple and laying their filthy hands on her child. Kang Jin Hayek receives a message that Grey Temple boss Medusa has appeared, prompting everyone to attempt an escape. However, Medusa's powerful mana proves to be harmful to those trying to flee. Li Yongguan urges the group to gather themselves for this critical moment. He activates collecting leadership and fear resistance, boosting the morale of party members by 20% as they all run to attack Medusa. Ha Yonsu activates Lightning Bolt and directs her attack towards Medusa, who responds by questioning the effectiveness of their assault. Medusa scoffs, wondering if they believe she's merely a moron limited to using petrification. In response, Li Yongguan lands a hit with her attack, causing Medusa to bleed. Ha Yonsu, with her eyes closed, hears an unfamiliar sound and asks if Li Yongguan got hit. Frustrated by her lack of awareness, Ha Yon Su questions what's happening and if everything is all right. Meanwhile, Medusa approaches Ha Yon Su from behind, preparing to launch an attack. Suddenly, Kang Jin Hayek intervenes, reaching and throwing Medusa away with the Divine Artifact Shield. He instructs Ha Yon Su and all other raid members to stay back, declaring that he will handle this. They all run out while Kang Jin Hayek stands alone in front of Medusa. She questions how he is not turning into stone after locking eyes with her, and he activates the Eye of Gluttony, receiving a message that he's immune to petrification. He retorts, suggesting it's because she's weak. Medusa, offended, calls him an ill-mannered human and activates Gorgon's domain. Kang Jin Hayek counters by activating a magic attack speed increase of 30% and a movement speed decrease of 15%. He asserts that she won't have a quick death and threatens to melt him whole as she activates acidic fluid. However, Kang Jin Hayek quickly reacts by activating Demon King's steps, increasing his movement speed by 70% and swiftly runs towards her to attack. He taunts her, questioning how she expects to hit him with slow attacks. Medusa, in response, activates Viper's strike and counterattacks. Nevertheless, the Divine Artifact answers its master's call, increasing physical and magical defense by 300%, effectively blocking her attack. Kang Jin Hayek reflects that even after using Gorgon's domain, her strike was deflected. Meanwhile, he activates the Ceiling Coffin Barrier and attacks her, 
aiming to fulfill the final condition required to advance to a barrier master by successfully trapping a boss monster in a barrier and tying her up. Despite her resistance, he manages to trap her within the barrier. She questions whether he thinks he can trap her with a glass wall like this and attempts to break free from the trap. Observing her attempts, he activates Giant's Clutch, grabbing two large rocks and hurling them towards her. She breaks the rocks and dismisses the tactic as barbaric, insisting that such methods won't work on her. Despite her defiance, he continues to evade her attacks. Activating another trap, Giant's Clutch, he holds two big rocks and throws them at her. She breaks them and dismisses the tactic as barbaric, insisting that something like that won't work on her. She wonders what's going on, perceiving his attacks as a barrage, however, she is caught off guard as a small rock hits her face. Not sensing any killing intent in his attacks, she realizes too late that he set a trap around her, drawing runes using the ashes from the corpses. He activates the three-star barrier ceiling coffin, successfully capturing her, and receives a notification that a powerful binding force shackles the target. Confidently, he asserts that she won't be able to break out of this one, as he has put a lot of effort into it. After a while, she shouts for him to release her instantly, to which he replies by instructing her to stop wasting her strength and to stay still. A message notifies him that the barrier monster advancement quest condition, trapping a boss monster in a barrier, has been fulfilled. This achievement marks the completion of the third condition required to advance to a barrier master. Reflecting on the difficulty of trapping a boss monster alive, he considers that most people typically trap a goblin boss on the first floor. However, he contemplates the prospect of succeeding in trapping a higher-ranking boss monster. Another message arrives, confirming that he has successfully trapped a boss monster of the highest rank available in the advancement quest, resulting in his advancement to a superior class, either Barrier Master or Rune Interpreter. Examining the details of the Rune Interpreter class, he discovers that he's now capable of understanding the essence of runes, reinterpreting them, and creating previously non-existent barriers. Barriers crafted by a Rune Interpreter are noted to be twice as effective as regular barriers. Excitedly, he exclaims affirmatively, acknowledging that he anticipated the emergence of a hidden class. He believes that the more challenging the conditions he fulfills, the better the rewards become, signifying the opportunity to dig even deeper for superior rewards. Another message arrives, indicating the engraving of Moon Imprint, which reduces the activation time of all barriers by 25% and increases the effects of all barriers by 30%. After a while, he mentions that not only that, there's even a perk, and he's enthusiastic about the tormenting possibilities that come with it. She asks what he is going to do to her and questions if he intends to kill her. He replies, pondering that he could skin her and make some decent armor. She becomes emotional, asking what he is saying. He reflects that it's usually common knowledge to kill a boss monster since one can obtain experience points, rewards, and items. However, there is no merit in killing Medusa. He thinks about how Medusa's head loses its petrification ability when it leaves the temple and armor made from snakeskin deals continuous poison damage to its wearer. In that case, he considers what use there is for a captured alive Medusa. Checking his coin exchange market, he purchases a brass bowl, trihorn goat's blood, swamp grasshopper hind leg x6, and mentee's lotus, having paid 3,350 coins. Meanwhile, he gathers all those items, creates a paste, and draws some magical circles on the ground. He receives a notification that a secret circuit has been connected through the magic circle. He then engages in a conversation with Rick Hennessy, who expresses surprise at how he discovered the contact information. Rick Hennessy asks how in the world he found out about it, stating his astonishment. He replies that he bought some random stuff and mixed them together, finding it to be an extremely strange coincidence. Rick Hennessy, unable to make excuses, emphasizes that he has not shared this contact information, not even with the deities. He insists that he must know how he found out about it. He casually responds, noting the presence of a live monster, Medusa, and suggests that he knew Rick Hennessy would be interested. 
Recognizing Rick as an avid collector of anything related to Greek mythology, he believes that Rick won't pass up on this opportunity and mentions that he was just about to finish off Medusa. He responds by saying, well, since he's here, he might as well watch. He activates Grave of Swords, and Rick Hennessy shouts that he mustn't kill such a precious thing. Rick continues, stating that he doesn't care how he found his contact information and emphasizes that what's good is good. He offers to open a gate leading there for him, suggesting they talk face to face. Rick mentions that further things may turn out very interesting with this meeting and smiles. He wonders about the meaning of that smile, while Rick Hennessy proceeds to open a gate. Rick invites him to come in, and he enters, observing that this place looks different and features ancient statues. Rick Hennessy welcomes him to the 42nd floor of the Tower of Trials, the city of the old Egyptian gods, White Oasis. Kang Jin Hayek thinks that he can't believe he has set foot on the 42nd floor already. It's his first time encountering a deity before reaching level 100. He remarks that he initially thought he was being transported to the Great Library, but never expected to be brought to a place like this. He asks if Rick Hennessy is taking a vacation here. Rick Hennessy responds, expressing a desire for a vacation, but clarifying that he is here for business. He states that it is the residence of the Egyptian gods he knows all too well about. Rick mentions that they've been wanting to meet him very much, so he guesses he could say things worked out well. Kang Jin Hayek senses from Rick's words that he must have found out about the lie regarding receiving protection from an Egyptian god. As they both walk towards a castle, a monster notices Kang Jin Hayek and comments that there is a human. Another one adds that she heard humans enter the tower, but to think one is already here. Rick Hennessy stops and asks if Kang Jin Hayek knows what this is while pointing towards a big hole in the ground. He explains that it's where the Sphinx originally was, although now it's nothing more than a giant crater. Rick adds that it was formed after it was revealed that Kang Jin Hayek swindled in the name of Lord Anubis. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek sits down and picks up a piece of rock, expressing disappointment over the waste of a statue of high artistic value. Rick Hennessy asks if he's not afraid of the absolute beings with such great power, questioning who rules over the upper floors of the tower. Kang Jin Hayek throws the rock away, stating that he wonders if he really needs to be afraid, emphasizing that it's not even the 50th floor. Rick Hennessy laughs, finding it very amusing, and they enter the castle. The god of death, Anubis, places his hand in anger on his chair, expressing displeasure at Kang Jin Hayek's shamelessness and questioning how dare he stand before him after dirtying his name. The god of resurrection, Osiris, laughs, commenting on the sorry state Anubis has ended up in. Rick Hennessy pays his respects by bowing down in front of Anubis, and Kang Jin Hayek interjects, saying that he didn't come here because he wanted to see him. He was just deceived by this old man while pointing to Rick Hennessy. After a while, Anubis becomes furious, getting up from his seat and attempting to put his feet on Kang Jin Hayek while verbally abusing him. Rick Hennessy quickly intervenes, stating that Kang Jin Hayek is here by his right as a guest, and he wouldn't think of defying the laws of this tower in front of him. Anubis steps back while Osiris laughs at him once again, commenting that he's pretty funny today. Rick Hennessy observes that player Kang Jin Hayek didn't even flinch, as if he already knows about the laws of the tower. Anubis declares that if he can't kill Kang Jin Hayek directly, he'll do it within the rules of the tower. A message arrives, indicating that Anubis is summoning a warrior, the Deliverer of the Dead. Rick Hennessy considers it the strongest warrior that can be summoned against a player on the sixth floor and notes that Anubis has chosen to bring out the Deliverer of the Dead. Rick Hennessy believes that Kang Jin Hayek can't defeat it with his current abilities and wonders how he will get out of this situation. Anubis announces that if Kang Jin Hayek lasts five seconds against his warrior, he'll let him choose one thing from the temple's treasury. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification asking if he would like to accept the dual request from Anubis, the ruler of the 42nd floor. Anubis proposes that he has to last for five seconds, and Kang Jin Hayek decides to accept the challenge. 
he purchases royal blood from the coin exchange screen and 2 million coins are deducted, leaving him with 1,242 coins. Activating Blessing of the Star, he receives a message that holy royal blood has been completed, signifying his acceptance of the duel. He also activates Demon King's steps and swiftly attacks the Deliverer of the Dead, throwing him to the ground. A message arrives indicating that the extreme clash in attributes has resulted in a fatal effect, increasing Kang Jin Hayek's damage by 1500% and Anubis's warrior has been defeated. Kang Jin Hayek remarks that five seconds seemed a bit too long. Osiris expresses disbelief, stating that it's impossible. A mere human on the sixth floor has defeated Anubis's warrior. Anubis, shocked, responds with irritation stating that attacking as soon as he accepts isn't fair. The god of the sun, Horus, intervenes calling Anubis and reminding him that this is a promise he made himself. Horus emphasizes that he is not thinking of defying the rules of the tower. Anubis rises from his place, muttering, God damn it, do whatever they want. In response, Horus offers an apology, stating that he will guide him to the treasury. He urges him to follow and escorts him to the treasury, emphasizing that it's time to make a choice as a promise is a promise. Prior to the decision, Horus expresses confidence in the human's potential to climb higher in the future. He proposes the idea of becoming a resident who rules the floor by choosing one of them, promising that in doing so, the human will receive power more valuable than the mere treasures in the treasury. Horus assures that their support will be genuine this time. Rick Hennessy contemplates the implications of Lord Horus's words, realizing that he is extending a one-time power selection offer to a human currently situated on the sixth floor. This would mean the human ends up actually receiving protection from a deity. Finding the situation intriguing, Rick Hennessy reflects on the significance of such an offer. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek asserts that he doesn't require such assistance. Horus questions his decision, asking why he doesn't need it. Kang Jin Hayek reiterates his stance, explaining that he has plans to ascend to a higher place than the current floor. Consequently, he sees no need to accept help from this level and views it more as a gift, pointing towards something in the process. Horus acknowledges the human's audacity. Following that, Horus proceeds to Anubis, who stands on the balcony and inquires if it is over. Horus affirms that it is, pointing out that Anubis's temperament is always his downfall. Anubis dismisses the comment and demands to know what choice the human made. Horus reveals that he opted for the black egg of the ancients. Anubis questions why the black one, asking if he chose it while aware of its nature. Horus responds with uncertainty, stating that he couldn't confirm it, but one thing is certain. Depending on what the human does with the egg, it may bring calamity to humans. Meanwhile, on the other side, Alice observes things on her phone and notices the black egg in front of her. She wonders about the nature of this egg of the ancients. She questions why he chose something like this, emphasizing that he should be aware of the potential consequences if the egg hatches improperly. He inquires if it's really that bad, to which she responds by illustrating a scenario where he somehow survives, but ponders where she would go shopping if the thing blows the entire city away and disappears. He summons her back, and she expresses frustration, stating that she told him not to summon her back and forth without notice. He instructs her to stay there for a bit. Upon touching the egg, he remarks that, for the first time in a while, he thinks it's time to actually focus for real. King Jin Hayek contemplates that the only information he knows about the ancients is a single phrase from the tower's eccentric adventurer, Fessis. The solution is delicious mana. He systematically activates the elements of fire, glacier formation, blessing of the star, and the true heavenly flower cultivation technique. A notification appears, stating that the egg of the ancients is absorbing mana from the atmosphere. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on how appetizing this might be, and soon, the egg breaks, revealing a baby dragon. He observes the hatchling seeking the mana it just tasted and decides to gather his remaining mana, giving it the form of a stone and offering it to the baby dragon as his first treat for it. The baby dragon sniffs and consumes the stone. K. 
Kang Jin Hayek then receives a message indicating that engraving a stigma on the ancient and his notable achievement of being the first to tame an ancient will be recorded in the Hall of Fame. All beings within the tower show interest in his accomplishment. Meanwhile, another message is received by him, stating that once he gives his pet a name, its loyalty towards him will increase further. While he thinks of a name, he says okay. Since the pet is black with yellow eyes, he holds the baby dragon in his hands and says, let's name him Gaguma. He thinks it's cute, but he realizes that he won't have enough mana if he has to feed it. A notification was received stating that the intermediate administrator, Rick Hennessy, has subscribed to his channel, and the commission fee rate has decreased from 90% to 80%. After a while, Kang Jin Yuk reaches SWB Station, where SWB Station manager Kang Byung-chin asks him what he thinks. He mentions that he just has to make an appearance and partake in a simple interview. Kang Jin Hayek, while drinking his shake, is irritated to see the script and asks if the manager usually takes care of things like this himself. Kang Byung-chin replies that it's normal when he's involved, and if he makes an appearance and shares some of his rating life hacks, people will go absolutely insane, guaranteeing a 40% rating as their program is the best in the industry. After a while, the scene shifts to SWB station on interview day. Director Hong Diok Pio arrives at SWB station and states that the day has finally come as he emerges from his car. Reporters inquire whether director Hong Diok Pio is making a surprise appearance in today's program, and if the relationship between the Black Cloud Guild and player Kang Jin Hayek has been restored. While they observe Ten Ko, someone else arrives and emerges from a car. Reporters identify her as the S-rank Ten Ko from the Junghua Guild, even the S-rank Zuhua. One of the reporters asserts that the program will surely attract attention with such an all-star cast, and another predicts that the ratings will be extraordinary. Kang Jin Hayuk also arrives, and reporters capture them all. Kang Jin Hayuk asks Hong Diak Pio how he has been. He replies that he's been good, thanks to Kang Jin Hayuk. He has been very busy restoring his image, which was tarnished from that humiliation. Kang Jin Hayek asks if he called two friends to show off his connections. He replies that he said he would appear, so shouldn't he do at least this much? Ten Ko and Zhu Hua look at Kang Jin Hayek and think that he's their target, while another car arrives and Teresa comes out. Reporters mention that it's the Saintess of Amsterdam, Teresa, and even Yu Chinong, Korea's strongest martial artist, along with the sword Saint Chin Yusung. One reporter asks Chen Yusung why he answered Kang Jin Hayek's call, considering he had rejected recruitment offers from every guild. The reporter questions whether they are comrades. Chen Yusung replies that they are not. Kang Jin Hayek is someone he will defeat. Another reporter remarks that Hong Diak Pio seems to believe Yu Chenong, who should have long been dead, the Saintess Teresa, and even Chen Yusung are on Kang Jin Hayek's side. Ten Ko and Zhu Hua walk away, and Hong Diok Pio sees them. He asks where they are two going. He adds that they said they would appear on the program together with him. Ten Ko responds that they've fulfilled their objective, and they are no longer duty-bound to uphold the condition. Hong Diok Pio asks what's the objective. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek tells him that if he is going to show off connections, then he should have done so properly. Hong Diok Pio thinks that after working so hard to create this opportunity, he runs behind a reporter and says, wait, interview him. But the reporter opens his belt and leaves his pants in Hong Diok Pio's hands. Hong Diok Pio questions if the reporter would even take off his pants for him. The scene shifts inside the station, where Chen Yusung asks if Kang Jin Hayek is reveling in Hong Diok Pio's despair. Kang Jin Hayek responds that he's grateful Chen Yusung is there, but he'd appreciate it if Chen Yusung didn't meddle in his private life. Chen Yusung retorts, questioning what private life, and mentions Kang Jin Hayek's house being destroyed because of him. Kang Jin Hayek insists he has absolutely no idea what Chen Yusung means and tells him not to play dumb. Chen Yusung brings up the 16 videos he has of Kang Jin Hayek and claims he can figure out that he's unknown right away. Kang Jin Hayek thinks about Chen Yusung as a damn stalker while guards search them both.
Kang Jin Hayek then changes the topic, asking Chen Yusung what he thought about the guy sent by the Demonic Human Association after fighting him. He responds that Gawain, the one named, was fairly strong, but compared to their fights, it felt extremely light, that's all. Yu Chunong asks about her relationship with Kang Jin Hayuk. She replies that he is a comrade whom she trusts more than anyone else. He comments, is that so, she's got some competition. The program host announces the start of the recording, stating they are featuring some special individuals in this episode of Beyond the Tower of Trials. She says, first, player Kang Jin Hayuk is the center of attention due to his absurd clearing speed. She asks if he has some special know-how for clearing the tower. He responds that it is to just do it until she gets it right. The host inquires about the third floor, to which Kang Jin Hayuk advises her to simply dodge all obstacles. When questioned about the fourth floor, he gives a similar response, emphasizing the need to evade everything. Following the program, director expresses frustration about the challenges of broadcasting such content. Observing the program on TV, he questions Kang Jin Hayuk's understanding of the significant losses incurred when a broadcast recording is wasted. Director adds that the recording has been thoroughly disrupted, leading to chaos, and criticizes Kang Jin Hayuk for shamelessly expecting his appearance fee. Unperturbed, Kang Jin Hayek calmly sits, sips his shake, and reiterates that he merely fulfilled the terms of the contract. Kang Bongchen dismisses this logic as far-fetched and grabs Kang Jin Hayek's collar, mentioning Li Jiangsu and asking if he remembers who that is. Director gazes at his picture with Li Jiangsu, confirming that it is the same Li Jiangsu he had in mind. Kang Jin Hayuk acknowledges Li Jiangsu as the CEO of the streamer entertainment company, someone he once considered a brother. Director reveals their past collaboration with Li Jiangsu, plotting to exploit streamers through oppressive contracts. He mentions a time when streamers protested together at the office. Kang Jin Hayuk asserts that he was also present during those protests, urging Kang Byeongchun to recall. Director expresses gratitude for the lessons he learned from those experiences, understanding how to avoid being taken advantage of and identifying the streamers being exploited through cleverly crafted contracts. He then asks Kang Jin Hayek if he remembers what he had said about the contracts. Kang Jin Hayek responds that there is no issue with the contracts and examines one. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek questions if Kang Byeongchun still considers his logic far-fetched. Kang Byeongchun utilizes his eye scan to open the door to the magic stone storage room, and upon entering, he reveals it to be the station's magic stone storage room. They observe the abundance of magic stones within. He explains that, according to the contract, Kang Jin Hayuk has the opportunity to use an unlimited number of magic stones in this room for the next two hours. Kang Jin Hayuk inquires why only for two hours. Kang Byeongchun clarifies that the contract stipulates this duration, granting him the freedom to use the magic stones for various purposes. He adds that anti-theft spells are cast on these stones, preventing them from being placed in subspace inventories. Kang Jin Hayek reflects on the limitation and considers absorbing the magic stones, but he recognizes the impracticality due to the time required for absorption. Kang Byeongchun assures him he can ask the staff members if he needs anything, emphasizing the restricted entry and exit in this area. One of director's staff members becomes excited upon seeing Kang Jin Hayuk and starts taking pictures of him. Kang Jin Hayuk observes her and contemplates that Kang Byeongchun's plan might be to tarnish his reputation if he attempts to take the magic stones forcibly. He acknowledges this strategy and decides to make the most of the next two hours. Kang Byeongchun expresses excitement about Kang Jin Hayak's decision and exits the room, stating that he will see him in two hours. He instructs his staff to treat Kang Jin Hayak well and closes the door. Kang Jin Hayak then proposes to show something unique. The director enters Kang Jin Hayak's room, holding a picture with Lee jong -soo. He expresses regret over Lee jong sus unjust death, discards the image in the dustbin, and reflects on the need for living people to stay alive. Frustrated, he wonders why Li Jiangsu haunts him even after death. The director thinks about minimizing losses in magic stones and contemplates ways to distance himself from this situation, 
Considering the option of involving journalists and creating controversy, he decides to think about it more after escaping the current predicament. After a while, the director returns to the storage room and inquires player Kang Jin Hyuk if he is satisfied with both girls, noticing that all the magic stones have disappeared. Meanwhile, the girls cuddle with Kaguma, praising its softness. Kang Jin Hyuk informs the director that he's finally here and playfully asks if more magic stones are available because his pet Kaguma is a big eater. Shocked, the director falls while the girls continue playing with Kaguma, expressing how cute it is. Kang Jin Hyuk reflects on the consequences he faces for trying tricks without understanding his place, realizing that the director will likely continue to be a helpful asset in his life. He checks Gaguma's status screen, noting its level is 98, strength is 105, dexterity is 98, stat is 90, mana is 192, and it possesses some level 1 skill. Kang Jin Hayek receives a message about a characteristic stating that when the Ancient is in battle, the owner's mana will be consumed, allowing both the pet and the owner to receive separate experience points during the battle. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek thinks Kaguma is strong but severely lacks mana to fight, having only 80 mana. If he has Kaguma fight alongside him, he can barely last 5 minutes. He concludes that he has no choice but to grow faster than planned. During contemplation, he receives a video call, and Chen Yusung asks what he is doing. On the other side, at the SW Hotel, Zhu Hua does some exercises while Ten Ko informs that they have affirmed the target and he has already formed an alliance with selected central figures. He talks on a call with someone who responds that Kang Jin Hayek is raising his forces much quicker than expected. They discuss Kang Jin Hayek's relationship with Chen Yusong noting his aggressive response but also considering the fact that he obediently answered the call. She concludes that it's fair to judge that Kang Jin Hayek is already on their side. The other person suggests that if they don't join them, they have no choice but to add them all to the red list as enemies of Zhang Hua. Pictures of all members of Kang Jin Hayek's team are shared. On the other side, Chen Yusung questions Kang Jin Hayek about his intentions. Meanwhile, Kang Jin Hayek receives a notification about the Boundary Bending Mirror, a growth-type item that connects to anywhere from the 10th floor and under upon use. Its cooldown is 90 days, and its duration is 30 minutes, with the option to be accompanied by one other person. Kang Jin Hayek and Chin Yusung arrive at the Tower of Trials on the 6th floor of the Elven Forest. Chen Yusung comments on the absurdity of the item Kang Jin Hayek obtained and questions why he called him when he could handle things independently. As they walk together, Kang Jin Hayek explains that it's because he cares about him and wants to get stronger to challenge him. Chen Yusung asks which floor they are heading to, and Kang Jin Hayek activates the boundary bending mirror, opening the door. He receives a notification indicating that the duration for that gate is only 29 minutes and 59 seconds. They enter and find themselves on the 10th floor, Warrior's Haven. He observes that around 21 Guardian Warriors are protecting the boss, believing he can handle them. Chin Yusung agrees, expressing confidence as long as the monster in the background doesn't wake up. As they look at the boss, they receive a message indicating that it's the 10th floor boss, the immortal stone giant. Kang Jin Hayek declares it's perfect and proposes a challenge. If he can defeat all the warriors and last one minute against the boss, Chen Yusong must accept a serious duel. Chen Yusong agrees to the deal, emphasizing that he better keep that promise. Kang Jin Hayek takes out his sword and charges towards the warriors. One of the warriors notices him and declares that the Haven of Warriors is only for those who are qualified, just as Chin Yusung attacks him, 